Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome people to the uh, Budget Committee meeting for March 29th. Uh, it is uh, 9.32 in the morning. Um, my name is Paul Russell and I represent Lower Sackville and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I would also like to acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the Peace and Friendship Treaty signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. Moving ahead in the... Moving ahead in the agenda, uh, the next item is the approval of the minutes of February 14th, 15th, 17th, and 22nd. Can I please have a motion to thank you, Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Thank you very much. Are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Not seeing any. All in favor of the minutes of February 14th, 15th, 17th, and 22nd, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you very much. Next is the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Mr. Clerk, do we have any changes for today? There are no changes from the clerk's office for this meeting today. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can I please have a motion to approve the order of business? Uh, thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon, seconded by Councillor Cleary. Are there any changes from committee? Not seeing any, all in favor of the order of business as presented, please signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. aye. all opposed say nay. Great, thank you. Call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Not seeing any. Super, the next item is public participation. And public participation is uh, the section of the meeting that we have at the beginning of every budget meeting where we invite the public to come forward and, and uh, present to the budget committee. Uh, you would be uh, permitted to speak for five minutes. Please keep your comments uh, respectful, on topic, and directed to the chair. We will let you know uh, when time is running out and when, when time has, uh, has come up. I do have a speakers list with me. Once we uh, go through the list of speakers that I have, I will open the floor, not open the floor, I will invite up anybody uh, else who would like to come and address the budget committee. So the first name that I have on the list is Sarah Archibald. Sarah, are you with us? Right, please, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming forward. I'll stand at the podium. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, you have five minutes. Uh, Thank go ahead. you. Thank you. I represent uh, the Kelly Point Landowner Association, mm -hmm. Lot Owners Association. I'm the president. And um, I am here to uh, ask you not to put the 5% uh, increase on the area rate for people like us. We, there is uh, a problem here. We have 68 uh, uh, residents or lot owners who all pay residential tax. And for our budget, 5% this year would be $3,060. We're not talking about a couple of hundred dollars here. We have seven kilometers of road. And it's dirt road. It's not gravel road. And we don't have any services other than garbage six months of the year. We don't get it in the winter. And we get fire if there's a fire. And but we don't get hydrants, we don't get pumps on our, the lakes that are close by, we don't have any other services. Except this area rate. This is our godsend. Because if it's on the tax rate, as an, a tax bill, as an area rate, people will pay. And we have protection, and for those people who don't, can't pay, or won't pay, then we have to chase them all year long and we don't have a stable budget. This causes two things. One, what happens is that our lots and our residences end up not having as high value as when we go to resale because the road is in such lousy shape. Now, it's not in great shape now. I invite all of you to come down and have a look at this road. You wouldn't believe that people in the municipality are living on a road like this. It's shocking. And the problem is that we cannot apply for a, it to become a public road because if you look at your own bylaw, it does not take into consideration people who are stuck in this nether world, and I say nether world, it's pretty well close to hell, or limbo, or whatever you want to talk about, because these 
uh, subdivisions were developed in the early 90s and approved in the 90s. Now you say to people like us who finally got the developer to sell us the roads and we're really keen on becoming a public road if we could possibly because we have so many people who have built on our roads so that seven kilometers now, we're not talking about a little lane here, we're talking about seven kilometers of road, 66 foot right away, we have all the conditions to meet for a public road, but we can't get them because we have to put all the money up front, according to your bylaw, to pay for that. Yet we pay, we don't get a discount for being on a crappy road and not getting any services in our, we pay the, resi the, the standard residential rate. So here we are, we're being, we've never complained about having to pay taxes before, but now we're complaining because you're double, charging for services that the only two services or one of the only two services that we get from the municipality. And we have a minimum uh, or a maximum of $1,500 that we could go up to and that would be an annual uh, area rate of $1,500 per lot and that would end up being a service charge at 5% would be over $5,000. That's what we pay for our fall maintenance, for the pothole repairs. This is huge, this is a huge part of the budget for us. We have to pay for our own snow plowing, we have to pay for our own access for the fire department, have turnarounds, we don't get anything from the municipality, except we do pay our taxes. So this bylaw that you have means we would have to pay up front all the costs, have it surveyed, pay a, develop, pay a designer, not even have HRM designer do this, pay a designer, and then finally, when we put a whole big road in place, then you'd take it over for free after we've paid for it. We can't afford that. We have pipe fitters. We have retired people. We have, so I'm asking, please. We have also have a contract that this does not have this in it. We have a contract with you. There's nothing about an area rate. And I think it's, it's unfair double taxation, really. So I'm asking you to make sure that you please do not charge for people who have an inequitable lifestyle here as it is. And if you want some help, I would help you be on a committee to look at the complicated <coughs> area rate problem throughout the municipality that was created before 1994, and we're living in it since 1994. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. We do have uh, Mayor Savage who would like to uh, address you. Thank you. Th thank you for, for coming forward to, to talk to us. I'm just wondering from staff, do we have information on this? I, I, I can't identify where it is. If it's, it, is there something, a briefing note on it? Is it part of something bigger? I can't identify it. I'm just trying to figure out what we're talking about. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Jerry Blackwood, CFO. There's a briefing note in your in your package, and it is around the administrative fee uh, that is charged to uh, the private uh, homeowner groups. I think it's uh, BN007. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The next uh, few names on the list are Courtney Dunsby, Danielle Wright, and Dolly Williams. Courtney, are you with us this morning? Beautiful. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, hello. Good morning. My name is Courtney Dunsby. I'm the Sustainable Cities Coordinator at the Ecology Action Center. I work on urban planning issues for Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, part of my role is also to coordinate the Our HRM Alliance, which is a coalition of 60 or more groups advocating for sustainable growth in HRM. Uh, it's possible you may hear from a few of them today if you haven't already uh, in your inbox about the budget. Um, I've been following budget committee sessions since January, having presented most recently on February 17th, speaking to the planning department's business plan and budget. Uh, while there are many important over-budget items uh, that the Alliance would be supportive of today, 
uh, including but not limited to the community action planning for African Nova Scotian communities, the increase to arts grants, uh, new sidewalks and AT infrastructure, uh, to name a few. I am here again to speak in favor of two of the planning department's proposed over budget uh, items. The first one being item number 22, which is briefing note 32, uh, funds to support suburban and rural planning. The suburban and rural plans are essential. We need to build off the good work of the center plan and the ongoing regional plan review process. And finally, make sense of the, I think, 21 or so secondary planning strategies that we have. Um, lots of people are moving to Halifax, that's not new, so we need to prioritize building up along uh, transit routes, intensifying our already serviced suburbs, and creating livable rural centers. Progress on these plans will be instrumental in how and where we grow complete communities going forward, and this $450,000 for consultants will create important opportunities for residents to be able to participate in engagement work uh, to inform these plans going forward, so we support that largely. Um, the second item I'd like to speak to, it will be no surprise to you, is item number 31, funds to hire a Halifax Green Network Plan coordinator. It's been well over a year since council asked staff what resources were needed to lead the implementation of the Halifax Green Network Plan. Uh, it was made clear by the staff report dated February 1st that what is needed is a coordinator to uh, support implementation of this plan across business units. A uh, quick reminder that the Halifax Free Network Plan is 79 actions for a connected open space system to achieve three main goals. Uh, one is to maintain ecologically and culturally important land and aquatic systems. The second to promote the sustainable use of natural resources and uh, economically important open spaces. And the third is to identify and plan for land suitable for parks. This work has benefits that are unlimited and relevant to all of your districts. For people, in terms of public health, mental and physical, free outdoor recreation access, ecosystem services, uh, to name a few, nature for habitat, connectivity, biodiversity, climate. Uh, but this plan is not just about protecting parks, it supports green actions with, within all of your districts, including urban forestry, supporting community gardens, the Just Food Action Plan, active transportation and trails, uh, outdoor recreation assets and programming, as well as the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative. I won't dwell on the fact that a few of the special planning areas are in direct conflict with areas identified for protection in the Green Network Plan. I'm not suggesting you can wave a magic wand here, uh, but I am suggesting that this work needs to be supported at the same time that you're also doing that work. Um, the Alliance first came together in 2011 to advocate for this protected green network. Uh, since then, more than 30,000 new people have moved to Halifax. Many have said that without our persistent advocacy uh, of you and of staff, um, you wouldn't have adopted the plan in 2018, but it's been five years. Let's face it, the progress has been limited at best. Um, how could there be with matching limited staff resources? Uh, this is clear by the annual progress reports uh, that we hear from staff every year, as well as independent analysis that we have done uh, with professionals in the field outside of your review. I will say it makes no difference to us whether the staff member resides in the planning department or the environment department or even the parks department. There are delayed actions held by all of those departments. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I'll just wrap up by saying that staff have asked for this position. We are asking for this position. It's time. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Courtney, for your presentation this morning. The next speakers on the list are Daniel Wright, Dolly Williams, and Veronica Marsman. Danielle, are you with us this morning? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, Dolly Williams, are you with us this morning? Good morning, Mr. Chair and Councillors. Good morning, you have five minutes. I'm going to be very minutes. brief and to the point. As co-chair of the Road to Economic Prosperity and a member of the East Preston community, I would like to speak to the importance of the HRM planners as, re as relates to our communities. We have, been very we have been very successful in the Beachville community because of the trust built between the planners and the development association. 
We also see that happening in our community, but we, think, but we need to have more, more planners coming to the communities and being able to be there. We see not seen community understand the HM policies and administrative orders and the relevance of good planning. We have planners understand and appreciate community visions and planning. We also need planners that understand the vision of communities and neighborhoods. Planners that will work with us to ensure equity and justice in the planning process. I'm happy to say we have positive examples to point. We also have more work to do. For the record, I would like to support the budget items of additional planners, particularly for the work of the African Nova Scotia community. Thank you very much. And I wanted to say again, if you, for those that don't know, that Beachville is a model for us, not just here in Nova Scotia, but Beachville is a model for across Canada. So I just want to say to HRM, we need those planners in order to get the work done in our community. For, for 400 years, we're still at the process where we haven't, we haven't developed where we should be. So I just want to thank you for the budget. We do support it. Okay. Thank you very much, Dolly. Uh, Veronica, uh, Veronica Mersman, are you with us? There we are. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Mayor, and Councillors. My name is Veronica Marsman, and I'm the property manager at Akuma, located in Dartmouth. Akuma has a place on the Road to Economic Council, and REPAC is a strong supporter of Akuma development. I'm here this morning to express support um, for the hiring of planners um, in your budget. Planners, African Nova Scotian planners, and planners who have knowledge and experience of working um, with our black communities. Planners, um, to have planners who work with you to understand the economic plight and the status of our black communities and the systemic barriers that have put, been put in our way is a welcome addition. We require planners who will work with us strategize with us to find solutions rather than upholding policies that are systematically racist. The need for development in the African Nova Scotian communities is long overdue. Imagine being in this province and assisting in developing this province for over 400 years and not having what you feel you should be entitled to. We need planners who catch the vision of economic growth in our community and who will work with us to make it happen. I trust your bid budget deliberations will go in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. That ends the uh, list that we have for public participation. Before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge that Barry Dalrymple uh, is in the uh, gallery this morning. Good morning, Barry. Uh, Barry was one of us in a life past. Um, at, at this point, <laughs> uh, at, at this point, I would like to uh, ask if there are any members of the public who would like to step forward and address the budget committee. Please step forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mayor, and Council Members. Um, and, and I also must start by Thank you for what you just said about what is going to be a double taxation on area rate payers, uh, on those volunteer groups that try to provide services uh, where in some areas HRM does not. Um, but that's not what I came to speak about. Uh, so I look after a minor baseball organization, LWF Baseball in Fall River Waverley of over 700 kids combined with our tri-county rep programs. It's a total of 900 kids. And in our greater partnership with Bedford, Hammonds Plains and Sackville, we have 2,400 youth playing baseball. Speaking uh, to LWF and tri-county specifically, in District 1, we have exactly one HRM baseball field, one. And that's only because during my time as councillor, we passed a motion and had that field built. We have massive field shortages. Because of that, in the last two years, we have lost our Challenger baseball program, which some of you may know is baseball specifically designed for those with disabilities. We had the uh, correctional field on Cobbington Road taken away from us this past winter where that program has been. 
We have lost the opportunity to expand our girls' program, baseball programs because again, that field held a number of girls' teams. We have lost the opportunity to have tournament hosts. We were known 10 years ago, all four of these associations as being amongst the best hosts in all of the maritime provinces. None of us can any longer host tournaments. We have no field time. We routinely go to tournaments, Moncton, Summerside, Charlottetown, Sydney, and they all dearly like to come back. They love coming to our tournaments. Can no longer happen. Um, on a side issue, <laughs> we have all, these four associations, read the field strategy report. I think we've all talked to our counselors. Um, unfortunately, the report, uh, the data and, and uh, stuff is wrong and therefore the conclusions are wrong. I'm glad to see that has been put off and hopefully to a forum which will allow public consultation so some of us come in and, and can speak to you about that. I'm here today because in the budget items you're discussing is the Waverly McDonald ball field park. So 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, uh, with a council motion we passed and built that baseball field. I guess that was about 15 years ago. About 10 years ago, we unanimously passed a motion to put lights on that baseball field because of the incredible shortage of fields. We actually put 300 to $400,000 in an HRM budget in the book, in black and white, and it was approved to put lights on that baseball field. I left. <laughs> <laughs> Willingly, by the way. Um, shortly after the HRM put lights on Conrad Field in Dartmouth. Then they put lights on the Bong Field in Sackville. All we seem to be excuses to do something somewhere else. And then a few years ago, I was told the money from the budget just disappeared. Gone. Poof. So thank God our current counselor, Kathy has uh, been working long and hard the last two years and I believe has some money back. But there's always excuses and I'm told the excuse today or one of them is that the current lease has not been renewed. HRM's fault. The lease hasn't been renewed for five years. That's our sports park lease renewal with the province which screws up everything our volunteer do. HRM has held up this grant for five years, or this lease for five years, through everything we have tried to do. The latest one that's before you is that um, the current agreement they sent uh, has not been agreed to by our pork board. We signed off on that agreement two years ago. We had a board meeting, we signed it, we sent it back in. We did get a new one for two months ago with a few changes. One was something about excessive wear and tear on the parking lot. We simply asked for a clarification two months ago. No reply. I'm, I'm out of time and, and there's so much more. Uh, unfortunately, I'd be willing to talk to anybody at any time about this. Um, this is on HRM departments. This is not on our sports park board. And there is no reason whatsoever in the world that council cannot put some of the money into something on that project this year, show the community, show minor baseball after 10 years that it just hasn't been thrown in the garbage. Do something, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, for your presentation. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Councilor, I wonder, um, and this may come up in discussion, I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure what's being asked for. Is, is there something that, uh, the, I'm looking at the councillor, have you got a, a plan to bring something forward? Because in the briefing note it talks about money in 25-26, it talks about what you said, the agreement, um, but uh, it doesn't talk about what the request might be either this budget year. So you have information on that that we would discuss, I'm wondering, for the councillor and or for former councillor and potentially the next councillor. <laughs> Um, Mr. Mayor, yes, there, uh, I will have a request when we come to the debate. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Mayor, our, our request, like you say, is just simply after 10 years. 
Just anything. I don't care. Put up one poll. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Blackburn. Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. No, I just wanted to uh, just sort of add on as well that uh, I realize we've sent the, uh, the playing field strategy to uh, a uh, committee of the whole format and uh, it actually, I've, I've got it drafted and I've uh, uh, in my uh, drafts ready to send to, uh, to Ian at that time. I do have a motion prepared that will look at, uh, be asking rather for a deeper dive into baseball uh, the uh, facilities that we have, the demand, and it will ask for um, uh, consultation with the Baseball Association. So uh, look for that coming up uh, when we do Committee of the Whole on the playing field strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Blackburn. Um, are there any other members of the gallery who would like to step forward and address uh, the Budget Committee this morning? Are there any other members of the, uh, in the gallery who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee? The third and final time, or are there any other members of the public who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. We do appreciate this. The next item on the agenda is uh, the 2023-24 Budget Adjustment List. We have, uh, I'm going to uh, open the floor to the CAO. Um, she has a, a few words and then, and then we will go over to the CFO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kathy O'Toole, Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mayor, and members of Regional Council, the next step in this year's budget process is to finalize the budget adjustment list. Thank you to all of the business unit staff members involved in the preparation of the materials who have presented to council or helped answer questions for you. This has been a challenging budget year and staff have worked diligently to implement all the budget items that regional council has requested and you'll see the culmination of that work today. As well, our finance team has done some forecasting of the impact that some of the decisions made today will have on future years. Thank you also to Regional Council for the feedback and the discussions so far. We recognize that balancing service delivery requirements and affordability is not easy. To recap, on November 25th, Budget Committee directed staff to prepare options for a 4% average tax increase and to only use one-time expense reductions if matched with sustainable reductions in future years. On January 25th, staff presented a budget direction and assessment update. In that presentation, staff outlined an additional $2.8 million of reductions that had no operational implications and an additional $1.8 million of revenue from new assessments and provided a list of over 90 reductions for budget committee to consider to achieve a 4% tax increase. Each business unit has now presented their budget and business plan and the budget committee has had the opportunity to review them. Since the initial budget direction, the budget has been reduced by $15.5 million. So significant progress has been made. We have all discussed at great length the factors that have made our budget and financial environment very challenging, and we don't intend to get into those any further today. But what you will see today is the impact that they've had on the revenue we need to generate to fund the costs to maintain our level of service, as well as advance several of Regional Council's priorities. Through the Budget Committee discussions over the last several weeks, 42 different items have been placed on the budget adjustment list. If all of the items are accepted, the new increase in tax burden is 5.6%, which means the tax rate lowers by approximately 4.5%. The option that is recommended by staff, assuming Council still is in favour of all of the items put on the budget adjustment list, is a 5.6 average tax increase if all 42 items are accepted by Regional Council. This would also include funding for two capital projects, specifically 
the new sidewalk expansion program and the Bedford West Fire Station and Headquarters <coughs> Campus, which if approved would enable delivery of this project three years ahead of schedule. The report also shows some alternatives for illustrative purposes. There's been significant debate on most of these items on the BAL already, and I'm hopeful that we can find a solution today that will position Regional Council well to ratify the budget on April 25th. Recognizing the analysis and debate that has already occurred, it suggested that the Budget Committee uh, can simply motion to exclude items that they do not support, as opposed to going through the budget adjustment list item by item or packaged motions of the budget adjustment list. So the Budget Committee does not need to debate or discuss items on the budget adjustment list that are already supported or that you support. If you focus in on the items that you don't agree with, that may help us move through the items more quickly. You'll also note that in the report, staff are proposing the timing of implementation of building permit fee increases be moved from April 1st to June 1st, both allowing us more time to implement the change, but also providing the industry with more time to adjust. The budget adjustment list and recommendation report do include implementation of Saturday parking and in weekday evening parking fees. The Downtown Business Commission and staff have raised some concerns about these two items. So if council wishes to make a change on either of these items, now would be the time to do so. In closing, I'd like to reiterate that I'm confident that the team's advice and the recommendation on the budget adjustment list addresses the most critical items related to service delivery for this year and that the funding plan is fiscally responsible, recognizing that there are risks that will have to be managed to the extent possible in the longer term. I do, however, have concerns about how we meet the needs and expectations of future years, especially when we're dealing with unprecedented growth, demands for service, and high inflation. I will now turn the floor over to um, Jerry Blackwood, our CFO, and Tyler from his team. Tyler's going to come forward and present a, a few slides, I believe, and then we will get right into the debate and discussion. Thank you very much. Good morning, so I'm Tyler Higgins. I'm, uh, I guess I'll call myself your friendly neighborhood manager of budget and reserves. Uh, I will quickly go through a presentation here on the budget adjustment list. Kathy really did touch on a lot of the points already, but I'll try and go in and give a bit more detail around it. So just to give a current state of where the budget is before you get into the budget adjustment list, uh, as Kathy mentioned, the budget has been reduced by $15.5 million since we came forward in November. And the table that you see on this presentation shows those adjustments that have, ha uh, have occurred to get down to that 15 and a half. So the first is obviously the reduction in the paving budget, reduction to the urban forestry master plan, increasing uh, building permit fees, and then offsetting some of those reductions is the increase of, uh, for staffing in the fire stations. And then there's the increase in revenue for $1.8 million from the new assessments and the 2.8 million that Kathy mentioned about staff uh, savings that don't have any operational impacts. The new item that we have also baked in is we revised our debt costs for next year, so we're just pushing out when we issue the debt, so there will be no uh, interest costs in the upcoming budget, so that resulted in savings of about $800,000. So that 15.5 million works out to uh, total tax, when you apply that to the budget, the total tax increase is 5.5%. So that's the starting point before the BAL is discussed. And as Kathy mentioned, the 4% is uh, not achievable right now based on the items that are on the BAL. The lowest possible increase you can get to based on all the reductions is actually 4.8%, and that's accepting all the reductions on the BAL and no overs. So 
just as Kathy also mentioned, to go through the process quickly. Um, there's 42 items on the ballot. Uh, 31, uh, 31 of those are adjustments to the operating budget. 14 are unders, which would reduce the budget by an additional 4.7 million. 17 are overs, which would increase the budget by five and a half million. And then there's five items relating to the HRP budget, but one of those were actually suggested, should, suggesting or recommending that it would be applied to the HR budget versus the HRP budget. Seven of the items are around the capital budget. And if, the, if, that's, if those go ahead and they're funded from capital from operating, we would need to increase the budget by 16 and a half million. Or if they're funded from debt, there'll be no tax implications until 25, 26. On the ballot itself, each option does have a tax implication next to it, so you can see the impact of each item. There are two that don't because they're just so small that they don't really have an implication in isolation, but as in, in the total, they do have an impact. So as Kathy mentioned, you can, uh, any items that are not on the ballot, you can uh, add them during the debate, and you can package items together as you see fit. So following the ballot being approved today or all the changes made to the budget, we hope to come back on April 25th, and that's where we'll bring forward the budget ratification and all the rates associated with it. So quickly to discuss the capital side of those. So we are recommending two of the items to be approved, and that would be uh, BN30, which is represented in item 36, and that's the new sidewalk expansion. And if that gets approved, the design work can begin. The other item is the new Bedford Fire Station at headquarters, that's item 39 or relating to BN72. And down at the bottom, you can see the choice of if it's capital from operating to be funded this, it's $16 million required. But if it's debt funding, it's not until 25, 26 that we start seeing the impact of the paying for those items. So obviously uh, the debt funding probably would support keeping the tax, uh, tax increase lower for 24, 20, or 23, 24. And now to quickly just touch on the capital items that uh, we're not recommending. And these are just mostly around the timing of it. So um, it's basically based on like what's ready and what's not. But the first one is the Halifax North Memorial Library. There's a cost share outstanding on that or cost share application outstanding. The Alderney Gate Library, there's just a lack of portfolio capacity to deliver that project right now. The Milko Ferry Terminal, or Milko Ferry Terminal Library is again uh, waiting on a cost share application. The Bedford Library, there's some land acquisition pieces outstanding on that. The Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center, there's a new location and the due diligence is ongoing on that. And the McDonald Park uh, Bald Field Lighting, there's uh, a land lease and easement pieces of that that are outstanding. So of those items, we're just not recommending those because of those issues that are around them. And we do review these project, uh, project, readiness, uh, project readiness annually. And so we'll constantly be updating those in future budgets. So now just on some sample scenarios of the outcome, just very high level ones to give you kind of an idea. If the entire BAL is approved, excluding the HRP portion of it, uh, it is a 5.6 average tax bill increase. If you opt to just throw away the BAL and just stick with the status quo, it's 5.5% of an increase. The average tax bill difference between those two on the residential side is $3.01. So going from 5.5 up to 5.6, the average tax bill increases by $3.01 for the residential side. If you want the lowest possible tax increase at 4.8%, that would be accepting only the unders. You would actually decrease the average residential tax bill by $15 from the 5.5 starting point. So on the recommendation that's in the report, we're recommending to approve items one to 31, and, we're not, and we are not recommending to approve four of the HRP items. And that's mainly around uh, the community safety division that's currently being set up. We intend to come back in later in 2023 to discuss the items around, uh, to discuss the transfers between HRP and HRM. And as Kathy has already spoken about, rescinding the motion for the P&D permit increase, just uh, to move it to a June uh, time frame versus an April implementation. And then approving uh, item 36 and item 39, so the sidewalk program and the Bedford West Fire Station be added to the capital budget. 
So on the HRP items, so just to discuss those and kind of why they're not recommended. Uh, so the extra duty administration fee increase, uh, the Board of Police Commissioners is re reviewing that policy already. They do have the, their, within their authority that they can adjust that at any time. And then the three transfers, so the transfers of victim services, the transfers of the crossing guards, and Lake Patrol from HRP to HRM. Again, we're setting up the community safety department. And once that comes back later in the year, we'll have more details on that transfer. <clears throat> so uh, I'll channel my uh, inner Marty McFly and talk about the future here. Uh, <laughs> So right now, and I've flashed this slide up in previous presentations, we're just looking at where things are today and recognizing that things will change as we get closer to budget direction next year in November. We're estimating that it could be, in ex it could be higher than nine, a 9% 9 tax increase. And the big drivers of that are compensation increases and what we call capital from operating, restoring it, or just bringing up our capital funding from the operating budget to the level required to fund the capital plan would be about $25 million. Then contracts, debt, and inflationary items, we're expecting those to increase about $4 million respectively. D transfer tax, again, based on our forecast, is expected to slightly decrease next year again. And finally, just some new FTEs coming online will increase the budget again about $900,000. The final thing that we do want to point out is we are going to uh, review all of our reserves. So the SI reserves obviously is the biggest, just reviewing them to understand, or not understand, but come up with a funding plan to make sure they're able to fund the items that they're intended to. And there will likely be tax implications with that. But again, we have to go through all the reserves, see what we're committing up against them, and understand where their funding sources are going to be. So that's the end of a brief presentation. Myself and Dave Harley here, the Director of Accounting and Financial Reporting, will be the math team up here for any changes that happen, but I'll open the floor any questions or concerns. Thank you very much for that presentation, Tyler. Uh, thank you to the CAO as well for, uh, for your wisdom in this. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Othit. Thank you, and I have questions of clarification, I guess, for uh, Tyler at the moment. Um, so first of all, comment though is, is the thank you on the, uh, the work on the fire station as, as well, because it's this uh, having to move this forward uh, three years, I'm sure. <laughs> Councillor Lovelace and others will agree this is a safety issue that, that could not uh, continue. And it goes far beyond the uh, uh, dire safety issue and it goes far be farther than just West Bedford. So thank you for that. Um, so a question, and we, you mentioned that 15.5 million had been cut. The ad, and like that was in our endeavor to try and get from 8% down to down to 4%. But also originally staff was looking at uh, perhaps an 11% increase. And internally before this came to us, a, a, a figure was cut, an amount of money was cut. So when you, when you come back, if you could just remind us of what that figure was as well. So I just don't want people to think that only 15, well, not that 15 million is insignificant, but a lot more than that has gone into this uh, cutting and, and justifying that, uh, that we're debating today. Um, I'm still confused on, there's a list of things that aren't included in capital project. If you want to go back to that slide, and I, I quite understand Mill Cove uh, Library is fine. We'll see. There's the, the application is pending for the uh, for the ferry, and the, the terminal and the ferries on the terminal that has gone off to the province and the feds. And if that doesn't come back successful, if we don't have a ferry and a terminal, we won't have a ferry terminal to add a library to. So that makes perfect sense to me. I have no problem with that. But below that, you have a bullet that says acquisition of land for a Bedford library. So what is that and where did that come from? If this goes on the Mill Cove property, this is land that's going to be given to us at little to no cost by the province, where they've come in and they've put a pile of rocks on my waterfront, left it there for over a decade. No second library or no second location has ever been discussed or approved by this council. And I, yet it keeps coming up. And I don't know why it keeps coming up. So if somebody could tell me why there are two items there. The council has never agreed to build two libraries in Bedford. Uh, 
and not ask them to build two libraries in Bedford. If, enough, if other libraries required and it could be leased or whatever, that is fine. But why are those two items there when they have never been discussed or approved? So first of all, although the funding application has gone yes. into the federal government for the Mill Cove Ferry, right. it, including the, the library right. shell, um, we do not own all of the land required to do that project, and okay. we're still in discussions with the province on it. Okay. And it may be an exchange, or it may be okay. a purchase at market value, but right. the uh, land issue is not fully resolved, although all discussions right. are underway. All right, well then I, I'll be a little encouraged about that, except that I would be very disappointed if those negotiations didn't go well, and I know you'll do your best, uh, Kathy and others, but when somebody comes along, puts a pile of rocks on your waterfront, and then abandons it, with no infrastructure, no services, no access to it, they should be giving us that land. And in fact, they should be giving us that land with some infrastructure and services on it, to be in my opinion, than somebody who's looked at a pile of rocks for a dozen years. So I hope we will negotiate hard that we do not have to pay for a pile of rocks. Well, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but, uh, but uh, I want to make that very clear. Now, I guess I am, well, do I have time to uh, suggest a couple things be removed? So you, you don't want us to debate what we like, you want us to bring forward and debate what we would uh, like removed, is that correct? Yeah. I, I would remind you that we don't have a motion on the floor to remove things from. Okay, so do you want me to put the, mo well, do you want me to put the motion on, give me time, or do you want me to come back? You are unable to remove things from uh, from the uh, motion unless. All right. It's well, on then the I'll put the motion on the floor, and then you'll allow me to remove stuff. Then will you? All right. So it is uh, recommended that. <laughs> uh, fair enough. All right. Can we remove a counselor too? While well, I'm at it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so it's moved that the Budget Committee 1 direct the Chief Administrative Officer to finalize the proposed operating budget for Regional Council that includes items 1 through 31 from the budget adjustment list scheduled in attachment A of the staff report dated March 22nd, 2023 and uh, to be added, removed to from the 2023 proposed operating budget. 2. Direct the Chief Administrative Officer to finalize the capital budget for Regional Council that includes items 36 and 39 from the budget adjustment list from schedule uh, from schedule in attachment A of the staff report dated March 22nd, 2023 to be added to the 2023 approval capital budget. Three, uh, notwithstanding the February 17th, 2023 direction to proceed with a revenue increase of $1,450,000, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to include a revenue increase of one million two hundred thousand through a building permit fee increase to planning and development uh, it's, uh, in 2023 proposed 2324 sorry proposed budget as outlined in the briefing note BN031 and recommend that regional council rescind the motion from February 17th 2023 so move uh, thank you very much seconded by councillor Lovelace you have five new minutes councillor Othick go ahead all right, well, I, will, I promise I won't take that long. I would like uh, 6.1 uh, number 11 to be removed, which is right-of-way mowing, and 6.1 uh, number 13 shrub beds. I was away for one week, and, uh, and these things came forward, so can I didn't you, get to uh, just, speak uh, to them at this just, time. Can you just give us a minute to work out uh, what that motion would be? Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, these are, are two small items that I think make a big difference in our community on, on uh, having some shrub beds on our right of ways and, some, uh, and not expecting people on cul-de-sacs who I think have generally accepted that they're going to get plowed last, but to have to go out and mow uh, the traffic circle in their own neighborhood I think is a little bit much, particularly when they are going to be receiving a tax increase. So that's why I'd like those two things removed, Mr. Chair. Okay, and do we have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Stoddard, thank you very much. Okay. So I guess then, is there anything else you need from me, Mr. Chair? Or? Uh, we, no, but we need to pause for just a minute. Okay.
Ian, do you have those motions? Okay. So then, Chair, do we leave the master list and go off to debate these? Is that how it's going to work? Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay, we have a, a new list of speakers for the two motions that are on our screen. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I just wonder, uh, Councillor, if you can clarify what you're asking us to, are you, are you asking for us to not support what's on, on the list or do you just wanna bring it up for discussion? Just for clarification. Both. Bo okay, both. All right, so then, then I'll, I'll be voting against not, I'll be voting against removing this from the list. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Come back to that. Um, okay. So the, the right-of-way mowing, uh, that would be the number 11, uh, it is a relatively small amount uh, because when you look at the areas that are being done, they're, you know, we're not talking about uh, you know, all over the municipality. And I remember a few years ago when we looked at some other right-of-way mowing, we took that away. And it might have been Councillor Austin. Oh, I see the Deputy Mayor is on the list. Good, so I won't uh, do that. But we went through this process where we, we, we did already in a number of areas take right-of-way mowing away. Most of us, businesses and, and residents have to mow the, the verge uh, abutting our property. Uh, and so when we look at these areas, it was just sort of an extension of that already uh, existing policy that we're going through. And I can't remember the exact reason. Uh, I really didn't uh, expect these to come back off or attempt to come back off the list of savings. Um, and so it, that, it just makes sense to me that we would not mow these areas. And why spend money mowing areas where other people, you know, then this gets into the fairness. Like, do we, do we put back the other areas that we took away a while ago? Do we just start doing more areas in, instead of less? Um, also, this fits in nicely with our uh, naturalization. Some of these areas could be naturalized. Uh, we could also, the, the, the city is giving out seed kits right now to people. Some of these areas, who knows? Residents could get together and they could grow vegetables or whatever. We have a policy for uh, right-of-way uh, gardening. On the um, shrub bed maintenance, I remember these were a small, area, uh, small number of areas, and I believe, and that's maybe why Councillor Stoddard seconded it, I think oh, they're almost all in her area. Um, and so, again, this could be an opportunity for community building. People could get together. They could not just mow it, but they could create gardens. Uh, and they are small amounts, admittedly. We could put them back in. We probably wouldn't even notice it. But um, it, it wasn't a bad meeting uh, without you, I must say. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I certainly enjoyed it. <laughs> so I, I can't support, I, I don't know, what's the negative of taking? So I can't support taking them off the list as potential savings. I think these were areas where we should go ahead with this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, I actually, I have a question for staff on mowing. Um, if there's someone hiding up there that this is their area of expertise, um, that makes it kind of like, uh, I'm in favor of this, like, uh, Woodland Avenue in my district. Um, we do the mowing on Woodland Avenue from Victoria Road to Micmac Boulevard, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever because it's basically, I mean, it's a main street, but it's a residential area. It's a homeowner who's got a little patch of grass out their front door, the same as any homeowner on any of the side streets. And so it doesn't make any sense to me that we're mowing their section and then not mowing others. Where I have a bit of a problem is Alderney Drive is listed here, uh, Windmill to Wise all the way to Prince Albert Road. I don't know how you assign that to the neighboring property owners when there's basically no one fronts on Alderney Drive except for the two blocks of the downtown. Um, so I'm wondering if we vote, uh, if this goes ahead, where this is one of the things on the list, does that mean that suddenly <laughs> we're not mowing on Alderney anymore, right? And expecting some homeowner that's on the other side of a fence 
to come all the way around to do it because that just it doesn't seem practical. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the councillor. Um, yes, if the if this is um, approved, that this reduction is going to happen, um, those uh, right of way areas in front of properties will be expected the property owner to to look after that area, um, and uh, you know, basically what would happen is is uh, if that's not happening, then we would. And, you know, go to compliance to request that they approach the landowner um, in an attempt to have them uh, pick up the maintenance and do the maintenance of the, of the right-of-way. So yes, it would be, that, that area would not be mowed by HRM if this is approved. So that caused me some concern because I think we're doing a lot of unnecessary mowing, but I think there's a couple areas out there that just from practicality, uh, you know, you, you can't hand it to anybody, not, not realistically anyway. Um, you know, to expect someone on Alderney Drive, I guess I'm, t I'm thinking about, uh, it's, it's not the median middle, the, well, thank goodness for that at least. <laughs> I, I don't know, I, 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 I was hoping for something a little bit more tactical in terms of um, its uh, precision on this, because, uh, you know, on, like I said, Woodland Avenue, yeah, we shouldn't be mowing that. Um, Alderney Drive, I don't know how that would actually work in practicality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great presentation, great conversation. Um, so just wanted to chime in here and say that, uh, you know, this, this uh, I, I can't um, support removing these reductions uh, from the list. So I won't be supporting uh, my, my, uh, my friend over there uh, from District 16. Uh, and the reason is because to me, you know, this, this speaks to principle. Um, these uh, services are not available to rural areas. Right. We the, what we're talking about is, is services specifically to uh, urban communities that are not available to rural uh, communities. And um, I think, you know, if we're going to suggest that we're going to support this in urban areas, then we should also be having a conversation about equity for rural communities as well. So I won't be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Councillor Blopkarn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question is, uh, how is this going to be communicated to the property owners that will all of a sudden be responsible for this right-of-way mowing? Um, I just, uh, my ears kind of stood up when I heard, uh, you know, compliance, and I, I certainly don't want a compliance officer's visit to be the first communication to residents that things have changed and they're now responsible for mowing. Uh, so just wondering what the uh, the plan is for communicating this to uh, the homeowners. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ray Walsh, Director of Parks, um, to the uh, to the councillor. Um, uh, could uh, I get the question again? Sorry, I missed the last. Sure, I was just no. I'm just oh. curious as to um, what the communications plan was right. because you mentioned compliance, and I certainly don't want a situation where a knock on the door or a letter from a compliance officer is the first time that residents hear that they're now responsible for this. Right. Um, so, you know, we would uh, approach these areas with, with door knockers or, or, or something of that nature, some type of a mass communication to these areas to let them know that they're, they're going to be responsible. That there may be some that um, miss that communication and we, we would have to go to compliance at that point, but the, uh, the approach would be to, to communicate to them ahead of time. That, so if this is um, approved, we would go ahead and start our communication plan to let the, the uh, property owners know that they're responsible now. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this discussion. Um, one of the reasons I was encouraging that this, this be removed 
is because of the fact that cul-de-sacs were something that HRM decided to put in these particular areas. And I'm just wondering where they've received these services for so long, is it gonna become an issue of unsightly? Is it going to be something, yeah, it's in the middle of a cul-de-sac, so is it gonna be unsightly? Um, is there gonna be cooperation between the area, the residents? looking at mowing or keeping it up to date, like I just, I'm glad to hear that they will be getting notice, but I'm just wondering who is gonna in ultimately be responsible. Is just gonna be one particular homeowner or how does that gonna work? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, to the councilor. Um, the the cul-de-sac uh, briefing note um, recommends that we remove the plantings that are there, but Resod for for mowing. Um, it would be uh, it it does save us quite a bit of money by doing that. Um, and uh, so you know, in that case, uh, we are also looking at these cul-de-sac areas to be a potential naturalization program with the neighbors that are there once the coordinator is hired. So that's uh, something that goes along with the uh, with 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 the the, uh, the, the cul-de-sac uh, briefing note. Um, so it's it, it's it's the cul-de-sac uh, briefing note. The residents won't be responsible for the maintenance, only if they participate in a naturalization program, and that could be down the road a little bit until we you know at, we'll need some time to uh, to make the the cul-de-sac areas um, to remove the 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 old shrubbery that's there and, and, and replant or re -saw it. So it'll take some time, um, which is good because it lines up with the naturalization coordinator. We'll be hired until the budget's approved anyway. So um, it kind of lines up, but no, the, the residents will be responsible for the call of sex. Okay, great, thank you. Just wanted to confirm that. Thank you very much, Councillor Stoddard. Go ahead, Councillor Othed. I, uh, as I mentioned, I did miss that one meeting, but the meeting before that, Councillor Cleary gave a very good presentation on why we shouldn't even be talking about things that are 20 and 50K. They're a waste of our time because it's a point zero 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 whatever on our, uh, on our tax rate or on our tax bill. But anyway, here we are. So Ray, Ray you're getting your work out here today, but stop, stop running away here. Um, if we, um, if I live on Connaught Avenue, so we talked about fairness and equity. So if I live on Roper Street or Agricola Street or Connaught Avenue and I look out my front door and I see a strip of grass, it's mowed by the city. If I live on a cul-de-sac in a suburban area, I open my front door and I look at a strip of grass mowed by the city, it's gonna be two feet high unless I mow it. And we say that's fairness and equity. That's a funny definition of fairness and equity. So I, I, I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm having trouble really understanding this and considering 50K is no impact on our budget, folks, come on. So if I live on a cul-de-sac, I get plowed last, I have to mow my own center island, and I pay the same tax rate as if I'm on Kanad or Roby or Agricola and they're mowing in front of my house the piece of grass that I look at owned by the city. That, that, that just doesn't add up to me. And, and I'm right, Ray, am I right that if I live on Kanad Avenue, I don't have to cross that street and, and mow the strip of grass in front of me? Thank you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, no, I, I was, I was, as I was um, uh, saying uh, to, to, the, uh, to the last question, the cul-de-sacs, that briefing note that that does right. not recommend that the residents cut the grass in the cul-de-sacs. That's a separate, that's a separate issue from the right-of-way mowing. So, if there, if, sorry, then I'm, I've misunderstood this. So, if I live in a cul-de-sac right now, and it is mowed x time number of times a year by the city, that will continue to be mowed. The island in the cul-de-sac. It, that, that, that's correct, the islands continue to be mowed. And um, with this particular briefing note, all of the cul-de-sacs that we're recommending um, be changed over from shrubs to, to just a, a, right. a grass for easier maintenance um, are all in District 12 as well. 
Okay, well, if I had my way, we'd dump gravel in these like we've done in some of my neighborhood. Okay, so then I have misinterpreted the impact on cul-de-sacs then. And if that, okay, well, I guess I shouldn't miss meetings. Um, okay, uh, and the, all right, so, and the shrub beds, um, I think that's unfortunate, but uh, it's gonna be natural. I, I, based on the experience I had with the Bedford waterfront when the, uh, be, after they put the pile of rocks for me to look at in my uh, Bedford, uh, neighborhood. They also, for a couple of years, the uh, Development Nova Scotia tried to put in uh, naturalized. Uh, you remember the story of the wildflowers there and how we got complaints every day that we didn't mow. But anyway, we'll see where that goes. But all right, so the cul-de-sacs will continue to be mowed if they have presently have grass. Yes, that's correct. The, the right of my mowing is the area um, b between the street and the sidewalk. That's, that's what we conf confer uh, um, uh, as uh, right of way mowing. The cul de sacs are a separate briefing note altogether. All right, then I uh, missed that and I do apologize. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Othit. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, I don't know if this will uh, assuage uh, Councillor Outhead or not. Um, if you look at the, the briefing note for the right-of-way mowing that we would be stopping, Connaught and Roby are in there. So if you leave this as a savings, they will no longer get their verge mode. So you'd be actually providing that fairness that you're looking for. The, the medians, uh, just like the islands, will get done. Uh, it's, we're just talking about that piece of grass between the sidewalk and the road. And um, when I look at uh, Shibukto, because it says from the rotary up to Windsor, so if you do that, uh, from Windsor down to about Connaught, uh, Mumford, it's all, all residential, and except where it isn't, we have a park, so we would just do that as part of our park maintenance. And as you come further down, uh, towards the rotary, there is no grass for a lot of it because it's just concrete from the property line to the curb. And so there is no grass to mow, except one of my favorite ones would be Nova Scotia Power. They have the little substation there. They would have to mow their grass. I would love to see them mow that grass. Uh, and then, you know, you've got uh, the, the cat, it used to be cash and carry, what is it now? The wholesale club. Uh, and you've got the, the, the Ramia property there, the old bay. They already have to do their landscaping and mowing on their side anyway, so this would be easy enough for them just to come down and do it. So I think Councilor Deputy Mayor Austin may have a point about a few areas that, you know, we could probably work out. And so even if we don't save the full 50 grand and, you know, you have to send a contractor over to do a couple of areas, I think that might be okay. But by and large, when I look through these street by street and you look at those areas, there's either no real impact uh, and if there is any, it's pretty easy for the homeowner, the property owner to pick it up. Uh, so I, again, it's a small savings. And one of the reasons I talked about let's not go for the 20 and 50s and 80s and whatnot was just because we spend a lot of time talking about those small numbers and very little time talking about the, the millions, the hundreds to tens of millions. Uh, they, they seem to sail through faster. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have a couple more speakers on the list, and yes, you are one of them. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and you know, as I've had time to kind of digest that, um, I'm in agreement with Councillor Clary. When I was taking a look at Alderney Drive, the, all the areas that I was thinking like, well, that's not going to make any sense. They all border our property, so we're going to be mowing them anyway as the adjacent property owners. So uh, I think the only section on Alderney that uh, we currently, from the looks of things, probably do mow right now that uh, would be expecting the property owner would be uh, develop Nova Scotia's piece of property there at, uh, you know, uh, between King and Prince. Uh, so tell the province to mow their lawn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, we have no further speakers on the list. Just to remind everybody, the motion that uh, the motions that Councillor Outhit should have read, and uh, just a gentle reminder, nudge, whatever. Uh, please introduce the full motion when you're when you're speaking about it. It makes it uh, easier for us. Uh, the first one is that the motion be amended to increase the proposed 2023-24 operating budget as set out in recommendation one by removing item 11 in the full amount of $50,000 
and two, that the motion be amended to increase the proposed 2023-24 operating budget as set out in recommendation one by removing item 13 in the full part, in the full amount of $20,000. We will be voting on these separately. If, you, if you're fine to remove them, I didn't see your, but do you agree to uh, withdraw the motion? You do, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate the, that conversation. Um, we are back on the main motion. Go ahead, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted, um, I didn't have the ballot list, the short version, to, for clarification on the Board of Police, a uh, couple of motions that would be captured in here. I'm good with it for now. I understand the, um, the, uh, the withdrawal of a couple of briefing notes uh, from this consideration and debate. It absolutely makes, center, makes sense to, to, to uh, defer those to other uh, alternative times, in my opinion. So I'll wait for the, my um, points of clarification when we actually get to 6.2. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to get clarification of the process here because when we get the report and all the pages associated with it, there's some things in there that I thought we already debated and moved out already, but it appears they are back on the paperwork, I guess. The question I want to clarify is, even though they might be in the report here, I thought some of the things we already moved out, like for instance, uh, we talked about the senior snow removal program. I thought that was off the list, but I see the report includes a page of $600,000 savings here. So I want clarification, if even though it's listed here in the pages, it's not gonna be done because I thought we talked and debated that already. Can I get clarification? Because there's other things in here that reappear in the, in the reports, in the papers, and if, if in a, I make the assumption if, if they're here with the document, that means they're here for debate again. And you know, and I just wanna make sure that you know, we're just talking about this list only and the things that we removed are not in here anymore. But it, it, it's a little confusing, so that's why I got clarification on that, sir. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hensby, through the chair to you. <clears throat> so the, the recommendation that uh, staff has, has framed up for uh, budget committee's consideration, right? That's with the items that, uh, the BAL items that are in attachment uh, A of, of your uh, staff report. We did put all the briefing notes that have been debated throughout the budget process. We did include those in the full in the full package as as information so you're you're correct here but the info or the recommendation that staff has brought forward is based on the um, ballot items that are in attachment a and the corresponding briefing notes the corresponding briefing notes so for instance another one in here that the the uh, park road park and muscadab harbor 125 thousand dollars we took that off the list we're keeping it in the budget so i assume it's still in the budget to be done is that correct no it's not in the budget right now it didn't get moved forward to a battle but it that document was part of the budget discussion and was part of the package here but i thought when we debated it back a few weeks ago that we took certain of those park projects off the list, off the off the briefing note. Therefore, they would be in the budget to be done, not not as part of the two million dollar cuts have been proposed. That's what I'm getting confused of. I thought we talked about those things in the past. They're off the list. They're not to be debated again. But I see they appear again in the briefing note. So that's where the confusion is. Are they or are they not off the list from our previous discussions? Cou Councillor, the items that council has moved throughout the budget process and that voted and gave direction to staff to proceed and include in the budget, and we'll say, use the term, bake it in, that has been done. The items that have not been moved forward to the ballot are not on the items in attachment A. Again, for clarification. Yeah. But, 
to go back to the debate we had on the $2 million reductions that the Parks and Recreation Department proposed. There was a number of playground projects, and we all debated here, no, we don't want them to be cut. So we took them off the list. So I assume when we did that weeks ago that they still be in the budget to be done. The briefing note appears again, they're back on the list. That's how I assume the thing is. So I want a clarification. I thought we took them they off They are list. removed from the budget. Right. They're not in here for debate. They are, the briefing notes, as I said, are attached as information, okay? They're not part of the staff recommendation. They're not part of the 5.6% that we're recommending. So just to clarify for me, so the $125,000 project we have for the, middle, the Muscadabra Harbor Park Road Park is still in the budget to be done. It was proposed to be cut. We debated that. We said, no, we're not going to cut it. So, so what I assume is that it's to be done. I want to have that clarified. Can, I'm just going to go to uh, Tyler and Dave on that just to confirm. I can. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so the item that you're speaking of uh, came forward as an under as part of the Parks and Rec budget, and it was not brought forward to the ballot list. So that item is included in the Parks and Rec budget. It was not removed. Uh, all of the briefing notes were actually included in the attachments here. That's why you're seeing it again, but it is not on the ballot list. It, is not, it has not been removed from their budget because it was brought forward as an under. That was not moved forward onto the ballot list and was not directed to be built into the budget. Okay, so therefore it's still on the budget. It is still done. in the budget because okay. we, there was no motion to have it removed. Okay, I just want to have that clarified because it was, it was proposed and we decided not to do it. Okay, I just want to have that clarified because it's just very confused. That's why I sent you the note we should go item by item to get that clarification because it's, it's, it's a little confusing how it's being presented. Thank you. And the other point, the uh, Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center, you talk about the due diligence site. Uh, Councillor Hensby, right. I would ask you to come back. Okay. You were out of time. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd like to talk about the McDonald's Sports Park. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big, big surprise. Um, so if, if parks or real estate is available to answer some questions, um, I've, you know, a uh, previous councillor, Council uh, Barry Dalrymple, who spoke well this morning, uh, started this project in 2015. We still don't have um, lights. And I'm in year three, budget three, and still don't see any funds associated with getting lights in the McDonald's Sports Park, even though we're meeting. And you know, I have this vision, I think I said this before, that every time I meet with park staff, I have this vision of them the day before saying, oh my God, we've got to meet with the counselor, what are we going to tell her now? Um, and it, every time it seems that like there's another roadblock, there's another roadblock. So the Waverly Athletic Association signed an agreement, the lease agreement. The province is okay with the lease agreement. Now we're saying that there's more easement issues. The last email that came just yesterday was that it's with Nova Scotia Power. So to, to get a lease for McDonald's Sports Park to take all these years seems very unreasonable. And the patience, of course, is, is gone. Uh, from the community in terms of being able to see this. So um, I would really like to hear what that easement issue is and why we think that that can't be done in a year. That that really needs to be answered, why it can't be done in a year. Um, and I do have a motion coming up but um, uh, for it, but I would like to know what the easement issue is and why it would take another at least another year. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so there is a piece remaining with Nova Scotia Power. My staff are meeting with Nova Scotia Power on site on Friday of this week uh, to identify where the stakes would go. That has, the surveyor would then have to provide that information back to Nova Scotia Power for approval. Um, now, in terms of the timing and the, the length of time that will take, I can't give you a, a definitive answer. Um, there's, I would say, two issues. One, we don't tend to proceed with design until we have the all land issues <coughs> resolved because um, we've we've spent money in the past where we don't have uh, land issues resolved and, th and that uh, creates some challenges for us. 
Um, specific to this project? Uh, I, no, I wouldn't say, I, not that I'm aware right. of specific to this project anyway. Um, so, but typically we would, we would always try and have the land issues resolved before we proceed with the project. Uh, and then the other component is, is capacity to deliver, as you know, for our staff uh, with a lot of uh, projects on the go, that's, uh, that's a challenge. So, um, you know, we would, we're certainly willing to advance it and if, if council right. uh, chooses to, uh, to move that Are up, there we'll projects on the go that have been um, since 2015? So I'm sure that there are projects that came since 2015 that are getting priority. So from 2015 on, that just doesn't make any sense. So my motion is that the budget committee increase the proposed 23-24 capital budget as set out in recommendation two by adding 75,000 for the McDonald Sports Park survey uh, relative to the business note 75. Thank you, Councillor Outhead. Um, the reason I picked the seventy-five thousand dollars is because Councilor this David, morning. I'm going to just want to confirm we have the motion on the screen as seventy-five thousand. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. The reason I picked the seventy-five thousand is because this morning uh, the email came because I asked what is the cost of this design. So that's why I chose the uh, seventy-five thousand dollars, colleagues. And as uh, you know, Barry so eloquently said, we need to do something. So this lease will get. It could actually happen in the next, you know, two or three months, and then we at least have the money to get the survey done, so that next year when we come to the budget, we know exactly what the ask and the cost will be going forward. But to do nothing, just punches this down the road again. We could be like 2027 before we see lights in a ball field, and that's just an unreasonable time frame for anybody to have to live with. Um, the community is extremely disappointed, and I share their disappointment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just uh, on this motion, I just want to, uh, with the indulgence of Budget Committee, just say that this uh, project is ineligible for debt funding. So this would be uh, capital from operating funding and would go to the uh, tax rate for this year, the taxing, overall tax increase. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Maggie. Uh, if this was approved, does, uh, does this speed up the process in any way? Through you, Chair, to the Council, it really does depend on the land issues, the resolution of the land issues. If, if the land issues are resolved sooner, then the, the funding is, is there. Um, the challenge, like as I mentioned, is staff capacity to complete, including with sort of projects uh, such as the, the um, Lockview project sort of moving up this year. Uh, staff and contractors are, are a challenge to, uh, in terms of capacity, but, uh, um, but certainly you know, it allows us, if those land issues are resolved, to, uh, to proceed. So if the leasing issues, land issues are resolved, and there, there is no, the $75,000 isn't in the budget, what happens this year? Then uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor, we would proceed with the design as, as, previously, uh, as previously indicated, so in the following year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. There are no further speakers in the list. Are we ready for the question on this? Thank you very much. That motion passes. I'm sorry, I, I do forget who was the seconder for that motion. Uh, count. Okay, thank you very much. So we are back on the main motion now. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, like uh, Councillor Hensby, I too am a bit confused between some of the items that are on the on the bell versus the briefing notes. And I just want to confirm with somebody about um, the briefing note number two, the, the tree planting project reduction. Is that built in to the budget already or is that something that's outstanding? I think, you know, in future years, it'd be very useful for us to have a list of things that have already been approved and built in. Um, you know, think, uh, budget note items that have already been approved and built in, so um, there's not this confusion, because even the wording in the briefing note is um, consideration, would, so it's not very clear uh, if this is being approved or not. Well, 
There is a one-page summary, attachment A. The staff recommendation in the, in the report, council report, moves items one to 31. If you, you should see them in that one-page attachment and you should see the briefing note number beside the item number. And these briefing notes are the ones that are included in the staff recommendation and the 5.6% increase. Any other briefing note is not included because council has chosen not to accept that and move it to the budget adjustment list. So if it was an over that was listed and council chose not to move it forward, then it's not in the budget. If it's an under that council chose to move forward, then it's still in the budget. It hasn't been cut if it was an under that wasn't taken. Okay, so, okay, so, yeah, still <laughs> probably some work to do on that. Um, but um, on the actual bow, um, I would like to move an uh, amendment to item one of the main motion that the budget committee remove budget item three, area rate admin fee, a 70,000 under from the 23-24 operating budget. And we have a seconder from Councillor Purdy. Thank you very much, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you. You know, I, I think we heard from um, a resident this morning about this, and I've heard from um, residents in my district as well about this fee for, particularly for um, area rates to do with private road maintenance. Um, you know, I, we're, we're viewing it as a cost recovery when really I think it's a necessary service to enable property owners on private roads to take responsible action in maintaining their roads. It is true they do not get services from HRM for this, but yet we've allowed these private roads to come into existence. We collect property tax on them and we don't provide a service to them. I mean, overall, this is about a 25 25 cent change on the tax bill. But I, th you know, where I think, um, you know, the property owners are getting upset is because they're doing, they're actually doing all the legwork for setting up these area rate associations, um, managing them, contracting the, the people to do the maintenance or the snow clearing. And then on top of that, we're, we're charging them a, an administration fee. So I, I do see it as a bit of a double tax. I do, I do think we're looking at this through the, lens, the wrong lens of, of cost recovery rather than a service to areas that actually don't get a lot of services from HRM. And, um, and we want to see area rates, area rate associations established because they're critically important to ensuring that roads to properties are properly maintained and serviced. So I, I would um, implore my council colleagues to reconsider this, this item and uh, to suggest removing it as an under from, from the bell and uh, supporting local area rate associations and doing the important work that they do do in our communities and um, on private roads as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I remember when we discussed this, uh, and I believe it was uh, Renee Towns who was here describing it for us, but the idea was um, w the city is doing a service uh, to the homeowners associations because we are collecting it on their behalf and then we have to distribute it for them and answer all the resident calls, all the uh, issues with the homeowners association, et cetera. And so the alternative would be to not collect it on the, their behalf, to turn it over to the association to collect it themselves from the property owners. It's a private road. Why would we get involved with a private road? I mean, so the. The 5%, and, and I disagree with the idea of it's a double taxation. So if you have an amount and you have another amount, and this amount goes up by 5, 6, 7%, whatever it is we decide, and this amount doesn't go up at all, then the 
overall bill doesn't increase by the five or six or seven percent because this portion didn't go up. So if this goes up by five and this goes up by five, the whole thing has gone up by five. It hasn't gone up by 10. I mean, you know, that's just basic math. Uh, so it's not double taxation and it's a fee as was described to us that was uh, reasonable and as best as they could estimate as the actual cost of doing this service for the homeowners associations. I think it's completely reasonable to do this. And if we are going to continue doing this, and I, re uh, I also remember from the briefing, I think it was only $70,000 for all the private roads that we do this with, with homeowners associations. So it's not a huge amount we're talking about here. And I think the uh, resident who came said it was $3,000 for their homeowners association. Um, and I've looked at the area where this is in. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of homes on the water, off the water. Um, and so spread out amongst all of them, the price per, or the fee per homeowner is gonna be relatively small. Might be large for the association because they have seven kilometers of roads and I don't know how many houses, looks like dozens and dozens and dozens of houses uh, or pieces of land, some of them don't have houses. Um, and so, uh, you know, spread around, it's not that big a deal. Uh, so, you know, if this, if we, if we reverse course on this and say, no, no, we're just gonna have all the residents of the uh, municipality subsidize the cost of doing this, then I would look at some point in the future to removing HRM from collecting this on their behalf, because it is a private road, and have the homeowners association collect it. And I don't think they would enjoy that because as was mentioned earlier, there's a huge risk that you'll have to track people down and they won't pay and it'll be hard to get from them. Um, it's easier for us as a municipality to collect it on their behalf because it's part of their tax bill. So I guess my question to staff would be, because it's part of the tax bill, if a homeowner does not pay this portion of it, that puts them in arrears on their whole tax bill, correct? They can't just say, oh, I'm only paying the HRM stuff for libraries and police and fire, uh, but I'm not gonna pay this portion because we have to collect all of their tax bill, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Cleary. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cottle. I was also going to uh, discuss this. And, and so uh, the area rates are more than just for homeowners associations and roads. It's also for recreation programs and all of that kind of stuff. So when we were looking at this, one of the things was just around that there used to be a staff position that was associated with doing area rates. Now there's not, so staff are doing it sort of off the side of their desks again. Um, but there is a significant cost to uh, operating and running uh, the area rate program. We just went through that in Waverly and I know that it was a significant amount of staff time. Then there was uh, costs and stuff. So when we look at um, all of them, one of the things that I was thinking of was if it was just a 1%, if it was reduced from 5% to 1%, uh, then it would be mostly like a material cost recovery. So if there's a change that, then we just charge for the change that happens but not, uh, and so that 1% would probably cover that and it would reduce that from 70,000 to 14,000. Um, so I just wanna make sure that I have that correct if, if somebody could answer that for me, I think. I'll uh, defer to the CFO on that. Hello, Renee Towns, Director of Revenue and Treasurer, through Mr. Chair to the Councillor. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, with the revenue at a 1% rate would be around 14,000 per year. As well, we will have to come back uh, to amend the AO and bylaw with this, so a more fulsome report could be provided at that time that included user fees as far as applying a charge on actions like increasing a rate. Um, or you know, perhaps covering the cost of mailing at that time. So if Council is amicable to that, we can take that away and, and bring that back with the uh, report that would have to go through to implement those anyway. So would, if, if it was reduced from five to 1%, would that cover any sort of change costs like postage, those kinds of things that would be not part of your budget now that you're ass assuming, I guess? <laughs> 
uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. So it would be a partial cost recovery. Uh, and mailing costs really do depend uh, or can vary by year. There's a certain amount that are set because we do uh, connect with, with the clients, but we're sending a tax bill anyway. So we okay. don't include those in, uh, in costs that we have. The, cost, the mailing costs and things that are incurred are when people uh, require a new vote to okay. change the rate or establish a rate. So those are, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle, if, would you consider a friendly amendment to change it from removal to a 1%? Seconded. Well, she is. I, I, I would, but I do have a question about the changing of the AO and if it could be done at that time rather now when we would have a, a more fulsome report on it. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Council, I'm actually going to ask, is it best then to defer uh, this item or to remove it from the ballot? We can just take that direction to come back with the uh, report to amend the AO and bylaw. Thank you, uh, Councillor. We'll need direction on uh, on that today because we need to include that amount in our budget or not include it in our budget. Right. Okay. So I'm just wondering then if we can remove it from the bell, knowing that it's coming back. That that is there direction for it to come back to council regardless of whether it's on the bell or not? No. No. We would, we would have, if council approves this admin charge, we need to come back to get the administrative order and bylaw updated with the new fees. Okay, then for now then I do accept the, I will consider that a friendly amendment. If it can be a friendly amendment, it sounds a bit different yeah. than an, just an amendment, but if, if uh, we, can, we can modify that motion to be one percent? <laughs> yeah, I know you. Sorry, <laughs> Kathy did it, not me. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Fourteen thousand dollars out of the budget. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Ian. The, the intent is to move this from a removal to a four percent reduction, so it's a one percent fee adjusting the, so it is the same content, it is just a bit of a different format because it's a reduction instead of a full removal. All right, so it's an amendment. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's good with me. And Councillor Purdy, as the, seconder of the mo as the seconder of the motion, are you okay with this as well? Okay, thank you. So the motion that we have on the screen in front of us uh, that uh, Ian showed is the motion that is currently on the floor. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll be supportive of a 1% uh, administrative charge. I gotta understand and appreciate there is a cost incurred in regards to doing these, you know, beyond the $200 initial setup fee when these area rates get established, if we charge that at the beginning, uh, I think perhaps we may want well to look at that being changed in the future to adjust that s slightly a bit at the administrative order. But I believe a 1% charge is more than fair enough to pay for the overview and oversight of these area rates, adjustments whenever necessary, and whatever additional mailings for any changes or plebiscite requests. I think those are all reasonable, but uh, the 5% I thought is a little excessive, but I'll be, I'll be supportive of 1%. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. There are no further speakers on the list. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I may have missed it. What, what is the dollar amount that we're talking here? Is it? Jerry, I'm, Jerry, I'm going to ask you to uh, answer that question, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the mayor. The uh, proposed um, um, amendment to the budget that's on the ballot was to uh, establish an administrative fee on area rates at, at 5% that would bring in an additional $70,000 of revenue. Reducing it to 1% would bring in 14. So uh, based on Councillor Cuddle's amendment and Councillor Deagle's gammons friendly, it would, it, the uh, amount would be 14,000. That's what we're arguing about, 14,000? Mr. Mayor, is that good? 
or, or are you okay with that? Oh yeah, let's, we should talk about this quite a bit further, I think. Uh, we have until four o'clock, you know. 14K, you know. <laughs> Thank I'm you, good. let's Thank do that. You, yeah. uh, and let's go to <laughs> Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't going to say anything, but then, you know, hey, <laughs> I, I just feel like we're nickel and diming here. The The reality is I don't know if 1% is enough. I don't know if that's enough to manage uh, the work that this individual or individuals or people who are working off the side of the desk to do this. Uh, so I, I feel like we're just kind of throwing a number out there without actually having the data to let us know that, yeah, you know what, $14,000 is good, except Staff came back and said, "We're going to need we're going to need a person to manage this." Uh, there are a lot of community groups, so I just feel like we're at this point just saying, "Yeah, sure, one percent, why not?" Just because, and we're spending so much time having this discussion. Um, but Renee, I, I I would like to ask you a question because we have dormant homeowners association. So those groups that have banked cash over the years, um, they, they don't have an active uh, HOA, you know, they don't have the volunteers, the community's changing, shifting. Um, there's fewer people who are able to get involved with the HOA, so they're not really active at all. But um, that being said, if they're not collecting the admin fee because they've gone to staff and said, hey, halt this, because we're not doing anything with the money, we're just accumulating cash uh, year over year, what happens with those organizations? I'm assuming there is no administrative fee uh, at all. Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Yes, that's correct. It would only be applied uh, an administrative fee as a percentage of the fee of the funds collected in that year. Of the funds collected. Right. And we don't have any say over what those uh, amounts are, for example. As you were saying, um, it could be $20 uh, per property, $50 per property, but that is decided by the community group, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the councillor, that's correct, yes. Right. So if they want to pay less administrative fee, they could drop uh, how much they're actually charging per home. That's correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hansby. Just a point of clarification, Mr. Chairman. Any local private road association or community area rate still has to be approved by this council. Even though the adjustment is in, done by a community group and asked for us to implement it, we still have to approve it. They still, check, pay for it. they still pay for it, but we still have to approve the rate here. So, the yeah, they pay the amount. Thank you for that, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Uh, so just to confirm our, our process, so we had a motion that was moved onto the floor that had these 31 items. One of those items is a 5% admin fee. So with the amendment on the floor, if we vote no to the amendment, then we're going back to the 5%. Good. And if we vote yes for the amendment, then it changes to 1% and we're done. We're on to the next one. So just for my colleagues, if 5% is the number that you thought was good, and remember that the report says we're paying towards a person, so now we're only paying 14,000 towards that person. Um, so we probably won't ha hire the person, which means someone's going to have to do extra work or if we hire a part-timer, I don't know how that works. Staff will figure that out. Um, but if you want the 5%, vote no to the amendment. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor. <laughs> I'm completely neutral, as you can tell. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for clarification on what Councillor Cleary just said, even at 5%, that was not going to hire a staff person, was it not? Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. So, uh, no, it would cover the cost of the staff person that is responsible for it now. At a certain percentage of their time, but not Cor a new position. Uh, correct, based on the time that they're spending. So in the past, right. it, there was a rationalization to try to eliminate the position. We did that for a while. It was realized that their work was too cumbersome and we had to hire the position back. So this is to cover off the percentage of that position's time that they're spending on this on this task. It is a position currently. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, thank you. And you know, I just want to um, highlight again, this isn't just about the private roads. This is also about uh, recreation area rates. These are groups that are formed to collect money, to enhance recreation opportunities in many parts of our municipality where we just aren't delivering 
um, a lot of recreational opportunities. The ball field is, is a great example. Um, this money goes towards everything from, you know, benches and picnic tables to skate parks to, um, you know, ball fields. And, um, and, and we're now suggesting that we charge a fee for this. I, I think area rate associations should be seen more as partners in the municipality, as groups that are formed to fill service gaps that we don't, that we don't deliver. And it is nickel and diming, and I agree with the mayor, I can't believe we're still discussing this right now. Um, it's not that much money, but I think it actually does mean a lot to those associations that are volunteer run, that put in their time, that pay the fees to meet at our rec centers, because you know, they have to pay those fees now, um, that, that you know, actually contribute a lot to the well-being of their communities, whether it's a road or whether it's a ball field. And, and so again, I think you know, looking at this from a cost recovery perspective and not a service delivery perspective um, is, is maybe not the way I would choose to look at it. And I would, I would say that you know, we, we should rethink how, how we see these services for these, for these groups. Um, you know, I, I, I applaud many of them in my community who do amazing work and put in a lot of time and effort. And is it, is it always easy? No. Are there people who complain and call? There are. But a lot of that has to do with supporting these organizations and getting their ducks in a row and following best practices around governance and administration, and, and that we need to be supporting them. Um, so I, I am fine with the 1%. Um, you know, I, I think we need to look at the mailing, like there's a big difference, like $200 for a group that has three or four home, homeowners versus, uh, you know, thousands. Um, it can't be just be a flat fee. I look forward to that information coming through in the AO, I think right now for this budget, 1%. We don't know all the particulars. It's better that we can say, okay, we can agree on that. It's better than 5%. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. There are no further speakers on the list. Again, are we ready for the question? Ian, it's over to you. And that motion passes. Thank you very much, everybody. We are back on the main motion. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so uh, what I want to ask about is uh, Halifax. Um, and so I have, uh, I've got three questions just regarding the briefing note, and I don't know if this is John or Shannon. Uh, the main one being, um, when this was last before us, when we were d discussing this, we didn't have all the information at that time. We had to ask for a briefing note um, on this because it, it simply wasn't prepared for us and identified initially. Um, and what I'm wondering about is, you know, there was some discussion about like, well, since staff aren't asking for this, can we actually make a go of this program? So what I'm wondering is, can we actually hire and staff these positions this year if, uh, if the money is provided as per the original resource plan? Shannon Miedema, Director of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor. Uh, thanks for the question, um, and hopefully the briefing note gave you um, the details that you were looking for. We are proposing a staggered hiring approach, which is the same approach that we took this year and last year. Uh, we had six positions last year, eight this year, and we're proposing um, these seven plus the Green Network Coordinator for next year. Um, and I now actually have four managers within my division to help help support the hiring process before it was all me individually, so um, on my own. So I feel confident that we are capable. We're, we actually have five active um, recruitments happening right now, and it's all being managed uh, properly. So yes, uh, I think that we can staff these as, as we laid out in the briefing note. Okay, uh, so if we staff these, um, you know, these people start to work on these Halifax initiatives. What happens if uh, these positions go unfilled? Like if we don't provide this money for uh, these positions? 
Yeah, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, good question. So this is really about trying to increase our capacity and our level of service for implementing the very large, complex and ambitious climate plan, both mitigation and adaptation at a faster rate and at a bigger scale than we've ever done as a municipality before. So it's referring to the three year resource plan that we provided when we came with the first update on Halifax to let council know how we were doing with our progress. Our progress was approximately 20% on track in the first year, 30% on track in the second year. Um, and we just had the IPCC report released last week saying we're kind of at, like this is the final warning and we really need to actually try and and mobilize and and go faster and further, um, not just as Halifax, but as a country, as a, as a globe. So um, if we don't have these positions, we won't go as fast as if we have them at the end of the day. Okay, uh, and so remind me, when does our local carbon budget um, in Halifax, when does that run out? If we keep to business as usual, it's approximately 2027, 2028. So 2027. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to move, uh, just trying to find my motion here uh, from Ian. Uh, I'd like to move that the budget committee increase the proposed 2023-24 operating budget as set out in recommendation one by adding the seven positions identified in Halifax in the Halifax resource plan briefing note 067 in the full amount of $412,000. Seconded by, I'm sorry, Councillor Morse. Thank you very much. That motion is on our screen. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Austin. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I think Shannon's already answered the, the key questions here. Um, do we need these positions? Yes, if we're going to be serious about moving this plan. Uh, can we hire them now? Also, yes. Uh, and when does our carbon budget run out? Basically, in government time tomorrow, um, 2030 for our zero net um, zero emission operations HRM um, community carbon budget gone by 2027. Um, so this, I mean, folks, this is the most urgent matter of our times. It is the thing that is imperiling our not just us but our entire civilization, everyone on this planet. Um, and I'm, I'm going to draw, and Shannon was starting to steal my thunder there, uh, from the IPCC. And so I'm going to quote here from their summary. In 2018, IPCC highlighted the unprecedented scale of the challenge required to keep warming to 1.5 Celsius. Five years later, that challenge has become even greater due to a continued increase in greenhouse gas emissions. The pace and scale of what has been done so far and current plans are insufficient to tackle climate change. Insufficient. That includes us, that includes everybody. We've been doing lots, there's been lots of efforts made, but it is not enough. And so the IPC goes on. Every increment of warming results in rapidly escalating hazards. More intense heat waves, heavier rainfall, and other weather extremes further increase the risk of human health and ecosystems. In every region, people are dying from extreme heat. Climate-driven food and water insecurity is expected to increase with increased warming when the risks combined with other adverse effects, such as pandemics or conflicts, become even more difficult to manage. This is every region. I think about BC, where we had hundreds of people die in the heat wave that uh, hit there last year. I think about our own region, where Fiona, uh, an unprecedented storm in terms of its atmospheric pressure, hits us, does huge property damage, and lives were lost in Port of Aston, Newfoundland, right? You know, this is, this, there are our neighbors. Um, this is not some distant problem. It is here now. It requires urgency on all our parts. And I've said this before, the challenge with climate change is everybody can look at it and say, well, we're not gonna fix it here, so why, why do anything? The problem is every town, city, village, state, country, uh, government on this entire planet has the same dilemma. And we don't have a global government, we have got some attempts at global cooperation, but all we can do is we can try and do our part. And I think we have such a strong moral obligation that we must act on this. And to not fund our plan and collect accolades for what a great plan we've done and then not properly resource it, I, I can't do that. So uh, I would urge you colleagues, this is the challenge of our times and we need to rise to beat it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor, uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Othit. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. A couple of questions, uh, one, uh, I think maybe Kathy or Jerry, this may land to you. 
I, I've mentioned several times during this during this process, I don't like uh, overlaps and I don't like duplication and I also don't like silos. Um, the example I use when we talk about the psychologist that I would like to think that if we went down that path that perhaps police, fire, transit could all have access to this person, not just not police. We've heard earlier today, we've had discussions that the Green Network also needs somebody. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, this all ties into environment, it all ties, so is there, and I, see what I don't know yet, and, and Kathy, this is maybe where I'm gonna have to ask you to speak to this. There's no question that every one of these asks is, is reasonable, exciting, and needed. But I'm still waiting for that overall vision of FTEs, how many we need, how many we don't need, where there is overlapping. Could the Green Network person, instead of being added to planning, could they not be part of Halifax? You know, could, these are the sort of things that I'm still looking for. The psychologists, could they not be shared within the organization, not just for police? I'm still looking at this rationalization, and you're too early to give us that rationalization, and I appreciate that. But I, I just, you know, is this seven people? What's the impact next year? when we're already talking a 9% tax increase, or it looks like. Um, and is there some sharing to be done with planning with, with Halifax, et cetera? So maybe just, because in spirit I support this, okay? My heart tells me this is great. My mind tells me, let's not go on a hiring frenzy here until we've done a little bit more of a reconciliation. Thank you. We have started looking at rationalization and it will take time given sure. the number of positions in the organization the you know first visible attempts you will see is the you know position we put forward with respect to the psychologist and the right. occupational therapist with the thought that you know their first priority is supporting HRP but whatever programs and processes mm -hmm. they're able to establish maybe they can be a benefit to fire for example and transit also sure the other visible um, one that we've done is with the formation of the community safety department. We've eliminated some positions. Yes. We've realigned some positions. Yes. And we've made a business process change such that any new positions being posted um, are flowing through the deputy CEO and the CAO's office for approval. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're getting a good thorough review and we have the opportunity to ask questions around is this position really needed, can we fill this need another way. Okay. So because of the volume of, of uh, positions that we have, really we're going to be needing to work, working our way opportunistically, you know, as a, as a item comes through to do that review. And we have not to my knowledge, specifically looked at the Green Network coordinator in conjunction with the Halifax program. Yeah, yeah. I will ask Shannon to yeah, comment no, if she has any thoughts on that. My, I guess my, my and, and if Shannon, I was going to do that exactly, but I just, in your opinion, and, and this is putting you on the spot a bit, but do you have a concern about hiring seven bodies right now in one department if do you have chance to do that what you've just outlined I have confidence that we're such a large organization <laughs> in the very rare chance that we hire them and Shannon's not able to fully utilize yeah, them yeah, no, we have enough. needs elsewhere <laughs> where yeah. we can use them <laughs> Yeah, no, okay, all right. No, that's actually a pretty good diplomatic answer. Okay, uh, Shannon, can you overlap with planning on some of these issues? And Mr. People. Chair, through you to the Councillor. Yeah, um, planning and myself, we've been in conversations about this idea of a Green Network Plan Coordinator right. from the very start okay. and haven't landed on, you know, the structure. It's not a position yet, so we've, we've, we've bounced different ideas around mm -hmm. and we've thought about the implications of um, multiple large strategic plans sitting in in one business unit right. versus spreading them across business units because right. they are so um, 
complex and take a lot of resources, um, but we're definitely open to exploring. And the whole idea is that this coordinator would be working kind of in alignment with what uh, the environment and climate team does, whether they sit in parks and rec, okay. whether they sit in planning and development, whether they float around, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever the organization deems to be the best strategic right. approach. I, I just wanted to make sure this kind of thinking was going on mm -hmm. because we, we're going to get these questions. Uh, we have to be, we as councillors, and we're going to have to be able to answer them. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Outfit. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Question for staff from me is, what I heard a lot when we were discussing this during the lead up to today was that the Halifax tax increase was for capital only. And I kind of went back through the budget books we were having a discussion with Councillor Cleary and I and, and you know started to look through the minutes and I don't see us specifically saying that. Like, I'm wondering if, you know, do, where did we say that is my question, and why can't we uh, peel a little bit of money out of, I mean, when you, uh, in my past life when I ran not-for-profits and worked in the arts and culture sector, it was kind of acceptable that you'd have a 5 or 10 or 15% admin overhead on a new project. We have this new project, this money to do these things to hit the, our Paris climate goals. Uh, is that a potential source for staffing? Thank you, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. I think that question came up uh, during the original debate about yeah. whether we could use the climate action tax funding, which goes into the strategic initiative reserve, which funds the debt once we deliver these uh, projects. Uh, if you look at the briefing note, uh, obviously, there's financial rules, accounting of rule, rules about what positions can be capitalized. So, you know, a project manager, for example, that designs streets, roads, sewers, yes, that, that position can be, be capitalized. When you look at the nature of the positions that are in the briefing note, these are pretty much like they look like policy type analysts, uh, you know, our advice is they don't qualify as as uh, to be capitalized so, and put against the uh, Halifax Capital Project. So understood that they couldn't be capitalized like we hired someone to oversee building a bridge, but uh, we could change the amount of money going to the reserve uh, and, and could we not? I mean, like, there's, what is, the, are there any legal or administrative reasons beyond uh, we would have to go through a bit of a process at council to change that definition to pull some of that money out of going into the reserve for strategic projects and paying for the funding for the debt we're incurring now uh, and using some of that money to provide the staff to administer the program. Yeah, if you recall, we did bring back in the fiscal presentation <clears throat> a change to the business case on the strategic initiatives reserve, which allowed for a uh, cap from operating projects to be funded uh, through the strategic initiative reserve. That was a bit of an issue that we, we, we addressed there, but uh, we, you know, we currently don't have, uh, you know, any, any policy around or um, we would have, to, like to your question, we would, you're, you're suggesting we dial back the amount of funding that's going into the reserve. Yeah. Okay, so my <clears throat> my advice on that would be, on the amount of funding that that reserve supports, uh, as you recall, we only have uh, years one to four funded uh, up to this point. Um, you know, in the 10-year capital plan, we got Burnside Transit Center coming forward. That's like a $500 million project. We do not even have a funding plan in place to yeah, do that, so yeah, I would yeah. suggest we do not touch the funding that's going into that reserve. All right, I think that's good advice, because as I was saying to another councillor earlier today, uh, right now we don't have a lot of mechanisms in budget to put new money into reserves. We've, we've relied in the past on uh, surpluses, unexpected surpluses, and those seem to be few and far between for yeah. the next couple of years. So when we draw down money from reserve, I don't think we have a lot more going in. That clarifies that question, because I know that was on the minds of a lot of councillors, and, and I will support uh, the motion that Councillor uh, Smith, or sorry, Councillor Austin has put on the floor, uh, because I think it is really important that we move forward on these projects as fast as possible. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just, you know, on the whole reserve piece, 
and Tyler mentioned in, in his presentation, right, we're actually gonna be looking at all reserves across the board, especially our obligation reserves, for example, solid waste, where we need to, and the capital reserve, where you know we've identified uh, some issues there that we need to come forward with some funding strategies on those as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hensby. <clears throat> thank you much, to Mr. Chairman. Just to clarify in regards to the motion here, it is one of the, of the briefing notes attached to the document. It's not on the list, so we're putting it on the list now. Just want to clarify that, so we're adding that to the list. And also there's discussion we already had on the list of the Green Network Plan Coordinator because this briefing note talks about uh, these, one of the eight positions is the Green Network Coordinator, so that part is not a part of the 412,000. Am I reading that correctly, that we still have the other $89,600 there for the Green Network Plan person on the budget list? Just to clarify that. Mr. Chair, through you to the council, that's correct. The Green Network Coordinator position is currently on the ballot, and these are the seven other positions that are currently not on the ballot, and that's the 412. Okay, and I'm just trying to call on previous debates. Did we not debate this matter earlier, or is this something new? Because I thought, I thought we had this debate earlier, and we decided to defer on some matters, but we're bringing it back again, it sounds like. Thank you. That's the supplementary briefing, though. That's what it was. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Shannon, I'm wondering if you could just remind us a little bit about what this work would entail and what difference it would make um, in terms of the resilience, the people working on resilience and adaptation. My understanding that was that was to help uh, protect our coastal communities. Um, uh, protect our coastal roads. We have many communities that are based on their proximity to the ocean, which will, they will be disproportionately affected by the changing climate. So I'm just wondering if you could give us a few specifics about what that would mean and how urgent it is. And also on the retrofit program, is that only for municipal buildings or would that be helping our residents retrofit their homes as well? Thank you. Mr. Chair, through you to the committee. Uh, very good question. So, and you know, in the briefing note, we do actually detail a little bit about what each position would be. Um, but essentially, the manager position uh, would really be the creation of a whole stream within our division focused on adaptation and resilience. Right now, we have two existing positions for climate adaptation um, that are. Um, at the kind of environment professional level. And we really need kind of a, a larger team. Uh, we work a lot with Shannon O'Connell and uh, her team in planning and development as well around infrastructure resilience. But um, that work is uh, really to safeguard our communities in every way that you can imagine. So not just actual physical coastal risk and flood risk, but also preparing for emergencies and power outages and thinking about food security and safety education and awareness, um, all of it, and uh, really starting working with our partners more broadly on safeguarding connected critical infrastructure and working a lot with emergency management. We just got the delivery of our storm kits um, to expand on the storm kits for newcomers project, pilot project that we did last year. We've got a lot of different things going on from specific infrastructure projects to community-wide programming. Um, the, the retrofit program that re is referred to in the briefing note is the community-wide deep energy retrofit, renewable energy, and climate resilience program that we're trying to strike that would come to council for approval, and we're targeting the fall for that. We're running a couple of pilot projects right now for that, so that is actually for ultimately all buildings within HRM, but beginning with residential buildings for community. Okay, thank you. It, it sounds to me like we're moving away from the high level, and now we're getting into projects and work that is going to affect people in their day-to-day -day lives, and, and I'm really excited to see this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Morse. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so, you know, a lot of my colleagues have, have you know, talked about great, good points and, and made excellent points on a number of issues, and just to address a few of them, you know, Councillor Mason talked about the Climate Action Tax, and 
you know, as uh, Mr. Blackwood's already pointed out, we've already committed all that money. Uh, so not only is it bad practice to take a lot of operating funds from capital uh, money, but we already have a plan and we have a lot of things to do beyond that money. We were only resourced for the first four years. And so it's kind of like six one way, half a dozen the other. If we take it from there, then we've got to make it up somewhere else. So it's kind of like, okay, if we take it out of the 3%, we just got to find it in the general rate. Uh, so it makes no sense to just not put it on the general rate to begin with. My big concern in this when we discussed it uh, originally was around capacity and the ability to staff them and when they would get online and the briefing note covers that. The staggered list of hiring dates, the positions, the details of what each of these people are going to do uh, gives me a lot more comfort knowing that we can absorb these folks and they can hit the ground running and actually start doing the work that we need to do that we're so far behind on. And so, um, you know, uh, Councillor Outfit also talked about uh, the Green Network Plan and remember that that we have to green and clean all departments within HRM. And so the idea that, well, can't, you know, environment and climate change work with uh, the Green Network Plan? Well, yes and no. I mean, that's why they're going to coordinate. But remember, the Green Network Plan is a planning policy. How you implement planning policies are through things like the land use bylaws. So someone has to be part a planner as well as an environmentalist to look at how do we take these uh, important uh, ecological cultural areas, this patchwork of stuff we want to save and protect, limit development on, maybe allow development over there where it's uh, uh, not important. And so that they need planning speak in order to do that. So although there may be coordination with Shannon's department, it's probably not going to be within her department because they have to be a planner or part planner. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about that in my mind, like who is the person you're going to find for this? And, you know, there are people with M plans who are engineers who are, you know, all kinds of things. So probably it's not going to be hard to find a person with environmental scientific background is also a planner uh, who can who can do that work. So when I look at kind of, you know, and tra transit's another great example. We need to glean and green and clean transit. Uh, so, you know, electrifying the buses, having more routes, having more, especially to our suburban communities. And I'm looking forward to developing uh, a better transit strategy because that is, um, an area where we can get, if, if the developments are repaired and if new developments are transit friendly, you can get a lot more people uh, moving around the municipality in a more sustainable way. And so all of these things are, you know, part of our green plan, if you want to call it that, but they're not all part of Ms. Miedema's department. <laughs> and so when I look at uh, this and I look at these individual positions, I see folks who can work you know, Councillor Outhead talked about silos. I see people who can work across the silos within the uh, organization. When we talk about adaption and engagement and all those things, all of our departments have to be involved and engaged with the community about how we implement the the uh, the our action our green or our climate action plan. And so uh, I can support this. You know, it is more money, uh, but we also know that if we're not going to invest in this area, we're not going to meet any of our targets. And then what's the point? And so I think uh, D the Deputy Mayor is, is right on on this and uh, staff are very uh, engaged in this and they brought back uh, really detailed information that I can support. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you, Shannon and uh, the team. This is a tricky one for me. I'll be very honest, because I don't think anybody's championed Halifax more than I have, because I'm the mayor and I take it around the world, not just around the country. I'm proud of it. Um, and I've been with Shannon and other places and proudly talked about the plan. My, my issue is that how much is enough? You could argue we can't spend enough on the environment. Uh, that whatever we spend isn't enough. But in the last couple of years, we have asked the people of HRM to support our vision and hopefully their vision of climate change action. Uh, they're paying $18 million a year in the climate action tax, which is now baked into the budget. Uh, we added, first of all, six people last year, Shannon, and there's eight that have been approved in this year's budget and now we're looking at another seven. That's a very dramatic uh, escalation. Plus the Green Network Coordinator. I can support the Green Network Coordinator. <clears throat> and I could comfortably support some of these positions. 
Keep in mind that this, these weren't above or below the line when this came forward on the $4 million budget. We approved the ones that were suggested. These, these go to the original Halifax plan, which we uh, approved. You know, it's just a challenge uh, for me to, to bring this forward at this point in time with this, with this cost. So we're going with it for a, a department that consisted of Shannon Miedema for some time. <laughs> And we needed to support that. And the Halifax plan identifies, and the Halifax plan identifies these uh, positions. They didn't make the original cut. It's just, it's a tough one. Um, you know, because on, on top of this, we're spending a lot of money on environmental initiatives. This doesn't include what we're spending um, on, on a regular everyday basis on what I would call nature-based solutions, you know, which is trees and investments in places like Blue Mountain Birch Cove and the money we spent on, um, on the Shaw Wilderness Park and, and the other stuff that we're doing. Um, it wouldn't include bike lane construction, which could come out of uh, TPW, I assume. Um, I, I, so there's a lot of initiatives we're doing. I don't know how to vote on this one, to be honest with you, because you know, I, th this is a huge issue. This is the challenge of our time. Uh, you know, one of our challenges is every week something is the most important thing to us. One week police, what's more important than public safety? And then it's what's more important than fire protection? What's more important than our libraries? What's more important than recreation for, for kids? Everything is important, and there is no question that climate change is the, as they say, the exist existential challenge of our time. I just, I just you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with, uh, with this coming forward. Um, Shannon has identified these positions, pretty well-paid positions. Um, I would encourage councillors to consider applying for these positions uh, based on, um, you know, starting in September, a junior environmental professional, uh, 71, no, that's estimated for the year, for the whole year, is it? Or is that just the cost from September 1st to one year, full, full one year? Okay. Okay. Um, so the, so the 412,000 is the cost for this year for the amount of time that we have them. Um, you, you know, the first time, Shannon, you came here, we asked the question, we kind of got the answer that we didn't think we could hire these people. You're saying now we think we can get these people in by these dates. So of the eight people that, are in the, that we already approved for this year, those are the people you're saying you've got interviews, you've got plans, you can hire those, most of those eight people? Mr. Chair, through you to the mayor, can you, sorry, can you clarify? So you said that you've, you're, you've, you're going to be able to hire, you mentioned a couple of positions. So of the eight positions for this year already approved? This current year? Yes. Mm -hmm. they're, all, they're all in position? We have five active right now uh, uh, in offers, working. in interviews, okay. in uh, postings. So not um, all of the eight are yet hired? Not yet. Okay. But you believe that you can get these people in place by these dates yes. for this year? Yes. Yeah. It's a tough one for me, folks. It's, uh, you know, I, I, we have to invest in climate change. I, I'm just concerned about, uh, you know, this escalation, this cost. We're, you know, I tell people when I go around the world and talk about uh, Halifax, and particularly the Climate Action Act, I say, look, this, this has been bought in in Halifax, and it was, it's been universally accepted by some of the people. I mean, we are, we are, we're making a charge on this. Um, that, Maybe I can support this. I'm, I'm struggling with, uh, with adding it at this point in time. I'll be very honest. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Shannon. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, you know, I, I just want to quickly note, not, uh, not just uh, for this particular budget briefing note, but for all the budget briefing notes, I just want to give a big shout out to staff for putting together all this work. It's a, it's a tremendous amount of work to kind of guide us through this budget process, be transparent, talk about, you know, what, you know, what we're, we're looking at in the budget and how it aligns to all our goals. And I, I just want to recognize the hard work that has gone into all of these things and all these considerations. Um, you know, the Halifax Green Network Plan, like absolutely, like now is the time to hire that position while we're doing the regional plan to see how it fits with our future development patterns. We're also looking at, you know, doing the suburban and rural plans. And so these are things that are happening now that we, that we need right now. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, taking a step back and to, um, 
you know, reiterate what Councillor Al had said. It's about making sure there's not duplication, coordination, and that we're not working in silos. And so I, I, was just, uh, I was just a little bit surprised when I heard you talk about emergency storm kits, because in my head, I was like, oh, well, isn't that um, you know, search and rescue? Isn't that emergency response? Isn't that public safety office? And, um, and so I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me sitting here how all those pieces interact and support each other. Are we duplicating efforts? Um, I also think about the community developers that we already have that are, that are housed with Parks and Rec who are going and working with community organizations, developing action plans. I think about our community partners and our stakeholders, the, the GEM teams out there that are in communities, embedded in communities. I think about external organizations that are um, looking at supporting communities in, um, you know, funded through other levels of government and supporting communities in um, building their own uh, capacity to respond to emergencies. So, um, I, you know, in reading the briefing note, um, you know, I, I get some of it, but I don't, I don't see how all the pieces fit together for the seven positions to, I feel like I just don't know enough to say, yes, let's go ahead with the seven without understanding how the work that, the important work that you're doing in, in your department is being supported organize it, you know, through other pieces of the organization that are working on similar things where through council priority and direction, it's like a little bit of tweaking, you know, so that when, you know, Jasmine Dew is out there working with the Prospect Community Center, we can make sure that emergency response is a priority of that center and that board and of that organization because it's something that's important to the municipality and we provide funding to them to, to support that. So I, 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 that, I guess that, you know, um, you know, for me, I was, I was very happy when the, uh, when the CAO said that, you know, she was gonna look at all the full-time positions and it, we didn't know if we needed a, a Halifax Green Network coordinator in the beginning and we took a look at that and the briefing note came back and it said, yes, we do need it. It's been recognized that this person is needed if we wanna make this happen. And so that gave me some reassurance that, okay, you know, we've looked at this strategically um, we've identified a gap, we do have a need, let's move forward with this. With the seven positions here, I, I, I do have questions, and I don't know if you can speak to that right now, Shannon, about how the work that you're doing around climate resiliency fits with, with the other departments who are also involved in similar aspects of this work. Mr. Chair, through you to the council, really good question. Uh, I can assure you that it is my everyday work and my team's everyday work to break down silos and work across silos. We've never kept to ourselves. We don't make any decisions on money or projects or programs without working very closely with the other relevant uh, business units or divisions uh, or teams, whether they're internal or external. And you can really see that in how we actually report on the climate plan and the 46 actions, there's one particular group that's got the ultimate accountability and responsibility for the action and then there's supporting divisions um, and we have it all laid out with all 46, it all goes through the coordinators, um, we're all kind of, we're all in tune with what's going on where. Um, so, and then for something like storm kits, like that was an initiative that was developed with em emergency management. So it was to broaden and support and put a climate lens and some climate communications um, to the work that was, uh, was already happen happening in emergency management. So it wasn't, so we added some funding that they didn't have to do translation in multiple languages, for example, because we're really trying to access vulnerable communities in climate preparedness. So it, it's that type of work that we're doing that's kind of with and but also on top and not not without collaborating all we do all day every day is to collaborate so um, I don't know if that answers your question but that's that's kind of how we operate yeah it, it does answer my question and provide some reassurance but I think it'd be good for us to see those pieces more in the in some of the reporting that we get If I could just add one more thing, we also, um, we have our governance structure for 
implementing and running the climate plan where we uh, that's been adopted by senior leadership and we're working to strike some really focused working groups that does cross um, departments on specific issues or barriers or topics um, and I think that as that gets established and gets well known across the organization that will also and by council that will also provide a little more detail on how we're self-organizing all right great thank you Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to your team, Shannon, and to um, all the work uh, that you've done so quickly. Um, I, I just feel like, you know, it's, you're constantly running and, uh, and getting uh, so much done. Um, I have, um, you know, so I do have concerns similar to where the mayor's, uh, you know, expressed. I'm a huge supporter of um, all of the work that, that we've been doing over the many years, uh, w along with community, side by side, um, looking at Halifax and looking at ways um, that, that we can uh, build in resilience, build in better mitigation initiatives. Um, at the same time, though, I spent the last you know uh, few uh, days and, well, yesterday, trying to figure out this federal budget and what's in it for us. Um, looking at the provincial budget, what's in it for us? What information are we missing uh, and what can we um, take advantage of and uh, you know which programs can we can we you know work with both federally and provincially we know we don't have a coastal uh, regulations coastal production regulations yet uh, we know that um, you know the Canada Water Agency is uh, is being born which is awesome we're all you know very excited to see where that goes um, the federal uh, budget for em environmental protection disaster mitigation Again, I haven't gotten through all of this, so I, I, I'm looking at this saying, I, I just don't, I don't know that we're, we're, I think we're just carts before the horse in that I'm not quite sure how we as a municipal government fit into this by creating these positions and funding these positions when I don't really have a firm sense of where the province and the federal government is going with all of this. Not to say that I don't think that these positions are valuable, but I'm not sure that now is the time to do it. I think we have to take a step back and reevaluate where are the priorities based on what it is that the province is doing, based on what it is that the federal government is doing, so that we can align with those uh, other orders of government and ensure that we are spending our taxpayers' dollars wisely and uh, putting it into the right right places that we need to do to take advantage of all the programs that are out there. So unfortunately, I can't support uh, the motion on the floor right now. Uh, that being said, I, it's not that I don't support the work that um, that you and your team are doing. It's that I think that we've we've just jumped ahead a little bit too far and need to take, kind of take a step back. There is significant uh, amount of opportunities in this federal budget that I want to make sure that we take advantage of. So by by um, putting these positions forward without knowing whether or not they align, I don't know that that is good governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thanks. Uh, very briefly, question for Jerry or uh, Shannon. If uh, we don't approve these now, it seems to me that you'll be coming back and probably asking for this next year, right? I mean, like, th these are job, these are positions that are needed to deliver the program. And the question wasn't, are we going to do them really? It was, are we going to do them now? Are we going to do them next year? Isn't, am, am I misreading this? Mr. Chair, if you do the councillor, uh, I mean the resource plan was proposed that 25 new positions were needed uh, over three years as a kind of a starting point to address the seven critical core areas as outlined in the climate plan, not even all of the climate plan and it was based on discussions across business units but it wasn't ever you know, it had no teeth, it was just, this is what we think we need to actually staff up to deliver is about 25 jobs over three years. So there's no guarantee of jobs. It's, it's up to council year over year whether we, yeah, we would certainly propose um, more jobs for next year if we didn't get them this year. So we've we've had the 25 uh, FTEs in front of us for some time, thanks to Councillor Austin asking for the resourcing report, I think two years ago now. Uh, the key date for me and the key numbers are 2030, is seven years away. 
that's the number for me, right? And so how much is enough? It's a work back from what do we need? What resources do we need now to be able to meet the commitments that are outlined in the uh, Halifax plan already? And uh, you know, I recognize that there's substantial federal money potentially coming, and I hope the province figures out what it's doing in this regard. But uh, we're still gonna need resources, the people, human beings with jobs who are tasked with this work to be able to find and then deploy that money uh, uh, when, when and if it comes. And even inside of what we're already doing with all the programs that are identified that are things that can be done directly by the municipality, we know we need these 25 positions and, and that the ones that are in front of us right now are critical to that. So every year we delay, it becomes closer to impossible to actually achieve the goals that we told the public we raised taxes for two years ago or a year ago to, uh, you know, the goals that we've set to align with international and national goals on uh, the uh, Paris goals by 2030 and uh, net energy zero by 2050. So I just, I can't delay. I have to vote for these. And if there's rough edges where we have to figure it out when you know clarity comes from uh, programs from the feds and the provincial government at that time i think we can be nimble enough to do that but i think that we need to continue to move forward with the resource plan based on on halifax uh, that we've all uh, been quite uh, proud to champion so i would ask i would beg that you support the motion on the floor thank you thank you very much councillor mason uh, go ahead councillor daigle gammon Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so these would be, I believe in everything that you do. I think that you were amazing, Shannon, and you lead an amazing team, uh, and not just provincially, but nationally and internationally, and uh, that is something to be extremely proud of. Um, I know as a counselor, uh, whenever we read this kind of stuff, we think about, wow, we're, we're doing a great job. Um, and on the right path, Balancing that with what is the tolerance for the budget that we can accept. Um, so should this be approved, and I, I'm still on the fence, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's a very difficult thing to think that we've already had so many positions, had this discussion, didn't bring this forward to the bowel. So if this should get approved, Jerry, what is the impact then um, on the budget, if you don't mind? Thank you, uh, Councillor Deagle Gammon. Uh, so right now, um, you've added back in 56,000, um, that's the delta on the administrative fee for area rates, as well as the lights for the ball field, which was 75,000. Uh, right now we're at 5.8%. So uh, adding this in, We'll, we'll still stay at 5.8%. It wouldn't trigger a rounding up to uh, up to like 5.9 or 6%. So and we're at 5.8. And then your projection that you did for the next year, because then these are now full-time positions, um, in the next year coming up, does that have another rate increase impact? The, they would, uh, yes, they would be part of the rate increase for next year, the incremental value right. of a full, right. uh, full year uh, cost. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Go ahead, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just regarding the not knowing exactly what the federal government and the province are doing on climate, I don't think that's a good reason to delay on, on these hires. Um, what we've seen with the rapid housing uh, program is that we have to have our plans in place because there's not much time to make decisions when that money does become available. So I see these these hires as getting our, our um, program in place and making progress on our own direction. And then if there is money available, we'll be um, in the right position to take advantage of those cost shared projects. But to not have these people in place, to not make progress on our own plans, and then to not be in position for that money, I think would be a, a mistake. So I really think we should fund these, prog these uh, positions now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. And I know this this is challenging. Um, you know, 
Unfortunately, as a society, the opportunity to go slow on climate change was squandered. If we'd started all this in the 1990s, when science was first identifying this as an issue, uh, we could have done a more slow and gradual approach to this issue. But that time was squandered away, in part because there was significant financial interests that were very much uh, undermining the science and lobbying uh, their own vested interest on that. So we, we lost that opportunity. And now we have to move in a way that we've never done before. Um, and this issue is, is it's that important. And I wanted to, you know, I know, I know the mayor's question was a little, a little bit rhetorical, but uh, I want to give, try and give an answer to it. Um, how much is enough? Well, when, how much is enough on this we actually tried to get at that question. If you remember um, back when we passed Halifax, the initial rec staff recommendation was don't do anything until we're out of the pandemic. But we as a council said, no, that's not, a good, enough, not good enough. We need to try and deal with this now because as Elizabeth May has pointed out many times, one of her quotes that I like is uh, we're not negotiating with the atmosphere. The atmosphere is just physics, right? Uh, it doesn't wait for a convenient time for us. Uh, so how much is enough is uh, we then tried to get at that question asked for a resource plan that was a year late getting to us, and then we had a plan that actually identified to make this plan real, this is the staff you need. And so this is just the next segment in that. Why, and I was trying not to go here, why this was not identified for us as a proper kind of pressure the way other items were, frankly, I think was a, was a failure among our staff. Um, that should have been set out for council in the way that a lot of these other budget items were, but I understand we had a bit of a freeze going on, some decisions by previous leadership. Um, and, you know, that was borderline misleading council to me um, because council had asked for this as a priority item, we'd asked for a resource plan, and then that information was not identified as a proper over the way it should have been. And so we asked for a briefing note, we've got the briefing note, we've got a plan that is doable. Um, what I'm really scared of on this, and it's great that we can go around the world, we can talk about Halifax and how wonderful it is, um, but if we don't resource this, it's gonna be another green network plan where people are then um, chomping at the bit saying, how come you've not lived up to that? It'll be another urban forestry plan where we only hit 70% of what we were trying to do. Um, this is what this needs. This has been looked at by our staff. It's been brought forward. This is what we need to do. And I really hope we're going to rise to the challenge. And I was going to close, but sensing that there's a little bit of fence sitting in the room, I really wanted to put that pitch in. This isn't a pet project for me. This is an actual developed resource plan that came from our staff and, you know, is what is needed to make this plan real. I've used my three. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, you have stepped forward. Would you, would you like to address this? John McPherson, Executive Director of Property, Fleet and Environment. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the decision was made at the time of putting the budgets together not to include, the, include these positions and um, for a, ver a variety of factors, um, including some key positions that uh, needed to be filled and the budgetary pressures um, that we're looking at right now. So. That is some of the background to uh, to the decision. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we have four more speakers on the list, and it is ten after twelve. Uh, let's break now for lunch and come back at one o'clock. This is just for councillors. I did not send out an email uh, asking to chat. That's another uh, phishing thing. Just so, and if any citizens got them, I don't want. I'm always happy to chat, but I don't want to chat now. <laughs>
Good morning, or good afternoon, and welcome back to the uh, Budget Committee meeting um, for Wednesday, March 29th. Uh, we do have another list of speakers to, to go through, so Councillor Cleary, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, hard to get back on the topic uh, when we've all been away at lunch. Uh, just, you know, so to the point that some people have made around, you know, we're, we're very proud of our plans, uh, but, you know, we're not sure if we want to implement our plans. If you remember, in 2019, we declared a climate emergency. And uh, we uh, passed the Halifax Climate Action Plan. We actually did pass a resourcing plan that specified how many people were going to be hired over what time period and all the other things we were going to need to do. We implemented the climate action tax. We've already hired some of those people and more of them uh, up to eight very soon. And then uh, I think there was 17 more on top of that for a total of 25. Uh, that was in the resource plan. So we're not even, uh, well, we're a, quarter, a third of the way through hiring the people we said we were going to hire. And, uh, you know, there were some concerns when this first came up around capacity and resourcing, and the CAO said she was going to go away and look at uh, FTEs, and uh, we asked for a briefing note to come back. It said, can you do this? When would you do it? What would it look like? Staff have done that. Everyone's gone away and come back and said, we can do it. We're ready to go. And it'll be staggered over the year. Um, when you have a job to do, you put a plan together. Once you have that plan, you put together sort of some sort of implementation strategy and tactics. We've done that. We've started hiring people. Uh, at some point, we've got to use your favorite analogy, bite the bullet, uh, walk the walk, uh, you know, uh, keep good to our promises. I don't know how you will go back to your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your friends, and say to them, well, you know, we had this opportunity to really impact climate change, but we kicked it down the road again. I can't. And the amounts we're talking about here, they seem large, uh, but as Jerry pointed out, I think it was f we're at 5.8, and if we do this, we're still at 5.8. It's not even a full percent on the tax bill. And so I don't know how we can't do it. We promised our residents we would do this. To the deputy mayor's point, you know, when the IPCC report came out recently, and, and, you know, I've listened to several podcasts and some news coverage, you know, the headlines around, you know, final warnings. If we don't get our crap together now, when are we? You know, to the deputy mayor's point again about, you know, we've known since the 70s or whatever, I can't remember the decade he mentioned. We've known since the mid-1800s about greenhouse gases. And greenhouse is not a perfect analogy. It was the best one we have so far. We know since over a hundred years ago that this is actually caused by CO2. We know we're warming the planet. And if we keep doing it, and it's going to, for decades now, it's going to be worse, but if we don't do something now, it'll get catastrophically worse for human habitation on this planet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so it, uh, coming back from lunch, uh, we do kind of lose the momentum in the conversation. But, um, you know, I, I think no, it's, it's not, no one at this table is saying we're not, we don't want to do Halifax. Uh, that's not what I've heard at all. Um, I think one of the key pieces that was mentioned was just around good governance and making sure we're making the right decisions, we're being fiscally responsible, and, and we're utilizing all of our all of our resources, both capital and human, um, you know, to to achieve the goals that we need that we know we need to achieve. Um, so I just I guess I just want to ask because the federal government budget did just get released. We're still processing and digesting all of that. There is money in there for climate action. Um, you know, in approving these positions today, I just, you know, Shannon, and I know you probably follow this stuff closely, I and mean, this is your bread and butter. Like, do you see that there could be opportunities to leverage funds from other levels of government 
to help support this important work. Because it's also something we've said all the way along, is you know, whether we look at the electric buses, it's about taking the opportunity <coughs> to go after funding from other levels of government that we can apply to achieving our climate action goals. And so, you know, I mean, is, is you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? By proving these, are we missing out on opportunities where we could have found funding? Mr. Chair, through you to the council, a really good question. Uh, we are always seeking to leverage our funds um, by applying for federal and provincial funding and other funding. And in my um, second year update presentation, um, and in the business plan presentation, I talked about how many millions of dollars across the organization we've been able to leverage for Halifax related work, including transit, buildings, EVs, adaptation, et cetera, and our team alone has leveraged over $5 million of external funding this year. So that is not something we're ever gonna stop doing. It's really, really important, and it, it reduces the burden on, on us here as a local government. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. You know, thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, when we <laughs> voted on um, on the climate action plan, the, the Halifax, and I would get questions from people: Is this the right time? Because we're in a, we're, we're, you know, things are we're coming out of a pandemic. This was a year ago, and um, cost of living is. I said, no, it's not the right time. Thirty years ago was the right time. We've missed that. This is the best time that we we have. I just don't think it's fair for any councillors to say either of the two following things: If you don't support all these positions, you don't care about climate change. Or, if you do support them, you don't care about the tax rate. Because I think we all care about climate change, and I think we all care about the tax rate. We have to make decisions based on priorities. Um, Shannon, just, just <clears throat> to Councillor Clary's point, how many people work with you now in, the, in, the, in your department? Mr. Chair, through you to the Mayor, of current filled positions, we're yeah. 16. 16. And so we're more than a quarter of the way through. That's 16 total across right. environment and climate change. That's not all Halifax related positions. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, it, <clears throat> so when it says eight of these positions were funded and approved in 22, 23, those are in and done, and you have those folks. Um, and Sarah, for example, would be one of those positions. Right, yeah, we're still, filling, we're still filling some of the eight that we have this year, but we're, we're close to being done them. For this yeah. year. And we have more for next year, right? This is the more for next year that we're asking, yeah. Yeah, so it was mm -hmm. eight and 23, 24, but that included a uh, green network plan. Right. And so nine, so we're, you know, we're at, uh, we're, 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 we're pretty, we've done pretty well, uh, you, know, you know, along on this. You know, I don't know that we have enough people in housing or community safety, or, or almost anything. Uh, and, and so, like, we really have to f figure this out exactly, you know, where we are. We have made a tremendous commitment, more, I think, than any other city in the country. And you can say, well, I don't care about other cities. Well, you know, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. Um, you know, I mean, we have made a big commitment, and you can't say that we haven't. And, you know, maybe we're not as far along as we need to be, but we've come a long way <clears throat> under the leadership of Shannon. I'm proud of that. And if this passes today, I will not only defend it, I will, I will tout it. But I can't vote for this. If, somebody, if this was defeated, if it may well pass, it probably will pass. If it doesn't pass and there was an alternative to hire the top two positions, because these are prioritized for us, then I would support that, for example. And... Um, but my point is, we have to make decisions as individuals. I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't care about climate change. And we have made a commitment. Whether we voted for Halifax or not, we're all in that boat now. We are committed to that capital cost of, of the fleet and renovations and all that. We are hiring people. And as I said, I will hi I, I'll, I'll support the position for the uh, Green Network Coordinator. And I could support some of these. I just don't think that I can support seven new positions um, for this year that weren't even in the original ask this budget year. They may have been in Halifax, but they weren't this. That's where my head is. You know, I think everybody's trying to do the right thing. We just got to figure out how to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. 
Well, thank you much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I follow the same line of thinking as the mayor does in regards to this particular situation. I have some difficulty of all seven positions. I think maybe three or four can be moved forward this year. But you know, I was kind of wondering about some of the positions in there, like the retrofit uh, program. I thought we we're doing that already with the various departments. We're you know upgrading and our facilities. We're changing our fleet over. We're doing some aspects of the retrofit already already being done. So why we need to have an additional person to oversee what's already being done already. I'm just trying to get a better appreciation of how this position is supposed to work or not because we have a lot of it in play already. So I'd like to have some clarification on that. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, this is not for existing work. This is to launch a, a new large community-wide program, um, basically to take Solar City and scale it up to be Ener like energy efficiency, deep retrofit work, as well as solar, as well as resilience to climate change impacts. So it's a new, it's someone to lead a really large, uh, even more complicated than solar city type of program for our community. So this is beyond our municipal properties. You're talking we're going into help community groups and organizations and private homeowners, etc. Okay, and so what does efficiency Nova Scotia do then? I thought, you know, they were doing that already, so I'm wondering if we're duplicating a process here that the province may be offering. Mr. Chair, through you to the council, no, we're not duplicating, and we are working closely with them on the design of the program. We've talked also with the province to see if there was opportunity to do a province-wide program. There was an appetite for that right now. Efficiency is doing one of the pilots to help inform this program for us right now, um, as well as Think Well Shift is doing one, and we had some studies done as well. So we're just kind of culminating everything, and it will come to council for a vote once it's ready. Uh, but we basically have nobody really um, dedicated to spending time on, the, like, developing um, this program alongside finance and, and the other departments that will be involved. It would be someone from Halifax Water to help with water conservation issues? Mm, that's a good question. We hadn't considered Halifax Water as part of the, the program, no. Just from shower heads to water taps to whatever the case may be, there's a lot of water <laughs> being wasted that I think we should look at conserving mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Noted. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just for clarification, if you look in the briefing note, because the mayor mentioned eight plus the uh, uh, Green Network Plan, but the briefing note has seven positions, and the Green Network Plan would be on top of that. That would be eight. So it's not eight plus one, it's seven plus one. So for environment, it's only seven. Um, and what Shannon's talking about, if you look at the jobs and the job descriptions, these are things that we have told Ms. Miedema and her team, we want you to do. You know, when we talk about Solar City, for example, we voted to expand that program beyond just providing solar panels to retrofits. That was our decision as a council to send back to staff to say, go do that thing. If they don't hire that person, they can't do what we told them to do. And so, um, you know, I really think it's important for us not to keep delaying this. And I'm going to quote the mayor who was quoting probably President Biden. I'm not sure if he was president at that time, but show me your budget and I'll show you your priorities. So, yes, we probably need more people in housing. Yes, we probably need, need more people in public safety. Yes, we probably need a lot of other things. But we also have, as you've noted, an existential crisis in front of us. And if we don't put this in the budget, we have deprioritized it. We have deprioritized climate action. We've told staff this is the plan. We've approved the plan. We've approved the resource plan. We said go last year, do these things. Part of that was 25 position, new positions we'd be hiring. Now we're not. So if you keep kicking it down the road, our climate action will not kick in. And Ms. Mima will be back. And instead of, you know, we're 30% towards our target, maybe we're only, you know, 30 again, 35. Maybe we're, maybe we're nowhere. Maybe we reverse course. I don't know. But if we don't, and this, yes, if you vote against this, you are deprioritizing climate action. Because we've already told staff this is the plan. They brought back a plan. We approved the plan. And now you're saying it's too expensive. I don't want to do the plan that you provided and we approved. Now we're just, this is budget. We're funding the positions that we've already approved the plan for. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Mason. Thanks, Chair. So you know what I knew we didn't have enough staff working on climate and environment stuff? When Kevin Bootlier in September 2019 emailed me to approve me uh, my solar city application on a Sunday, 
right? Because there aren't enough hours in the day for the existing staff at that time with a smaller program to be able to actually deliver the program 40 hours a week working from home or working from work at that time. It was 2019, so you actually had to go in. Uh, to me, I punched back in because what, what Ms. Miedema just said is terrifying to me. On, on the, at the national table at GMF, regionally, provincially, and in HRM, the biggest thing we're talking about, the, number one is decarbonize the grid, right? Got to decarbonize the grid. The other one is how do we make sure that only wealthy people are not the people benefiting from all this environmental stuff and that we're addressing energy poverty and that we're looking at how to make sure that low-income homeowners are also participating in this. And some of you heard me say this before, but the program we're talking about, the deep energy retrofit, it's great that you can get money from us on a cheap loan for solar panels. What you can't get right now, what you need to be able to get is money to be able to make sure you have a 200 amp panel in your house where I grew up in Woodlawn to make sure that you can uh, put in heat pumps and put in a car charger and put solar on. Uh, and a lot of the places I suspect if I went by and, and could get in not that there's any reason why anyone would let me in because I'm pretty sure all my friends' parents aren't there in Woodlawn anymore 30, 40 years later. A lot of those places probably still have a 60 amp panel with the screw fuses, right? So like that's their first barrier to entry is that five or six or $7,000 to upgrade that, to fix the envelope, to blow in insulation, to replace the windows. Those are the kind of things, you know, and, and I hate to say this, but you know, uh, you've heard me say it before, uh, this is the kind of stuff they've been working toward in Bridgewater through Energize Bridgewater for the last five years and we need to get there. We need this program badly. It's a cornerstone of making sure we hit the decrease in carbon outputs that we committed to in uh, the Halifax plan, that chart that shows here's the difference against business as usual. If we don't do this now, we won't hit those timelines. We need staff to do that. There's no way, th there are, there's nobody else who's gonna do this work. Standing up a program like that requires staff and all the other things we committed to require staff. So. Uh, I hope that this passes. If it doesn't, I think we're going to need, with all due respect to the mayor, more than two. I think that, you know, it's going to be more than that. But what we need is seven so that we can actually hit the goals that we've told the public we're going to hit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mason. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Just a <clears throat> clarification. I mean, uh, there was a misunderstanding of what you said, I think, Jerry. I mean, this is 400,000. Um, and this, you, you seem to imply that the little piddly things that we added took us to 5.8, and this doesn't. This is what takes us to 5.8 from 5.6, but this is much more than all those other ones put together. Correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, <clears throat> the way to round to round up, okay, and be to go from like um, four. 4.6 to say 4.7 or whatever, it's like a $800,000 swing to do that, right? And it's just because of the rounding, right? So just where we, when we were coming in here, it just took uh, that 56,000 and 75,000 to bump us up to uh, the 5.8. That's just the way it it rounds. The, the uh, 400,000, uh, for this uh, 412 for this this amount does not uh, trigger the rounding up of, of the percentage increase right. <clears throat> but it takes us from sort of uh, I mean but just logically 400,000 is a bigger impact on the tax rate than 70,000 or whatever it is we already did before that yeah that, that's so if anything else gets removed that will trigger rounding up right well. and I think you know I, I'm prepared to look at the parking piece, the only other thing that I'm prepared to look at on this, but, but in that case, um, you know, when Kevin Bootlier called Wayne Mason in 2019, there was only two people in doing the work. We now have a significantly higher number of people, and we need them. I support it. Um, I just think that we have to phase this this year, so I, that's why I vote against it, but it's, it's not right to say that we, any of us that do that don't have a commitment to climate action. Um, you know, we, we are building an important department in this city. And we make that decision, and we have to make it at budget time. We've adopted Halifax. Um, we're adding people to it. Don't have a problem with that. Uh, it's a matter of how far we go, um, because this was not part of the original. I mean, we talked about this. Councillor Austin, in fairness, brought this up when Shannon came the first time, because there was the above, below the line, and then there was this. And so 
it's not like it's sprung upon us totally uh, out of the, out of the blue. So I don't have a problem with discussing it. Um, uh, just you know, we have to figure these things out together, and we we have to make decisions that we all try to do with the best of intentions. And climate action is beyond a question, but that doesn't mean that we don't question the action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Othet. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, it was a very good arguments here, but. And I, and I think maybe we'll have to hopefully come up with some kind of a compromise here. But you know, when I look at the IMP and how we haven't funded that, we promised that as well to residents. We're not making our fire commitments. We're not making those timelines anymore. We're not making our police timelines. We're cutting transit routes because we don't have enough people. There's all kinds of things that unfortunately in addition to Halifax, that unless we hire a whole lot of people, we're not going to necessarily hit the timelines that we'd like to hit. So one should argue that we should be hiring a lot more police, a lot more fire, a lot more bus drivers. And it's a balancing act. As the mayor and I were just saying, one of the best things you can do for people on low wages is not perpetually raise their taxes. Because if we don't think raising property taxes put up people's rents and mortgages and tax bills, we're crazy. And we're talking five or six percent this year and they're already talking about nine percent next year. So it is a balancing act. I certainly support Halifax and I certainly will support adding some more people, but I don't think I'm quite comfortable with uh, seven yet. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Othet. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, Councillor Alfred actually raises some good points because I think if we if we look at those other plans, if we look at transit, we know that some of the positions that are being proposed here are looking at transit in relation to climate change, the integrated mobility plan, getting people out of cars and and walking and using alternative modes of of transportation, is part of climate change. The suburban plan is part of climate change. Um, you know, fire response and emergency is part of climate change. I think one of the examples that was used was what was happening in BC with the forest fires. We're not immune to forest fires here ourselves. And, you know, having a, a functional firefighting, effective firefighting force is, is part of our ability to respond to the challenges we're going to face from climate change. So, I mean, there's two, there's always two pieces to this, right? There's the proactive piece around retrofits and changing our energy sources and reducing our, our carbon footprint. The other is around resilience and adaptation. Ab that, oh my gosh, I'm losing it this afternoon. <laughs> adaptation. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we need, like, at the very least, we need to get our transit system working and functional and getting people on those buses because that's an important part of reducing our carbon footprint. So I mean, you know, it's like, it's like I, I woke up this morning and with um, everything everywhere all at once. That's how I felt after, after going through this bow adjustment list and, and all the business plans and reflecting back on the last three months is that everything's interconnected. Everything needs to be working towards supporting our goals around climate change and climate action. So I think it is a matter right now of prioritizing. And, um, you know, it's great to develop policy on knowing that we need to shift the modal share from single occupancy vehicles to alternative forms of transportation. But right now we're not even, our, our, our basic system isn't even functioning. So, you know, where do we put our priorities knowing that each move we make is actually advancing our climate action goals? So I would be very supportive of an alternative um, motion here that would look at um, uh, adding new positions to our climate action team, which I think is very important. We need to invest in it. We need to keep progressing. Um, but you know, I'm just wondering what other alternatives we can put on the table so that we can continue to prioritize some of the other pieces that are equally as important to meeting our climate goals. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thanks, Chair. 
so just hearing the conversation here. So you know, first off, I I would I, I do support the seven and and, and would hope that we could uh, vote for the seven. But I I do hear from concerns of colleagues that um, they're not sure if, if seven is the number, even though we've been told this is is what we need to to move forward. So what I'm wondering, um, Shannon, if we were to maybe look at four positions, I'm wondering what you'd prioritize if we were to say do do four positions and and how that could potentially impact your work. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Yeah, that's a good question. And they are prioritized in the briefing note. So I would prioritize the first four of the seven listed in the briefing note. Right. I just want you to, I, I just want you to say that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> 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 I, I, I knew that. So, so with that, I, I wonder if, if, if colleagues would support an amendment to, and I don't know the calculation, to support the first four uh, rather than the seven in the budget. Mr. Chair, through you to committee, so can amend an amendment, and so I would suggest after It'd some discussion, friendly. if the if the amendment on the floor fails, then perhaps somebody wishes to move the an alternative amendment of four. If it was friendly, if if every if unless there was anybody opposed to it and wanted to put the seven to the vote. <laughs> well, could is it would it be if in from the mover if is would it be friendly to change your seven to four? Is that a friendly change? If not, it's fine, then I'll, I'll bring it forward later. I know you want the seven, but I, I feel like it's gonna, it's gonna die here. I'm also wondering what the- so I'm not gonna force it on you, so if you don't want to, say no, please. <laughs> I'm also curious what the budget impact for this year would be. The 412 would be for all seven positions, but that's, uh, but the budget impact would be different if it is just the top four. Yeah. So, so I will let that I'll let that marinate, <laughs> and and then maybe come back and look at the the mover when when uh, it comes to close if they're interested in that being a friendly. So I'll just leave it there, and and if the mover decides that's friendly, I'll let them add that when they speak. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, Tyler, I'm wondering if we can. Uh, I assume you're working on that. Okay. And the reason for the delay is there's only one speaker on the list, oh. and it is Councillor Aust er, it is the Deputy Mayor to close, and it would be nice to have uh, the information from their calculations back before we do that. All right, uh, to the chair. Uh, the impact would be 287,600. <laughs> okay, so, so that 412,000 would be reduced to 287,600. So that is a reduction of give or take 140,000. Okay. Um, so if the mover and uh, Councillor Morse, the seconder, would be amenable to that, that would be the friendly amendment. So go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I think, again, I want to emphasize how we got to this moment of, like, I mean, I felt like back on my heels on this whole discussion, and it shouldn't have been that way because this should have been identified properly for us, given that we as council asked for a resource plan and the intent, had it not been for questioning during the initial presentation, the intent apparently from staff was to just not fulfill that resource plan and not say anything to us because it was not identified the way other pressures and items were. And that was a fundamental mistake, in my opinion, on the administration side. And so this whole discussion about this, like, well, geez, is you know, Councillor Austin asking for something extra here? No, I'm asking for us to fulfill our own plan that we asked for and identified and then was not going to even be told to us. We all make mistakes. 
and I th I'm confident that staff can do better on this next time around, given the amount of the importance of this issue. So that's how we got to this moment. Um, you know, and I had actually jotted down the same quote as Councillor Clary, don't tell me what you value, tell me what's in your budget. And what we're talking here is not even a point one on our tax rate. You know, it's not, you know, we have to, we have to watch the pennies as they say, but this is not a huge increase in our budget to do this, to do this properly. So, you know, it's not, it's barely a rounding error to actually provide the staff to do this well. And, you know, Councillor Outhit talked about lowest income people being affected the most and, you know, other plans that we haven't uh, completed properly. I don't think either of those are great arguments because the lowest income people when through climate change we know are the ones who are going to be most affected. They are the least able to actually pay their way, pay them, pay their way out of the crisis that is coming. In other places, it's people who, do, who can't afford air conditioning that die in their homes during heat waves. We fortunately have not had that yet, but that's the reality of it. The lowest income folks are the ones who are the most directly impacted by climate change, and that's part of our plan. That's, so, that's a key climate justice piece of it. You know, and because we've, we've not fulfilled things like urban forestry or gearing network, that's a reason to not actually fulfill this one either. I mean, shouldn't we instead take the lessons from other plans where we didn't commit resources and commit the resources to do this one properly, as well as other ones going forward? Like, you know, I don't know what to say to that. I am going to accept if Councillor Morris is amendable, I am going to accept this compromise. Well, I'm getting a head shake over there from Councillor Clare. I'm inclined to accept it because I can also read a room and, you know, I don't think I have the votes for this. Uh, I think it's probably six or seven that will vote for it. But I'll tell you, this compromise tastes like ashes in my mouth because this is the most important issue of our time and I feel like we are nickeling and diming it over a tiny amount of money. So, you know, uh, if Councillor Councillor Morris is amendable, I'll I compromise down to four. Councillor Morris, no pressure. I think we should I think we should go to the vote and and then bring an amendment after. So that would be voting on the the four hundred and twelve thousand dollars, all seven positions. Okay. Thank you very much. There are no speakers on the uh, no further speakers. Um, the original motion is on the screens in front of us. The vote has been called. Let's go for the vote. And that motion passes. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And I especially appreciate that we spent a significant amount of time talking about more than $20,000. <laughs> what? Um, we are back on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we are back on the main motion. As soon as we get a list up. Councillor Smith, go ahead. Uh, right. Um, all right, back to the train of thought after that. Uh, happy to, thank you colleagues. So I'm not gonna speak on specific items unless they get pulled off. So I'm gonna just two general questions. Um, one, uh, CIO, I wonder if you can uh, just provide a little bit more clarity because it's a good point, um, a little more clarity when you spoke, you mentioned the, the increase on the floor at the time we spoke was 5.6 um, and it lowers the tax rate by 4%. Uh, I just wonder if, if, if you can just clarify that a little bit more, um, but also uh, this might not be for you, but the cost share piece related to libraries, specifically Halifax North, I am wondering 
uh, what happens between now and for whatever reason, say miraculously, the, the, the other uh, levels of government come back to us, say in the summertime or so, um, with, with uh, an approval to make, uh, to, to, to access that funding, are we gonna be able to be nimble enough to, to start that work or do we have to wait until 25, 26 to, in order to, to move forward with the items that are not being recommended to be brought forward under cost sharing? My apologies, I was doing math. I got the first question, I missed the second one. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll restate the second one, but you can do the first one. I'll answer the first yeah. one. So at a tax burden increase of 5.6, the tax rate that is required to generate that is less than last year's tax rate by 4.5%. That was at 5.6. Right. And, it will be different now, depending upon you know what what emerges from the budget adjustment list. In in I only wanted you to kind of state that because obviously when we talk about tax rate, people can kind of get confused on what that means. But that's a very important piece, and I and I hope that when we do put out our release related to if you know if this passes, I hope it does pass. Just making sure that we, we clarify and, and provide folks with that information that this is actually the, the impact that it's going to have on the tax rate. And uh, I don't know if I need to restate the question because I, I see. With respect to the question, Philip Gansick, Director of Facility Design and Construction, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. With respect to the question about Halifax North, uh, yes, we do have a pending funding application through the uh, GICB program and uh, however we do have approved capital that is carryover for that would enable us to begin the design activity so right. I know that uh, it, I don't want to speak for Halifax libraries but I think that they plan some public consultation in understanding the needs for the facility and community desires but uh, we do have design money available to start going in mm -hmm. advance of the larger approval Right, so, so thank you for that. So for the other items that we're waiting for cost share uh, applications to go forward, if for whatever reason, you know, I'm just using theoretically, they, or, or not theoretically is not the right word, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, if we, they, we were to get it approved, say, tomorrow, how nimble could we be to start that work? So do we need to come back for 25, 26 budget in order to, to put that forward, but if or or once that funding is approved, would staff come back to council and said we got the funding cost share? Now we need X amount of money to in order to do those projects. Well, funding to for the design that would that HRM would have to provide as per the proposed budget, but as far as the design work, we could fairly quickly get right. that work started. So then the extra money would come in the 25-26 budget cycle rather than in the middle of Depending the on the agreement right. with respect to the funding from right. the other governments, yes. Okay. Um, so and, and the really the only reason I'm asking that, because I'm hoping that, because I know some of them uh, were, were at, at a stage where it was risk um, to not complete that, that work, but if, if I'm just hoping that if for whatever reason, say we get an answer back quickly, that we're able to be nimble and start some of the, 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 most, the most needed work. Um, so with that, understanding that we can be a little bit nimble depending on when that information comes forward, I think that's, that's all I needed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is weird coming back after a big debate like that. Okay, I'd like to uh, discuss removing the uh, parking charges on Saturday, which would be BNO22A. Okay. Discuss. If, uh, I can hand you wording for a motion. Put a motion on the floor. And I will read the motion as Ian is trying to help me be prepared. If we didn't get the language, I would have written it. Okay. There it is. Thank you. I move that a motion, the motion be amended to increase to, to decrease. Is that language right? We're taking out a uh, revenue gain. 
So to increase the proposed 2023-24 operating budget as set out in recommendation one by removing item five, briefing no note BNO22A, parking charges, Saturday parking. Seconded by, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor uh Let's go with that. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly been uh, flooded with uh, concerns from both the uh, business associations in Dartmouth and Halifax, uh, all, you know, all the ones that have uh, parking uh, that is metered or rather pay stationed. And we certainly heard from a lot of small businesses. And, and I'll say again, I, I put this on in the first place, uh, you know, Almost every city in the country bigger than us charges on Saturday in the evening, and it's normal, but we are coming out of COVID, and there are concerns about that. I would also say I've heard some arguments around this, which I think may come, come up, depending on how many councillors want to argue about this, that, that this is uh, almost like a carbon tax or a green tax, but the thing is, I think the parking is still going to be full. We don't have any evidence this is going to reduce driving. It's just going to increase cost on the weekend, which is yeah. perhaps something we should do. I'm not against it, but I think it's something we should revisit after uh, having time to consult with and discuss with uh, uh, the business uh, community in downtown. Uh, you know, I think there's probably going to be a motion also to talk about removing the extended week uh, week week day parking, which I think would require uh, substantial investment in signs and stuff, Sam was telling me. I'm not, I, I'm prepared to talk about both of those. I think the increase in pay station hourly rates needs to stay, which was item nine. So I'm not gonna move that, because I think that that's appropriate. Uh, we want the metered parking to be, that's the premium parking, right? That's the good stuff. You get a spot in front of the restaurant you're going to, you pay for that. You should pay less when you're paying off street or farther away. So uh, I would ask council to support this. I know it's going against where we've been going, trying to, to, to add more to the budget, but I think it's a bit premature for the business community uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, when we discussed this before, I voted to increase, to, to, I, I, I voted to uh, charge for the parking on Saturday. I voted against uh, increasing to changing the weekday parking, and that was still my preference. That's what I think is the bigger help to restaurants. I'm not sure what you were referencing with Councillor Austin uh, about signs and things like that. Um, but we need to do something to support the small businesses. Yeah, so, you know, we have a lot of, I'm thinking of the restaurant industry in particular, who have had the crap kicked out of them over the last couple of years. So if you're a restaurant in particular, you know, you've, you've dealt with over, over exactly the last three years. First of all, you're closed. Then you've got changing hours that you can be open. And then you have changing capacities that you can be open and you have to monitor that and you're, you can be 50% or 75% back to 50%. It's a lot of work. Uh, you have people outside your restaurant complaining that you're looking for a vaccine uh, identification before you let them in. They're blaming you for that. You've got people out protesting. You finally kind of come through some of that and you can't get staff anymore. They've all gone on to other uh, industries. Uh, and now the latest thing a lot of them are gonna be facing is they have to repay their SIBA loans this year, their business loans that came during COVID, which had, I think had a partly forgivable part of it, but the extension I think was moved from the end of last year to the end of this year. It has been one thing after another for the restaurant industry. We, we should tip our hat to the people who've been in the restaurant industry over the last number of years and have managed to survive. We've seen some closures of restaurants in the last little while, I think partly because they're saying, you know what, people seem to think that now that we're coming out of COVID, we're good. We're not, they're not good. <laughs> you know, they're having a, a heck of a hard time. People aren't in a lot of the business districts during the day, so the lunch restaurant business is gone. Some of them are busy at night, uh, some of them aren't. Uh, but they do have these loans they have to look at repaying, um, the escalating cost of their supplies, and every time they raise their food prices, somebody notices and complains. It's been a tough industry, and we should say thank you to those who are in the restaurant business. Thank you for being open. Thank you for staying there for us. Thank you for switching to takeout during COVID. We appreciate the fact that you're open now, and um, you know we, we, uh, we want you to know we appreciate that. So if you can afford to, when you go to a restaurant, uh, give a nice tip to the folks uh, who are, are in there. Uh, but certainly say thanks to the proprietors as well. You know, we're, we're reducing our, um, our Grand Parade presence this year, the Grand Oasis. We're keeping some, which I'm glad about. 
Um, but that had been a big impact. Uh, you know, store owners and restaurant owners told me how much they liked that, how much it meant to their uh, business. So, you know, we're reducing that. So I think we have to look at the parking piece. And I think we have to say, at least for now, we have to uh, uh, be mindful of uh, retailers, um, cultural industries, uh, and certainly restaurants who have been uh, struggling. Uh, even as we come out of COVID, uh, they're still feeling the remnants of that. And um, so I, I have no problem supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I too am a big supporter of small businesses in our in our communities in our downtown. Um, you know, I was just reading the staff report here, and um, it said that uh, staff met with uh, the bid leaders on February 27th to discuss the proposal and their concerns, and that there seemed to be less appetite for extending weekday parking beyond 6 p.m. than consideration for Saturday parking. You know, parking is one of those things that it's not always obvious what works best, right? So, I mean, there's lots of studies out there with parking and, and charging for parking. You know, the main thing you want to see with parking is turnover and availability of parking. Um, you know, one of the things I hear from my constituents isn't that they have to pay for parking so much as that there isn't any parking. There isn't that convenient parking. And I know we've had this discussion that there's underground parking here and there. I, I went to underground parking the other day for two hours and it cost me $15. <laughs> I'm like, not doing that again. Um, so, you know, our on-street parking does support our small businesses, even if you have to pay for parking, because it encourages turnovers. And on Saturdays, I think if you go downtown on a Saturday, um, you know, for those of us that don't have a weekend bus service and have to take our cars, um, it is very, very hard to find, to find an on-street parking spot because people are parking there um, all day long. So, you know, I think the Brookings Institute has done a lot of studies on parking and, and what's best for supporting small businesses and enabling people to come downtown and have that great experience in our city. And so, you know, my, my inclination here was to actually remove um, the other one from the bell, the, uh, the extending, extending the weekend parking. Um, because in the staff note, it also suggests that um, when this was originally made and calculated, we didn't consider signage and implementation and it changes to the administrative AO. And that if we um, change, if we, if we remove the extended parking, um, this is something that we could implement a lot more easy. We wouldn't have to change the signage. Um, we could just put uh, stickers on the signs and that would save us, you know, save us costs in implementing something. So, um, you know, I, 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 I do think this is worthy of another debate. That's a part of the reason why through this process we put things on the budget adjustment list, not because we, you know, we, you know, we do have the debate at the time when we put it on the list, but often it requires us to go and get more information and do some more consultation and have it back, come back for consideration. Um, uh, so, you know, my, I'm, in, I'm inclined um, to move uh, item number, this is so small here, I can't. We, we are on an eight. amendment. Well, I know we're not there yet. I know, I'm just saying what my intent is. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm on it. Thank you, Mr. Mancini. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that would be, that'd be my inclination, not to, um, not to support this one, but to support, uh, not support number, now you've messed me up and I can't read, can't read these little numbers again. Not to support number five, but to move number, move number six. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, I did have one question for staff, because as I understand, there's some technical challenges here if we were to do both evening and the Saturday parking in terms of just implementing and replacing basically every single parking sign <laughs> out there that uh, wasn't quite uh, put together at the beginning. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor, sorry, Deputy Mayor, Victoria Horn, uh, Director of Parking Services. So yes, that's correct, Councillor. So in briefing note 22B, you will note that staff has highlighted that in the event that Council wishes to implement both Saturday parking and extended evening weekday parking, we would require new signs in zones B, C, and H. And that's because Presently, if we go with weekend parking, which is currently on the floor for debate, that will just require the implementation of a sticker because parking right now is charged from eight to six. However, if council does wish to have a discrepancy in time of eight to eight on weekdays and then eight to six on Saturdays because staff would not recommend charging till 8 p.m. on Saturdays, uh, then we would require a new set of signs on top of, which is calculated. So we estimate that that will take a, roughly $40,000 away from potential revenue in year one as well as the just the implementation piece because once you have both changes together it's no longer stickerable in terms of Correct. fixing it okay yes. uh, so my inkling uh, is actually similar to Councillor Cuddles um, the weekday evening parking was one that I was not in favor of I think it was the wrong the wrong fit for my particular community in terms of what's going on there the Saturday one I'm kind of on the fence um, it is uh, something that is standard in cities our size, pretty much as the report illustrates, if you look across the country. Um, it's not in Atlanta, Canada. We'd be the first ones in Atlanta, Canada to do it, but like if you go across the country, any most cities, they do charge on a Saturday because there is the demand for it. Um, so, I mean, if we were gonna do one of these, my inkling is that we should do the Saturday and not do the evening, but I would be okay if we pass on the Saturday for this year and maybe revisit next year. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, you know, a lot uh, has already been said on this. Most major cities doing this. I, I, I think, you know, the struggle of getting out of the pandemic, uh, we're still there. We've, we're in a much better place than we were last year, a much better place than the year before. Uh, I don't want to put, put any more obstacles in the way of our small businesses, and our particular restaurants and our pubs, and I just think the timing's not right. I think we should be revisiting this, and we should be revisiting this again next year and see where we are. And I would, you know, depending on how we're doing with the downtown, uh, might consider it. You know, the piece that's missing here, in the, in, there is lots of parking. It doesn't have to be fifteen dollars to park. I mean, there are affordable parking underground. I think uh, our bids in the downtown, uh, you know, downtown Halifax, uh, Spring Garden Road, need to do a better job of uh, promoting their members that have parking. And I'm hoping after this debate today and discussion today, they'll step up and do a campaign so the folks that are coming from outside of the downtown core understand there is parking. So uh, lots of parking. You park underground. I just don't think now's the time to, to be putting uh, these obstacles in place. So I'll be supporting the motion on the floor. And if another one comes forward, I'll be supporting that one also. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I am opposed to the motion that's on the floor. I supported it going into the budget adjustment list uh, for the uh, additional revenue. So not all restaurants are doing poorly. Uh, I know many restaurants that are actually doing better now than they were in 2019. Every business has to adapt to their circumstances. And I know businesses that really did well during the pandemic. As the mayor mentioned, lots of folks pivoted to takeout. Uh, the Wasabi House on Quinpool Road, only just in the last couple of months, went back to uh, in, uh, uh, in room dining. They were takeout right up until recently because they were doing gangbusters uh, in terms of sales. Uh, and so we did during the lockdowns, uh, during COVID, in the recovery, we did a ton for small business, especially restaurants downtown. I think of all of the uh, patios, the encroachment fees that we took away, uh, setting up spaces for them in my own district, uh, working with Armview so they could have a portion of uh, the Rotary Park uh, to set up uh, the patio, uh, which has done amazing over the last few years. And so, you know, we can't paint everyone with the same brush and say, oh, well, a few businesses told us they're not doing well, so let's not charge for parking, because uh, next year, they will say the same thing. 
So if you're looking just for them to say, well, is it okay for us to charge your customers parking? Parking is one of these weird things, and I don't know how many people are shoopistas here, uh, but if you read Donald Shoop or Graham Curry or any of the folks uh, who have talked about parking, and it, I, pr I point you specifically to Professor Donald Shoop's book. He teaches at UCLA, he wrote a book a number of years ago called The High Cost of Free Parking. And if you're not into reading, uh, go to the War on Cars podcast. It's episode 98, I think. Listen to his interview. Um, we have been external, we, all levels of government, have been externalizing the costs of car ownership since essentially the, the motor carriage's uh, inception. And I'm not really sure, like we just had a debate about climate change. And it's like, okay, we believe in climate change. We're gonna do these things. But don't make car ownership more expensive. That's actually one of the tools that we have at our disposal to take climate action. Anyway, so um, obviously, if you think about you know, this thing all the way through and all of the parts that it touches on, you should want to charge for that spot. If you read through the briefing note, read through Donald Shoup's book, read through what Victoria's written, it costs the municipality money to maintain those spots. It only seems fair that we recover that. Otherwise, all the other residents, especially those who aren't driving, are subsidizing the cost of that. We really should, in many of these cases, move to a user pay. If you're destroying the climate, you should pay for that. That's the whole point of a carbon tax and a price on carbon. This is not a carbon tax, but it's one tool that we have at the municipal level that actually does tremendously help mitigate the impacts and reduce overall transportation uh, in, in non-sustainable ways and hopefully move people to more sustainable forms. Anyway, so I will vote against the motion that's on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would support the motion for, for the Saturday parking, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, there have been a lot of weak and shoppers that don't go downtown to shop. And if they do, and they don't wanna take their car, right now they're looking at extended waits for transit, not only because of a shortage of buses, but also due to the um, weekend hours. So if you're considering it, you have those two options. And if you are in a situation where you can't or won't drive downtown, that those are the options you have. And I think for seniors and those with mobility issues, it's kind of limiting their choices. So if you don't wanna spend the time waiting for a bus or whatever the case may be, uh, your options are very limited. And we're always talking about getting back, getting people back into the downtown area, but then how can we get them all back if we're only saying, well, if you come, on a Saturday, you know, you you have to, I'm sorry, you'll have to pay, but let's get them back first and then look at it next year. I, I still think that COVID, even though some restaurants, as I said, are doing better, there are some that are still struggling to get back to where they were, and there are still people that are the neglect coming downtown because of what's happened with COVID. They're still a little, you know, uh, reserved. So I think we should wait the year, see what's happened, and maybe revisit it next year, next budget, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Go ahead, Councillor Outhit. Thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thanks for putting this on. Um, last time I spoke against both of these, and I said that we have a, a perception problem that we're dealing with downtown, and several people around the table say, well, so be it. People don't come from Bedford and Sackville and stay there, the businesses don't need them which I don't think that's how the businesses feel. I also thought that the bids would have been consulted sooner because normally when we make parking changes, and in fairness, we do very good consultation and very good communication and response, but I think they should have been spoken with sooner. Sean is right, though, that we sh the, the, the bids will probably always be opposed to any increase in parking, and, and I understand that. So we have to make decisions based on what we, we think is right. And you know, Sean is also right, Councillor Cleary, that if, we had the situation, I, I'd, have, I'd have all kinds of fees going into downtown if we had rail, BRT, bus ferries from several more locations, 24 seven bus service. I think there's a time when you have to have carrot and stick. 
but unfortunately we don't have the carrot. So there'll be a time for the stick. And I probably would support that. Last night we went to dinner at Amano with some friends from out of town. It was lovely. It cost me $6 to park on the waterfront. I fed the machine there and it rejected my credit card initially, but that's okay. I, uh, I did get it to take it. And uh, $6 for an evening to have a, a dinner I thought was, was, was pretty reasonable. If there had been a train or a ferry waiting for me or a BRT, maybe I would have jumped on it. And I hope we will get to that stage. And no, I didn't drink because I was driving. I had a nice sparkling water. But uh, I might have had a glass of wine or a beer if I had been on ferry. So anyway, I think, I hope we learned from this to communicate a little better. I hope that we will keep in mind that these businesses do want people to come other than just the walking distance around them. And we do have to deal with, as Tony said, I think the bids should be doing a campaign to say, you know, I was at found a spot for six bucks last night downtown. I think that's a pretty good deal, you know, and there was all kinds of empty spaces all around them. Why don't we get that word out and try to address that perception? And in the meantime, trying to include, include uh, um, improved uh, transit the way we are, because I've had a lot of people say to me, my God, it'll be fun to get on the waterfront. Go down to the Bedford waterfront, there you tech waterfront, Shannon Park, whatever down the roads, jump on a ferry, go downtown, have a meal, go to a play, go to a game, whatever, and jump on that and come back home. That's the vision, folks. And if we get that implemented someday, then maybe we will be in a situation where we can charge road tolls or higher parking, et cetera, et cetera, because of course the car is, is not our future. We know that. Anyway, thank you, and I will be supporting this. Thank you very much, Councillor Outhit. There are no further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? Question's been called. Go ahead, Ian. And that motion fails. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. We are back on the main motion. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, go ahead. My God. So now we don't listen to the All right. Okay. All right. Uh, just a couple of questions for Jerry. First of all, Chatting with Councillor Hensby, the Eastern Shore Lifestyle Centre, we have money for that, right? We have approved that, it's put aside, it's in a fund somewhere. Whenever we spend it, we spend it, but there is, I think, $3 million put aside for that, correct? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, the uh, Lifestyle Centre is funded, I believe. What was put into the bow was to uh, move the funding uh, back a year. Uh, staff didn't recommend that, obviously. This, yeah. There's still due dil diligence going on this year, so yeah. nothing would happen construction-wise. Yeah, okay, no, that's good. Uh, we were the first order of government, Councillor Hensby, to commit to this program. <laughs> I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did uh, in a different budget year. That's great. Uh, there's, it's moved, the location has moved, but it's uh, still a very important uh, project. Uh, second question is for perhaps Kathy, our CAO, and that is, We've adjusted the date of the permit fee increase. So, you know, I, I, uh, we support increasing permit fees. Um, and I think most people in the development industry understand that our fees are, are low. We've moved the, in, the um, inaugural date of starting it from April 1st to June 1st. We're confident that that'll be enough for people who have outstanding bids and things like that that might be affected by that. Confident because uh, we've been talking about the permit fee increase for a while now, and uh, most bids that would have been put forward or are being put forward now would include an allowance for that permit fee increase. And generally, bids aren't held for more than 90 days. So, if we're making the change effective June 1st, then that's more than enough time for the increase to be reflected. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Now, having said that, and just coming off that uh, interesting uh, discussion we had, I'm going to move the other one on the parking. Where is it? Uh, the extended. Where is it? Mr. Mayor, it's on your screen. 
I move that the motion be amended to increase the proposed 2324 as set out in recommendation one by removing item six uh, by the full amount of $213,000. Sorry, seconded by who? I, by Councillor Outhead. Thank you very much. I'm going to try my luck again. Uh, and so um, I thought the other one would pass. It didn't. I get that. Um, uh, but it was, as I indicated when I spoke to it, my, this was always the one I felt more strongly about, although I supported the other one as well. I think it will make a difference for small business in, in, uh, in the key areas of our city, and uh, so I'm going to test council on that one. Thank you. Question. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this one is the one that I, like the mayor um, from the get-go, this is the one that I think was the wrong fit, especially for the restaurant um, scene. I know in downtown Dartmouth, um, this is this is the one that I, I'm more worried about, so this one I will most happily support. Thank you. Did you support that? I did not. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for putting that on the floor. Um, if you hadn't done it, I was about to do it. Um, so it is something I support. I think it is the right move, and I, I, it fits with not only the feedback that we got, also with the strategy from our staff around signage, and um, you know, I, I will be supporting this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I will also support this, and not only just about restaurants though. We have a lot of staff that do shift work. We've got a lot of healthcare professionals that are working odd shifts, that kind of stuff. So especially when you think about in the hospital areas, right, we've got a lot of shift workers, healthcare workers there. And so this would be an added deterrent for them. So I would support the motion of removal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, we have no further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? Questions been called. Ian? Thank you. Thank you, and that passes, and there's no question that stickers will be uh, cheaper than bilingual stop signs. We are back on the main motion. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuttle. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to Councillor Hensby. Take the bus. Um, Mr. Chairman, I was just want to clarify in regards to the points that the mayor raised about the Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center. All we've done was move ahead the proposed construction time instead of being off for three years is going to be moved ahead a year. Instead of 24, 25, 25, 26, as we're proposing now, the original plan was 25, 26, 26, 27. And my concern about that was our funding for the federal government has to be by a certain date. And I think that we all know construction takes longer, especially in rural areas. It's never going to be on time. And if we push it to the last minute, we're going to miss out on some of our funding opportunities. So that's why I moved it ahead by year. This year, we're still doing the due diligence and the groundwork. We're around the atrium fire station where the new location is going to be. It's just that we just have to get that, plus the consultant and the architect engaged this year to get all the plans and blueprints ready to go to tender for next year, which will be part of the budget for next year's discussion for 24-25. Is that not correct? Philip DeGanzik, Director of Construction, Design and Construction. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. I'm not sure I caught the question, but I did uh, I did want to respond to your, your point about the agreement with the provincial and federal government with respect to the funding. We've been, we've been in touch with the, uh, with the federal and provincial, our provincial government who was administering that funding program uh, throughout the uh, site selection and all of the work that we've been do doing to prepare this project. And they are un understanding that we are currently on a plan and a course to defer this and we have until 2028 by that agreement to complete the work. Until I see an assigned amended document, we still have until 27, according to the assigned official document we have for the funding. Until I see an amended signed version, I don't want to change the timelines. I don't think we can afford to. The community, this, this funding has been announced over five years ago. And here Councilor we're still Hensby, in the I'm, planning stages. Do, do you mind if I ask which item on the budget adjustment list this relates to? It's not on the adjustment list, but I think there was some discussion of the, of, of the briefing point about it being uh, 
Uh, brief and point who's on here, number 73. And it's also on the back page here, I think uh, the Sheet Harbor Lifestyle Center. There's no numbers there, but I just want to make sure that the timeline is still there. Number 38 in the list. On the Yeah. It has, it has no tax implication or budget implication this year because we still got to do the due diligence work, on-site work. We have the money already approved in previous budgets for that. We just need to get the architect engaged and get on with the design work. Like I said, it's been over five years since it's been formally announced and funding confirmed. Now time's running out on that money if we don't move it. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. The, yes, you're correct. We do have uh, carryover funding for to begin the design work and the due diligence associated with the new site selection, and that work is underway. We are currently, uh, the geotechnical has been completed, and we are awaiting the report on that site selection. Uh, the design work, the plan is to proceed with that work. We do have the funding to continue with, or to, be, to initiate that design work. The other reality is we have to uh, determine whether the site is going to be large enough to accommodate everything that we want to locate in that facility. So there's a fair amount of due diligence required, uh, community consultation and engagement to understand what the needs are for the facility, the size of the building footprint and so on, how best to fit that. All that can happen this year. I understand that for this year, for 23-24, but still we need to move ahead with the tender documents for 24, 25, 25, 26. Putting off to 27, I think we're going to jeopardize our, our funding eligibility. With respect to your previous comment about the agreement, I think the agreement states that we, the end of the agreement is 2028 and the end of the project timeline was 2027. And we've, we've approached the province and been in discussion with them to amend that timeline. As long as it meets the agreement end date, we are okay with respect to that construction timeline. Well, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, like I said, it still does not have any tax implication for this particular year. I'm just hoping that, you know, if we carry this debate next year, that timeline, we got to postponing it and deferring it is not going to be helpful. So I just want to keep it as it is on, on the schedule. We, we, we moved it to for, for 24, 25, 25, 26. So I don't think we need a motion. I just need, you know, I just... Uh, it doesn't inf implicate our tax at this particular time, so. You, you are a couple of minutes over time. Yep. <laughs> anyway, just want to confirm that, sir. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to discuss the um, briefing note 41, the Grand Oasis reduction, the add back in of the $200,000. The, according to the updated briefing note, um, it says that the, you know, the regular events that we have would still go on. It's just the enhancements uh, that would change. And I'm, I'm struggling to understand why we might want to add $200,000 back into this for an enhanced events as opposed, because it sounds like within the budget, um, it's already there. So I'm just wondering if there's a question that could be answered from Parks. I didn't prepare a motion to remove it because I wanted to understand it a little bit better. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Rosalind Smith, Director of Regional Recreation Services. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor. So the last time we were here during Parks and Rec debate, there was some discussion around events, um, and we were asked to come back with some options. So the 200,000 just means that we would do the Dartmouth Sunshine Series on the Dartmouth side, and some enhancement in Halifax and Grand Parade. No enhancement to all the regular um, uh, events. They will happen regardless. So the, the Sunshine Series and the Grand Oasis, they were COVID uh, responses. That's correct. Are they not? That's correct. And so now that we're out of COVID, I'm just wondering if we still need to add 200,000 into that. So um, maybe I'll see what happens in the rest of the conversation and come back. And sorry if I may add, um, there's also an in-camera briefing note um, so that if that 200,000 is removed, that opportunity is gone. Thank you. I'll go back and revisit that. I appreciate it. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, don't leave yet. I, I have another question too, because I, I had um, had that same question, Councillor Daigle-Gammon, just, just on that. So in, in the briefing note, um, it said, if reduced, the remaining 200,000 would be redirected to support other civic events. So um, in, in the budget, there's already um, <coughs> been allocated the, the regular events that, that HRM puts on for the residents for these days. Um, so the, the 200,000, if is added back into the budget, would go to support other civic events, so not I didn't understand what the other civic events meant. The 200,000 um, that we noted in the briefing note would be specifically seven weekends of program. So basically the Dartmouth Sunshine Series on the Dartmouth side. And in Halifax, after NAG, we would do three weeks of events. So that's what the 200,000 would cover. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, thank you. Go ahead, Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just to clarify, there are, there are two different $200,000 referenced, and one is that there was $200,000 that was moved from the events budget, um, that was in the events budget pre-COVID that was reallocated to the uh, Grand Oasis and the, and the Dartmouth Sunshine Series, and that would be moved back into the regular programming. That's not on the table. Here, this is just part of our part of our built-in part of our budget. The two hundred thousand additional would be what we would need in order to deliver that reduced Dartmouth Sunshine Grand Oasis uh, Grand Parade offering. I don't know if that helped. Okay, <laughs> so that would be so, so someone would need to add that back. The two hundred thousand that's in front of you is what we would need in order to program the Dartmouth Sunshine Series and some programming at Grand Parade. So the, that's what's in front of you is, is a request or is, a, is what we could do with $200,000 in order to offer those two sort of add-ons to the regular civic events programming. Okay, and so just, just for clarification, so on the briefing note it says 200000 to 600000 but on the BAL list it says 600000 That 200000 isn't referenced here. So how... That 200,000 is item 28. Oh, it's down below? What number? 28. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see 600 and then we're yep. back. Yep, totally missed that. Okay. So we got the, there it is, yeah. So we're All right. 600, Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, fortuitous timing where I happen to be on the list, um, you know, in the, you know, perhaps heading off a motion. Um, this is the, you know, this is the concert series that has taken place in Halifax and Dartmouth, and it was expanded greatly um, as part of uh, the COVID initiatives and bouncing back. But in Dartmouth, um, there always had been a concert. It was the Canada Day concert, um, which, frankly had some challenges at times as well. It was a, it was a big concert, right? It wasn't like these weekend, more community focused things um, that were taking place at Ferry Terminal Park. But there'd always been a concert in Dartmouth and then COVID hit and then Canada Day was getting rethought. And so that evolved into the Summer Sunshine series uh, as part of this. And so there's a real difference between these two concert series, the one in Grand Parade, which was clearly a new, brand new COVID, COVID recovery type thing and what was going on in Dartmouth. The Dartmouth one was packaged with and be, was enhanced as part of a COVID thing, but it was a very different, it was a very different event because there always had been one there. So if we don't add this $200,000 back, then basically it is actually a taking away of a long-standing musical concert that had occurred in Dartmouth for, I, geez, I don't know I, uh, how far back. Yeah, since since we were kids, pretty much uh, since Canada Day concerts, right at Alderney, it's it's a long, it's been long standing. The other piece of it is uh, we've been having, you know, as as many places have, um, some additional challenges in the downtown, um, you know, conflicts between uh, marginalized folks. Um, and, you know, the concert series has actually been a wonderful public safety security thing because it is, it invites people into the space and spaces that are full of people, 
tend to be safer spaces. And so it's really, it's helped greatly with that, which has been an extra benefit, but at its core, there was always a concert in Dartmouth, and if we don't do this 200, then there suddenly, it hits a little differently, because Dartmouth doesn't have Jazz Fest or Pride or any of these other things, right? This is one of the, this was one of the things that anchors um, the summer in downtown Dartmouth. Um, I've managed to talk through two minutes there on something that's not even on the floor. Um, I do have a question switching gears, um, and apologies if I've missed it somewhere, but on the capital items to be added back in, the Bedford Fire Station, uh, Mill Cove Library, I'm in, support of, I'm in support of them, but it appears that there's two options to do it, capital from operating and debt option, like they're both kind of highlighted, and I'm wondering, what, what does it, where do things stand right now um, in terms of that? Like if we vote on this motion right now, is it the debt option that is actually, is the, is the default? Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> yes, staff would recommend that that would be a debt el eligible funded project and it would not have an impact to the uh, tax rate for this year. Okay, uh, I've used my time. I'll come back because I want to dig into that a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. So I'm just I'm looking for clarification uh, because now we're picking these off individually. I thought we all of these things don't need to be moved. I thought we, these these were as they were unless we decided we didn't like one of them. Isn't that correct? So we don't have to move like. Okay, so what are we doing then? Like, uh, because we've been picking these off little bits and pieces, and it seems to me that um, every year we have a better way of doing this, and it turns out worse. Uh, so um, that's okay. Anyway, on the floor, since we've been talking about debt, um, I was going to say this for next week because I love this sort of stuff, but does anybody know what every citizen in Canada owes on the national debt? including every citizen in HRM, $34,700. Every citizen of Nova Scotia on the provincial debt owns, owes $16,476. So federally, we all owe 347. It's not due today, but it's gonna be due. Every citizen provincially owes 16,476. Each household in HRM, right, Jerry? Each household owes $1,323 municipally. We have 60% of the infrastructure Okay, but we have just a fraction of the debt load. Now, that's the way it should be. We don't, we don't debt finance except on capital projects, but it's not bad. Um, and then the projections are that those costs federally and provincially, those debt loads are gonna go up over the next couple of years uh, as well. Uh, I wouldn't wanna support, uh, just to maybe head this off, I wouldn't, I think that $200,000 is a very, for the uh, Grand Oasis and for the Dartmouth Sunshine Series, I think that's a great investment. We're cutting it from 600, we're cutting 600, we're putting 200, to me that's, that's awesome. And yeah, Dartmouth has had concerts for years. I remember when, I don't know, it was Rihanna or Beyonce or, Johnny Cash, one of those three similar artists, uh, performed uh, on the uh, on the waterfront, um, and I, I think that's uh, yeah that's what, anyway. So um, I don't know where, wherever we are in the process, uh, we're, we're close to wrapping up. I think and we don't have to go through them one by one. We're assuming they're in the budget adjustment list. That took us at 5.6. We're up to 5.8 ish. The weekend parking failed, the nighttime parking thing, so that, will, uh, that won't have an appreciable difference on the rate, 200 and some thousand dollars. So thank you very much, Chair. Great to be thank here with you, all thank of you. Thank you, for, uh, Mr. Mayor. In answer to your question of where are we on the list, we're just about done. The list was empty before you started speaking. Um, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chair. I'm just looking at our clerk. Did you get my email? Okay. Um, so whatever the wording is, uh, I move that uh, item number 19, uh, as described in BN uh, briefing note 13, uh, the R additional RCMP regular member positions, which would reduce the 23-24 budget by 746,200. Can I get a Do seconder? we have a seconder for that motion? People are having conversations. Everyone's Seconded like, by Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. <laughs> Whatever he said, okay. Um, so, the, the mayor talked about our ability to save money, and this would actually help us, I think, in my calculations, bring us back from 5.8 to 5.7. Uh, 
Um, What's the motion up there? The motion is on our screen. Yeah, it's item 19 on the balance, or now you got me saying it, the budget adjustment list. The balance budget adjustment list list. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, isn't police and, and RCMP on a different motion? Is that my only question? Sort of. No, the RCMP contract is, is separate from the HRP budget in terms of, and it is listed on the BAL recommendations under item 19, Mayor. Okay, it just uh, says briefing note 13. Police slash Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Budget and business plan under 6.2. That's what I was asking. About. I don't think there's any magic mayor. It's it's on the ballot list. The question is now been put forward as to whether council wants to leave it on the ballot list. The the the, the to answer the mayor's question, I think is it, it's on the budget adjustment list. If we pass the budget adjustment list as it's been moved, then that automatically is baked in when we go to talk about the next motion, which is on HRP and police. Right, all right, so I'm not sure what my time is or when it starts. All right. Uh, go ahead, let's give you five minutes, Councillor Cleary. I won't need that many. Um, so I just, uh, while the mayor was speaking, had a quick little conversation with our CFO, and actually, I, correction, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry, that this would bring the, uh, the tax rate, or sorry, not tax rate, tax bill increase, the average, to 5.6, okay. So actually, we go down quite a substantial amount of money because that rounding, we, we just get under the, uh, we should have a table that shows this, you know, as we're, as we're moving up and down where we are. Um, so this would take us down to 5.6. I, I, was, I was against this when we were doing it for a number of reasons. A, um, the HRP also came to us and said we need X number of officers. Uh, in addition, they want the nurse, they want the psychologist. I think there's some confusion around the psychologist. Several, several people said, you know, we want fire to use these two and other uh, things. It's not that kind of psychologist. You're not, you know, they're not putting you in a room and giving you Rorschach tests and sitting on a couch and smoking a pipe while you tell them their problems. That's not the kind of psychologist they're employing. Uh, it's to be in the meetings and the briefings and to help develop policy and work with staff and do that kind of stuff. So it's not like a counseling psychologist. Uh, but anyway, our HRP asked for a bunch of officers and we said no to all of them. Uh, so I was curious when RCMP said, well, we want some more officers, and we said yes. Well, the majority of council said yes. So it's kind of like, well, wait a second. So not only do I think we need to hold off on hiring uh, police officers until we have the uh, detasking, the, you know, all the different terminology we use to remove some things from police, and we are gonna be speaking about that when you look at the other items on here that don't have a budgetary implication right now, but moving stuff out of HRP to civilianized uh, kind of uh, delivery. And so it, it just, I don't get the concept or the logic that we would say, yeah, sure, let's hire a bunch more RCMP officers. And so I think, based on what I've seen, uh, we may be tight, but They've been policing their areas. HRP has been policing its areas. They're doing the job, and I can't support uh, adding more of them. Uh, and in fact, if we if we do add them in, I have to vote against the overall budget. I just that's my personal philosophy, because I can't support a budget that adds more police officers until we figure out what we're doing with policing services and public safety in HRM. Because uh, that was the sort of rationale for our HRP when we said we're not going to add any more HRP officers. So anyway, I'm putting this back out there. Uh, hope, hopefully, uh, we'll remove this uh, and we'll move on from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, CAO. Hello. Um, I just wanted to explain um, 
a, a difference in terms of HRP versus RCMP and also give you an update on why um, the concern with respect to timing of, of changes going on with respect to policing and community safety don't really impact the ask for these positions from the RCMP. Chief Superintendent Christie is here to answer questions also. With respect to the RP, HRP uh, positions that were presented in the budget and business plan as, as overs that didn't get approved and get to the budget adjustment list, you may recall part of the discussion related to uh, a human resource analysis also that we had presented and there was an in-camera discussion and there was a lot of uh, subsequent discussion publicly at the Board of Police Commissioners on the work that HR, HRP and the union are going to be doing together around initiatives like return to work, absenteeism, um, psychological health and safety. So we need to see how many of the existing complement we can actually get back into the workforce um, actively at HRP before we have confidence around what is the need for additional HRP. Um, so that's that, that piece, that HR piece is going. The second comment is that the uh, draft policing study is now in hand. It's scheduled to come to council, I think, in camera. April 25th, if that is a council date. It's the last council meeting in April that you'll be receiving that. Not seeing anything that conflicts with this uh, request from RCMP for staffing, which is largely driven by growth. Also not seeing anything in the setup of the new community safety department that uh, takes away from the need that's been expressed by the RCMP. Thank you, CAO. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I won't be supporting this motion. I fully support the uh, ask from our RCMP. I think that um, it's really important that we remind everyone here in Council that growth is here. Growth will be continue to be here. Our RCMP and our more rural areas have a different, uh, have to have a different approach and, and um, than the urban and some of the suburban areas. They have not had an increase in a complement since 2012, at which time they had six. It's still low uh, compared to other jurisdictions for the geography that they're serving. Um, we have uh, been thrust forward by our provincial partners on planning, large-scale planning that is about to happen, and it <coughs> will be in those areas. Much of it is going to be in those areas. Um, our, uh, and the CAO spoke very uh, um, well around the very real need, both in HRP and, and in um, the RCMP. Almost every conversation, every opportunity to have a discussion around RCMP with members, rank and file members, um, our chiefs and their teams, their administrative teams, is around the, um, the, the, the health and the wellness of our members. They are, we ha I, I believe very strongly that there, is, and there is a narrative across the country that we are not unique here in Nova Scotia, we're not unique here in Halifax, that our forces are, are, are uh, um, uh, presenting uh, like other forces and frontline service personnel. Um, the impact of the kinds of service delivery and the kinds of incidents that they're being asked to serve um, that has really exponentially grown with uh, mental health and addictions and, and housing and homelessness, layers of things that we know, and we've all said here in our, our chamber, uh, we have a homelessness strategy, we have a safety, uh, public safety strategy now, we have all, we have reports now that are, that are, that have good ideas in them, we have community service providers, other levels of government all saying, you know, something has to change. We have police chiefs across the country saying they're open for these kinds of changes change because it has to happen and it will be a, a new a, 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 a new model to deliver what our residents in our communities need. 
But we also have to remember that at this point, we have a service person, we have a, a, a team of service personnel, members who are sacrificing. They have a unique job. They don't get to take time off when, and you know, if, uh, if um, uh, even just uh, something like parental leave. You, Chief can't just backfill someone for temporary periods. These things are real, the, the uh, impact, and they need, we need each member to feel like there is a capacity for them to heal and, and, and um, feel supported. Uh, and, the, and, and this comes from us as a council supporting the need of these kinds of asks. Uh, I, I don't know how much time I have left. Oh, I have a minute. So even, you know, this whole piece around um, HRP, and this is the RCMP um, uh, motion, but our, the psychologist, the health and wellness, these are all part of a journey to get to where that, that these asks aren't, aren't going to be as critical, but these are critical times right now to support these um, requests for more bodies. And that is part of the journey to change as well, to the journey within the policing force to change models. And if, because right now we have what we have and we need to support it. It's, policing's not going away. Policing is still here. Um, and they need this support, they need these bodies, and I encourage you all to not vote for this. Um, this is a uh, one step towards the other, and I think that we would be short-sighted to put all of our, everything related to supporting the current service that we have on hold waiting for something else to happen, because we all know there's a snail's pace to get a lot of partners at the table for a lot of the recommendations that we have, we will support, because we've said that. So, but we've said so in our strategies that we have. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kent. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, I've got a, another question I've asked before to the CAO. I'm going to ask it again this time around. Can you explain to us, again, the contract that we have between RCMP, HRM, and the province when it comes to RCMP, how that works, the percentages paid, by whom, and does that in contract include a uh, number of personnel, sworn officers and non-sworn uh, non -per personnel, or, or the chief superintendent is going to do it, either, either or you're welcome, uh, chief superintendent. Hand that over to the chief superintendent. <laughs> no, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, uh, Council, to the commissioners. Um, I think it's helpful to think back to what are the basics of a contract. And the contract, there's different versions, different cost splits. That Public Safety Canada makes the RCMP available to provinces and municipalities. That can probably subdivide into three types. First is First Nations policing, which we're not talking about today where there's a distinct group and there's an augmentation or enhancement of policing services. And Canada provides a 52% cost share to that, 52 or 48. So it's a 52, 48 cost split. In the case of the municipality here, it's grandfathered based on the long-standing uh, provincial service. So it's grandfathered at a 70, 30 cost split your CFO and the CAO are much more versed in the financial pieces, but in essence, the cost of policing is to some extent reduced by 30% in terms of the total cost. So I think the heart of your question was sort of how the billing works. And so again, uh, the municipality can express the desire to increase or decrease the RCMP complement, right? That's done by a letter uh, based on the vote or the expression. But I would also say the Nova Scotia Police Act, which is guiding for all municipalities in the province, also talks about adequate and effective policing. And it's therefore also my responsibility through the multi-year financial process that creates a business case that's fairly well researched, that looks at comparators across the country, 
that looks at crime trends, statistics, drivers, et cetera. And so then we package that from a due diligence perspective and we bring it to the police board. And then the police board also provides its, for lack of a better word, vetting or comments in terms of the story that we've told. And then through that budgetary process as expressed in the provincial police services agreement, then we elevate it into council. And I believe, sir, you were on the police board at one time with other folks. So the short answer here is that there's a contract where the municipality funds 184 positions. However, because of the contract, there's approximately 32 public servants that aren't, aren't paid for directly, that, that are just part of the policing service delivery package. How many was that, sorry, 30? Uh, 30, 32, take that with a grain of salt, it could be off by one. Um, roughly 32, and then there's approximately nine additional boots on the street positions that the provincial government uh, gives to the RCMP Halifax detachment. So you're, you're funding 184, but the total complement is of employees in your Halifax RCMP because of the contract and the way the contract works is around 228 or 229. Uh, uh, Chief Superintendent, are you able to, and you may not be able to do this, uh, but I'll ask it anyway, uh, are you able to identify uh, how many uh, sworn officers are actually not on the job? You may not be able to do that in public, but uh, I apologize if that's the case. Yes, Chair, through you to uh, Councillor Mancini. There's approximately 30 bodies right now at any given time that are, are, are not on shift. Those 30 bodies would break down to about 10 roughly on pat or mat leave. And then there's a rotation of, of people going through different promotion processes, going through right. ODS, et cetera. I think the uh, percentage I use that I look for on a month to month basis is that when we have a funded position, we sort of have a position number. So I look at those numbers to see how many bodies were short that we don't have a name for. So I was named. Right. But it took me three or four months to come. That's just sort of the industry, right? right? So at any given time, I only see two to three s spots that I don't see a name for. So we, we have quite a fully staffed complement, though like every other industry, we have people that may be injured, that may be on Madden Pat leave or off duty for different reasons. So it, it's, and uh, I guess I was thinking, I was trying to simplify the contract, but it's not that simple, right? It's not the contract is for 184 uh, um, officers and you and the dollar amount is X. Uh, so we're, it's not that simple. Uh, Kathy O'Toole to uh, speak to that. And I want to thank Superintendent Christie for answering the uh, question on our behalf. Um, yes, Councillor Mancini, it is not that simple, but also it's complicated for us right now because we have not actually seen the, a version of the current signed contract. We right. do not have that. Yeah. Uh, my time's up. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Othit. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I am, I'm a councillor that is actually, my district is, is patrolled by HRP. But we have a great relationship with our neighbor Sackbull, who have RCMP. And as you heard when this came up previously, I asked for some clarification about the back and forth and the backing each other up, et cetera, and also the coverage of the airport and whatnot. And Superintendent Christie and others straightened me out on a few things and reconfirmed a few things for me, and I appreciate that. I'm a huge believer in detasking, retasking, and depressurizing police. But I do not, and I've said this many times around here, necessarily believe that that is going to save us any money or result in any cutbacks in policing. I think it's going to cre uh, free up police to better do what we want them to need them to do, uh, and what they're trained to do, and things that have defaulted to them because nobody else is doing it. We can blame the, ourselves, the province, the feds, whoever we want, but the, the reality is there. It's defaulted to them in some cases because others weren't doing it. I also believe that that, that detasking and retasking, depressurizing, and and supporting people like Bill and Amy in our public service will uh, public uh, safety will result in some prevention of things escalating to the state that police have to be involved. 
I, I do believe that could happen over time. But I also believe that many times the folks trying to help us as a result of these will also still require um, police backup in, an, in a situation where someone is trying to hurt themselves, a domestic dispute, these sort of things. Police are still going to be required. So, and I, and I think I've said this almost every meeting, while we have to do this, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can freeze or cut the number of police we have. And to think that the rural areas, and I hope this doesn't disintegrate to rural versus urban versus suburban, because it's not. We're one municipality with a combined police force and one taxpayer. And to think that the rural areas have not had an increase in the number of officers serving them since 2012 is a little hard for me to palate. Um, we didn't increase last year, RCMP, when they put in a request. We certainly have added some HRP over the year, up till, not, not this year, fair enough, for, for the reasons Kathy outlined, and I support that completely. But we have not, we have in the past added some HRP. It's no different, folks, that when you grow by five or 10,000 people a year, that you're gonna need more mowing, more plowing, more transit drivers, more firefighters, more police, Maybe someday more counselors, God help us. Uh, but that is a cost of growth. And to say to the rural areas who pr don't have the navigators that we have, don't necessarily have all the CROs and, 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 and uh, school officers and whatnot that we have anyway, and who have a long time to respond to a call, I use the example all the time of where I, my, my place, where in the rural areas, the place would burn down and be burglarized before the call even came through. But, but to think that that growth since 2012 is not warrant, does not warrant adding a few officers, regardless of what we decide to do about retasking and detasking down the road, I think is rather naive, first of all, and, and, and rather unfortunate. So I will be supporting this, and I hope that we will support our rural and suburban uh, residents and RCMP and, and, uh, and in fact, some of them are urban. I don't cons I actually, I don't consider Cole Harbor or uh, Sackville to even be suburban or, or rural. But I can tell you they're not, uh, I think my policing is sad. You should see how sad theirs is when it comes to numbers. And we know now we have a, a city that there's going to be issues. I mean, how many officers do you think were tied up when there was that issue with CPA? There was at least 10 police cars in that parking lot. And that will happen again. So it's time that we supported our colleagues uh, who have RCMP and support the RCMP with a little bit of recognition of the growth that has happened since 2012 and in hopes that we continue to move forward with detasking, retasking and depressurizing to prevent some of the things that police now presently have to deal with. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Othit. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Aaron, so um, just to clarify, the motion on the floor right now is to remove this from the bu budget adjustment list, so to, to vote against um, the increase in much needed RCMP officers in our suburban and rural areas. And although we are one municipality, yes, um, from what I've understood, policing in urban and rural areas is, is two, two totally different beasts. So one of the impacts that, one of the considerations uh, for rural policing is uh, response time. That can be the difference of life or death. Um, in a meeting with RCMP last week, one, one of the uh, concerns that came forward was rural policing is changing in the, from the standpoint of now they're responding to a lot of like health emergency calls because the paramedics can't get there in time, they're tied up. Like, it's, there's a lot of crossovers with our emergency response people and, and like these are real pressures and real implications. Another thing that has increased recently in, well, in Cole Harbor, break and enters. Our businesses are being targeted. So we're getting like three or four a week that are being smashed in. Um, like, so that ties up resources. And, the, and then so we have domestic abuse issues in rural areas that can be very, very, uh, um, <laughs> Well, yeah, life-threatening. Life we, we need these bodies. 
uh, to support the folks who are out there already right now um, who have been desperately needing more help for years. So it, this, this is not an anti-police. No, we don't want more police. Yeah, we actually need more RCMP officers in our rural and suburban areas. We, we absolutely do. Um, uh, so yeah, and, and the cons consideration of travel time too. They they have a much bigger uh, area that they patrol. So um, literally, it can take an hour to get to where a call is coming from. And in that hour, there's a lot that can happen. And if offices are tied up in medical emergencies, in in other things, uh, we just need more resources. So I I am against this particular motion, and I am uh, supporting. The, the request for our CMP officers. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, thank you for putting this motion on the floor, Councillor Cleary. Another opportunity for us to discuss the fact that uh, rural uh, policing is not adequate. Uh, you know, we, uh, Halifax District RCMP, they're servicing roughly 95% of the area of HRM. They are uh, required to serve roughly 43% of the population in HRM. That's about 180,000, 190,000 people in the municipality. Uh, just to give you a whole kind of scope, uh, you know, they're responding to last year uh, 52,000, over 52,000 calls for service. In addition to that, uh, HRM is, uh, sorry, RCMP is servicing an area in HRM that does not have the community navigators uh, in, in the area, in the urban areas, uh, like the urban areas, sorry. We do not have access to the mobile mental health uh, service like HRP. We, you know, also uh, they're servicing a community that doesn't have access to transit for the most part or any kind of, uh, uh, you know, public transportation. We are also, uh, you know, looking at an area that doesn't have the senior safety program. So I'm looking at you, Bill Moore, because I know that you're working on that report for me. And, um, you know, so. It, we also are looking at an area, again, 95% of the municipality, which is growing significantly with an awful lot of construction sites uh, where construction theft is up. I just had a meeting with Duncan Williams uh, at the Construction Association, Nova Scotia. Holy cow, there is so much building going on here and many, many more uh, construction sites. And when you look at the calls for service, um, you know, especially to construction sites, it is significant. Uh, and j just to give you kind of a, the landscape, so District 13 through this boundary review, we're growing so fast in District 13, we're actually being split into four. That's how fast we're growing. And, you know, in thinking about uh, the need for police officers, this was yesterday, this was five years ago, this was 10 years ago, right? Like we really, really need to catch up uh, with being able to have that service and these officers are paramount. Um, as well in just thinking about, uh, you know, the importance of policing and uh, crime prevention, uh, you know, and Tim's right, what happened at CPA? Um, that is significant, but a lot of the other issues we're not hearing about because it's not written about in the media. And that's because our CMP are there and they're dealing with those issues. And we, as, uh, as residents in District 13, uh, residents in the rural community, uh, we value uh, policing, we value the work that they're doing in the community and the relationship building that's taking place. You can't do that if you don't have the bodies. Right, so you know, I think that that definitely there is uh, a lot of work to be done in order to um, build stronger relationships with our Indigenous community, Acadia First Nation, Spec and Ecadic in my district, as well as our African Nova Scotian communities, Lucasville and and uh, Upper Hammonds Plains. You know, we're just about to host a community meeting uh, with our CMP and um, and Upper Hammonds Plains. These are really really important things, but we can't do that if we don't have the bodies, and so. So, you know, I, I just, I think, uh, Chief Superintendent, you, you know you've heard from me, <laughs> from me quite often about, uh, you know, working together better, ensuring that we are all on the same page, whether it's dealing with diversity, inclusion, ensuring that, um, you know, residents feel heard 
when they make the call or when they visit the detachments. Um, so, you know, again, we can't do that good work if we don't have the bodies. So, you know, I just, I think that not having any increase since 2012, not having the same level of services, such as mobile and mental health, um, senior safety program, looking at the community navigators, looking at ways that um, we can advance uh, the very, very important services that our residents are paying for. So uh, I, I just think that, uh, you know, obviously I'm not gonna vote for this motion on the floor, but certainly it's another opportunity for us to look at why it's important to have this conversation and why, in, like, why does it keep ending up being about rural services versus urban services, HRP versus RCMP. We have an integrated force that is uh, paramount that we continue to consider the fact that we have an integrated force and uh, and also the, the, the role that RCMP plays is not just uh, in a car with traffic, it's not just, uh, you know, doing the work um, with regards to traffic control. Uh, they are out there in the community um, working very hard to build relationships with the community to do crime prevention and to ensure that at the end of the day, people feel safe in our communities. That's their role. But we need more bodies in order to do that. I, I'm over time. That's why you're looking at me like that. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chair, thank you. It's all good. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Just about everything that she said. Um, I, I would add one more to your list of, of services we don't have. Uh, community mobilization teams, for example, a good response that we, you know, excellent program that we have here um, in the urban core to deal with uh, violence and trauma in, in communities and, and be proactive in addressing that. We don't have that in our rural areas or, or many of our suburban areas. Um, I'd also add to your list of, of issues, dangerous driving and impaired driving. And I think when you, you know, the stats get skewed and you know, we're like, we're data driven, data driven. But if you're not collecting the data, then you know what, it, it, it's not really telling the whole picture. And I think for many of us who represent areas that do have a rural component, those are some of the concerns and issues that we hear about, um, hear about regularly. And the importance of building relationships with, the RCMP um, to report those issues and and you know is is work that still needs is still needs work that still needs to be done. So um, you know what there's a a lot of issues in our rural areas. They're very different than the issues in our urban areas. They require but they do require um, you know a, a serious re response. And so this is really about community safety, public safety, crime prevention. Um, and um, and you know, supporting our integrated force in all areas of HRM. So um, I'll just leave it there and say that I will not be supporting this motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So. Budget uh, is uh, is a numbers game. So for me, when I look at this, it's uh, it's all about the numbers. And to throw some of those numbers out there, um, you know, it's been mentioned six police officer resources added to Halifax District RCMP since 2012. That's a 3.85 percent increase. That, despite the fact the population in the areas that are taken care of by RCMP, it's gone up by 11%, the population has. Um, the uh, pop to cop ratio, we struggle to meet the national average. In fact, we're just about double the national average. The uh, national average cop to pop is one officer to 504 residents, according to StatsCan in 2019. Halifax RCMP, one to 1,026 residents. Looking at other similar size municipalities, uh, for example, let's see, Abbotsford in BC, similar size, one officer to every 642 residents. Uh, Barrie, one to 628. Uh, in Newfoundland, it's one police officer to every 500 and 79 residents. So, is, you know, those numbers clearly show that 
uh, cop to pop, and I know it's not a, a perfect, you know, apples to apples comparison, but it certainly gives a fairly decent indication that uh, we are nowhere close to that Canadian average. You want to talk more numbers? Let's talk about the hundreds of hours that officers are spending in ERs. And there is no, no indication that that's going to be changing anytime soon. As a matter of fact, uh, if you talk to uh, officers, they'll tell you it's only getting worse. The amount of time that they are spending in ERs with, uh, with people. Uh, you know, it, uh, we, we talked all about uh, safety when it came to, uh, you know, uh, approving to move forward with the, uh, the fire station in, in Bedford West because absolutely I agree, it's a safety issue. Well, it's a safety issue for us here too with RCMP. Our residents are telling us that, you know, the, the service that they are getting is not enough. They like the service that they're getting, it's just not enough. And, uh, you know, it's been pointed out, I, I agree, Sackful. Coal Harbor, uh, you know, those aren't rural or suburban areas anymore. They are really little towns and cities unto themselves. Uh, and I, I do think that uh, you know we we need to support this ask of RCMP because the, the numbers show that it's warranted. And so I will not be supporting the motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, go ahead, Council. Who was Councillor Mason? Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you for the, for your time, Councillor Mason. So, this is a quick question of clarification. Um, so, the report or our budget report, um, ballot information, mentions the only six office resources have been added since 2012, and that number has been referenced a few times. But when I go back to the report that we received uh, at the police commission, it has our CMP FTE resource growth within HRM. In 2018, there was 178, and then 2019-ish, it grew to 184, uh, about six. So my understanding is that 2019 is when the last time there was a resource, but were those positions not full-time uniforms? Uh, because when I saw the 2012 number, I, I, it looked incorrect to me, but maybe I'm just, I missed something. So this is a question of clarification. Is, and you, and, and Chief Superintendent, you weren't here at the time, so maybe you're, you're not sure, but maybe you do have that information. Air through you to the Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, I don't have that information. It is my understanding in preparation through this um, process that the numbers have not grown significantly over the last 10 years. Uh, my understanding is, however, there may have been a growth of a body or two, so to speak, but not a significant investment. I, it's my understanding that the council may wish to correct me, but two mm -hmm. years ago, there was a request here for, I think, two positions. I think both positions were, uh, for lack of a better word, denied at that time, is my recollection. Right, so when I, when in, in, it's not in our budget report, so I had to go back to a police commission report, but in the police commission report, report coming from HR, HRP, our CMP, uh, FTE resort growth within HRM, 178 for 2018, and then in 2019, there's a, a large jump on the graph that goes up to 184. So uh, I'm not sh sure where the, the, the miss number is. It might be our numbers, it might be your numbers, I don't know, but I think there is a, a mismatch there. Uh, so that might be good to get that clarified. Uh, for for this discussion, if that's possible, what I will ask you, and this might be also data that you data that you might not have, and I and I probably should have asked you ahead of time so you could come with it. So when I look at the um, the 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 IPTA or or when officers are transporting folks to the the hospitals, those numbers uh, have increased. What we don't have is the 2022 numbers. We only have the 2021 from the report. And I would suspect just from other um, pieces of information that we've received and what we're seeing with other police forces that the probably the 2022 numbers are probably higher than that. So I'm just wondering if you have any maybe indication if the wait times have increased for this year or so. Again, I know you might not have that on hand, but I'm wondering if, if, if you know if that's something that you're seeing or not. 
do to the commissioner. Um, one bit of anecdotal information, uh, sir. We've just finished two days of, of sort of supervisory meetings um, offsite. Uh, it was very topical, the amount of time that members are being sort of uh, engaged in medical response type calls. Uh, it's been flagged from Sheet Harbor all the way to Tantallon in terms of even sometimes at the community consultation sessions. We've just finished seven or eight of those as well. So the demand in terms of supporting sort of mental health calls continues to be high. Mm -hmm. the, the time investment, um, some, some want to be careful. Uh, my, my learned colleague, uh, Chief Kinsella, may wish to speak as well. But my understanding, again, is that the wait times in the hospitals continue to be high uh, because of the other demands that we're aware of. Right. And I'm not so. sure if any, I don't see anyone else from your shop here, but uh, if, if, they're, if they're watching, if there is a numbers from the IPTA for 2022, that'd be great to just know that is showing within the data as well. So, so maybe between now and by the time we're done this, somebody who's watching maybe to send you a magical text message, who knows? Um, the, the other piece really quickly with my last 30 seconds, what I will say is, you know, at the commission, um, there's a lot of folks who are, are pretty critical on, on um, positions being added within, within our police force, both HRP and RCMP. And what I can tell you is that when, when RCMP presented their information with the data that was, we, we, we wanted, it was pretty compelling that there needs to be some kind of shift related to the, to the bodies. And, and, and so that's why you know, I support at the board and I, and I support it here because it wasn't really about the mental health calls because I think there's a lot of other aspects of that that I, um, we could talk about, but I think it really comes down to the service um, standards that we would hope can be achieved through the RCMP, which, which I'm not gonna say are not being achieved, but I know that your officers work are very hard to, to make sure that that they can get to calls and, and service a very large area uh, within our municipality. So, you know, I'll just say that they, the, 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 the argument was very compelling and that's why we're here today because it, what, what you shared with the board um, have convinced us that this, this ask was needed. Uh, but again, I, you know, there might be some information here that convinces me otherwise. So thank you very, very much, Chief Superintendent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. If I could make one comment to the Councillor. Uh, I think it's important for the committee, and I realize I'm not uh, anywhere in the medical domain. I'm a, just a police officer. Uh, but when we talk about a mental health call, it's important that we don't put a self-bias in terms of what the violent level, in terms of what that call can become. Uh, our experience in policing is, number one, we don't want to criminalize mental health for all the reasons and the progressive steps that the municipality is looking at in terms of sort of a layered approach. But undeniably, even this year, I think we're up to nine different police officers that have been killed, sadly, in the line of duty. Many of those may, in fact, relate back to sort of a person in crisis. It's an extremely complex, an extremely sort of volatile situation. And that's why the municipality is also so blessed to have some best practices like the mobile mental health response team. But as per some of the comments by councillors already, that team does not always respond into sort of the RCMP uh, rural areas. So it's a complex area. Calls continue to not just take demand, but multiple members to respond, right? So again, a mental health, somebody in, in, in crisis, is not just a single member, maybe two or three members, all responding to try and de-escalate, keep folks safe, and then once that safety is achieved, if it's required to detain them, escort them to the hospital, and then wait again, right? Different steps in the systems that all require time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Superintendent. Jerry, would you like to add something? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Just to Councillor Smith's question about uh, FTEs, uh, back in, uh, I think it was the 2018-19 uh, budget, I was acting CFO then, and there was an ask for six uh, officers that I think were approved, and then they were staggered in over the next uh, year, year and a half. Uh, I believe so. I, that number should be uh, correct on the FTE count. It might be a little bit of timing difference as to when 
Uh, I'm speaking to when the funding was approved by council. Uh, there might be a little bit of a reconciling timing difference there on FTEs as to when the, the FTEs were actually filled and onboarded. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm glad that that's kind of sorted. Uh, I remember it was actually Councillor Craig across the way in 2018 that made that pitch for the six uh, RCMP officers and that was then added into the budget. Um, so it, it's not since 2012. Um, you know, I, I wasn't going to buzz in. I, th I have the feeling that this is one of these things we're all going to say our piece and the vote will be exactly the same as it was back uh, when we first put this on the bow. Uh, but I did want to speak uh, mainly on the suggestion of urban versus suburban. Um, you know, that's not the perspective. I'm, I'm not going to support this, but that's not the perspective I'm coming at it with. And I voted for Councillor Craig's motion happily in 2018 to add the police, but then the world has changed quite significantly. And since 2020, I have not voted for any of the requests by HRP to add uniformed officers because I fundamentally agree with the detasking, reforming policing, and to add new people, has to, you have to hit a pretty high bar for me and to do that. And, you know, other than the RCMP ask seems to hinge on just, uh, well, here's the cop versus pop calculation. I kind of need a little bit more for myself. Um, you know, I asked when, they, when this was first up, I asked for data on response times, like actually like, well, what has been the trend on response over time? And we didn't have that data then, and I didn't see it in the briefing notes, so I'm assuming we still don't, eh? Sure. Uh, through you to uh, the Deputy Mayor. It's my understanding, Deputy Mayor, that uh, that data may be in the Price Waterhouse Cooper report um, as part of the research in the source. Um, so I, I did make inquiries on that. We may have another subject matter expert behind me, Mr. Bill Moore, uh, but I'm not uh, able to access that data. And in the interest of data consistency, making sure I don't, you know, mix and match a, a methodology, uh, I've, I've deferred that until that uh, important piece of work is released. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So to me, I, there's just not enough here for me to support this at this time. Uh, you know, I didn't support HRP ones. I'm not going to support ARCMP ones. Um, and, you know, I think fundamentally we have to have that conversation about um, what policing is going to look like and, importantly, what role we see our dual police forces. We've got the study work that my colleague there has referenced already. Um, you know, RCMP territories might change, uh, might all stay the same. Uh, there's a lot of different permutations that come out of that. So at this time, I can't support this increase because, uh, you know, it's. I'd be willing to consider it if I had data to really say a strong case other than just, you know, all I've kind of heard is basically cop versus pop and then anecdotal, and that's not enough for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Deputy Mayor, may, maybe you'd like to come for a drive with me um, down through Muscadabit Valley and Upper Muscadabit and Dean and Lemon Hill and see where the RCMP station is versus where some of the issues happen because I, I don't want it to be a rural suburban issue either. But the lived experience of the people who are rural that are supported by the RCMP, it's about their experience So, um, and they're part of HRM. So I, I take it, I take the point that we don't want it to be rural versus urban, but the lived experience is that the rural communities really feel like they need to be better supported by having more officers on the ground. Um, we just had a good series of meetings. There was a, a beautiful meeting in middle Muscadabit, although I didn't get to attend. Uh, I got all kinds of phone calls afterwards telling me how great it was. Um, and the other piece is that it's not always uh, rural either. Wellington, Grand Lake, Fall River, Waverly, they're all suburban and they're all supported by RCMP as well. So it, it's not just rural, it is suburban as well. Um, and before I forget, um, Chief Superintendent, um, my condolences for the recent losses of RCMP members uh, nationally. It's a very sad day for your family of RCMP officers. Um, and the other 
all the good things that were said by, you know, everyone that knows that we need to increase by four. Um, the other conversation that's important when we look at this from a budget perspective is it's the all-in cost versus RCMP is one all-in cost, whereas HRP, it's a staff cost, but then there's all kinds of additional costs. And so the value that we get, and when we're looking at this from a budget perspective, um, the all-in cost is something that should be considered as well. So no, I could not support the motion um, on the floor to remove this. I do think that we need more RCMP officers for the area that they cover, which is about 95% of the land mass of HRM. Thinking about it that way, I mean, I think that's really important. And absolutely, when we see all of these reports come back to us on all of the questions around policing, then yeah, we're going to be having an excellent conversation about what is the right policing model for HRM. In the meantime, we still need these four positions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. I'm going to go to the mayor at this point. Thank you very much. Um, th thank you, Chief Superintendent, and uh, thank you for your service. I, I, I buzzed in on something that Councillor Smith and Councillor uh, Austin perhaps were on. I wasn't expecting to vote on this, but I think it's a good conversation that we're having. I probably won't be here for the vote because I have something I, important I have to get out to at 3.30, but you know, I keep hearing about population is growing. Um, in 2015, the RCMP budget in HRM was 23,750,000. Uh, the proposal now is 32,945, 32,945,000, and if this passes, it'll go to higher than that. Um, the budget of RCMP has gone up either 39 or 42% since 2015. The population has gone up 17% in the municipality, and as Councillor Blackburn said, much less than that in the areas that are being serviced. Uh, like I, we're hearing there's nobody been added, we're hearing they have been added. Something's been added to the budget. I don't know exactly what it is. If it's not RCMP officers, I don't know who it is. So I don't have a, you know, I'm not, you know, completely supportive of what Councillor Cleary is trying to do, but this just goes to the issue that we've had, Chief Superintendent, with the RCMP is we just seem to have no control over the cost, no control over the responsibility. Um, and I, you know, we, we've been well served by the RCMP and by HRP. The dual policing in this city, in my view, has been stellar and unique. Um, I just don't want people to, like, we haven't starved the RCMP, folks. It's gone up by 40% in the last uh, six or seven years, more than the police budget has gone up, certainly more than our overall budget has uh, gone up. <clears throat> and it's like earlier today, there's nothing more important than the environment, nothing more important than safety. There's nothing more important than fire service. These are all important issues. We have to balance them at the end of the day, but I just want to inject a little note of fact to that, that the budget has gone up 39% since 2015. So don't say the population. You could have a population increase and a ton of inflation and a ton of supply chain, and you're not going to get to 42%. Is it important? Absolutely it's important. Um, and it may well be that we need to add the officers that we, we need to add, but we do need to be constantly vigilant about all of our policing and, and uh, you know, because there's a lot of municipalities across North America that are saying, when I go to conferences, there's nothing more important to us than our police and our fire personnel. We just don't know if we can afford them anymore. And uh, it's a real problem. So uh, that's got nothing to do with the service that we've had, which has been exemplary. Um, we've had some good leaders here at the RCMP, and you certainly, I uh, appreciate you, the, the leadership that you're showing. Just want to make sure we're talking about facts, folks, when we look at this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Why, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, I'll start with this. What I'm feeling right now and what I'm hearing makes me feel that it's the right thing to do to support for additional police because of my feelings. And I'm not saying that to be flip, but, but what I, it's to illustrate my point, which is I'm going to vote to support it this one time. But uh, when we talked about this last chief superintendent, I, I said, I don't feel like I have enough data and I still don't have the data that I need. And I'm hoping that between you and Chief Kinsella and Bill sitting back there, we can get that before, by good Lord, we get here next year because uh, cop to pop 
has to be broken down by settlement type. Right, like we've got rural, according to StatsCan, that's about 85,000 people in HRM. Sackville is not rural, Coal Harbor is not rural. So when we look at it as an aggregate number, if we're comparing the entire service area and say, and then comparing it to Abbotsford or Burnaby or something like that, then we're comparing a urban number to a, to a mixed urban rural number. So I wanna see that broken down. And to me, I have these feelings, but what we need to do is get to a place where we, between the police commission and council, have established what is an appropriate uh, resource for the urban areas, what is an uh, appropriate resource for the suburban areas, what's an appropriate resource for the rural areas, recognizing, you know, like I did a quick, only one I could find, and kudos to Kings County, is that they had their number of police they pay for in their budget, which most of the counties don't. And their cop to pop is uh, one co RCMP per 1,398 people. But they have urban areas. They have Colebrook and a bunch of other places that have sewer and water that are part of the county. So, so we gotta be careful we're doing apples to apples comparisons here. And once we establish those numbers, the number of police who should be policing Bedford, as I said last time we had this discussion, should be the same as on a per capita basis as in Sackville, right? It should be the same in Woodlawn as it is in Coal Harbor. We haven't gotten there yet. We need to figure out what our appropriate service levels are. Recognizing those service levels, part of the goal here is that as the other things that we've asked in public safety ramp up over the next hopefully starting next summer, next year, next budget, uh, but as they ramp up over the next decade, we can start to grow the number of, uh, you know, increase, decrease the number of police per, per capita. I think that's, that's one of the goals here. So I'm gonna support this, acknowledging in front of, you know, the public and the media and the residents that I still don't feel I have enough information to really know what we're doing here. Like, like I, I still can't compare Bedford to Sackville. I still can't compare Coal Harbor. Right, and I still can't compare. There, yes, Sackville is much better, Councillor, <laughs> and, and, and and I still can't and I still can't compare uh, rural Muscadabit Valley to Guysborough County, right, and and to St. Mary's and and to uh, Antigonish County outside of the town. And so, so if we're going to have this discussion again, which we are going to, <laughs> of course we're going to, right? Let's let's get that data. Like we need to, we need we need to get information, to set standards that then drive, uh, you know, what we're gonna pay for. And, uh, uh, you know, we don't have that now and that's unfortunate, uh, but uh, I hear the plea of my rural friends and colleagues and I certainly hear it from my mother-in-law in Tantallon. And so uh, with all those pressures coming this way, I think that at this point, this is a modest amount given the population increase. Acknowledging what the mayor said, we've had, we've, and, and Councillor Smith said, we've increased the budget tremendously and we've actually hired some more uniforms when Steve Craig was here. But uh, at this point, I can support it, but acknowledging I won't support an increase for any uniforms with either service until we actually get that done. That's got to happen this year. That's a big part of this whole uh, retasking piece that's got to get done. We've got to have that data. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Mason. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add, I guess, a piece to some comments that came from the mayor um, I, and, I, and from other colleagues, actually. And I, I certainly can appreciate the data, the complexity of, of the apples and pomegranates. <laughs> they're that different. They're not even apples and oranges. Uh, they're just so distinctly different in funding perspective and and uh, what we get in relation to it. For instance, you know, the vehicles, the uniforms, all of that, which is well, not, maybe not the uniforms with HRP, but you know, the vehicles with HRP are within a whole lot of different business unit. There's, there's other, other uh, skill sets and access to services that our RCMP offer. offer. Um, in, so we're really not comparing those two. So what that comes back to is the complexity of what we need to make these types of decisions. And so I get that and I can, I can appreciate that and I think any data from uh, uh, directed towards you, Chief, to help us get what we need to, to, you know, to discern and satisfy councillors, in particular those, again, 
who are not experiencing what those of us in rural areas are experiencing. Um, that needs to be there. Having said that though, uh, and to say that we're not starving the RCMP, I get that. And in, in relation to, I believe there was a number of things that changed over the last few years, which was increases to the cost of, of personnel. But the cost, and some of it was retroactive. Um, but that doesn't change the, the, the need for the body. Because we gas has gone up, I still need to, feel, to fill my car because the price of an officer, and, and that could be um, our HRP folks as well. The cost of an officer goes up doesn't mean that we can't suddenly just stop providing the, the, the members that the service needs. So I would ask that you, you know, consider that in, in the picture. And um, I've said, you know, lots of people have articulated lots of good reasons for supporting uh, not supporting this particular motion, but supporting the inclusion of the RCMP request this year. And I stand by that and hope that you'll continue to vote against this one. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Kent. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm coming at this from both a practical and a philosophical uh, perspective. And I'll start with practical. This has nothing to do with rural policing or the value of it or the amount of it. Uh, although, when both HRP and RCP came to us and did their presentations, uh, HRP calls for services were like almost four times higher than RCMP's calls for services, like 52,000 versus 180 something thousand. Um, so, you know, when we look at, we've had a fast growing suburban rural area. In the last couple of years, we've had like one of the fastest growing downtown areas in Canada for uh, for cities. So wouldn't and and they have way more calls for service than almost any other area. So I mean, isn't that an argument for adding more HRP officers? But we said we're not going to. Um, so this is and it's and it's really not population that drives the demand for calls for service. It's not land mass. It's activity. And if you look at the activity that's happening, the calls for service in the rural areas, they're far less. So of course you would expect the cop to pop ratio to be far less if you have less activity, less calls to go to. This is where I get into the philosophical now. So in November 2019, I remember uh, when our relatively new HRP chief was standing in front of community folks and, and others at the Polo Regan Hall and apologized for the street checks. Uh, and I remember I think it was the next year, or maybe it was that year, everything after COVID's blurred, uh, I pulled out the armored vehicle and we took that 400-ish thousand dollars and we put it into diversity and inclusion and anti-black racism initiatives specifically. Uh, and, and both of those were kind of historic in that sense. I was searching and, and looking for the articles and information in September 2021, it was reported widely that the RCMP policy still supports street checks and that the RCMP won't apologize to African Nova Scotian uh, communities for street checks. So I guess my question is to the chief superintendent, will you apologize? And if not, why won't you apologize? And given the difference between HRP and RCMP in this, I'd be happy for HRP to take over all the RCMP areas because they've proven themselves to be a more responsible community policing partner. This is very much a budget discussion. You're going to put more officers into the RCMP who won't apologize to our residents for their behavior. Oh, well, just, oh, you guys chirping at me, so I'm waiting for the answer. Go ahead, Chief Superintendent. Chair, thank you. Councillor, thank you. I think your heart of your question is around trying to do right by community policing. Um, we're very fortunate with some... Respectfully, though, that was not my question. It's about the apology. Thank you. We have a, a very committed new commanding officer by name of Assistant Commissioner Dennis Daly, myself, Chief Superintendent Sue Black. I tell you, the three of us are, are committed and are moving towards making an apology. We're also looking at a number of steps on what are the initiatives in behind from the perspectives of reconciliation to make that apology in terms of internal systems real and tangible. 
So I, I am pleased to share with you, as I have a number of the councillors that have been at some of the community consultation or some of the meetings to do with RCMP areas. We are very much looking at doing an apology, but we're also engaging with stakeholders and leaders in the black community to try and ensure that when we make our apology, that we also do right by what are the initiatives and the internal changes in terms of our internal systems. I hope that answers some of that question, sir. Sort of, but I, my time has run out. So I would say that until the apology happens and until we review the PricewaterhouseCoopers report, I don't know why we would add more officers of any kind, regardless of the uniform. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Kent. I, I'm still reeling from some of the rhetoric that came out of my colleague um, in relation to this. Um, thank you, Chief, for sharing that. Um, that is a is a big change from a, from a national delivery service to having local. It's a good example of the responsiveness of local RCMP leaders and, and uh, considerations of community that can affect changes like this that could in fact also be a leading, uh, a leading action across the country. We don't know. So I wish you Great luck with that. You know it, you've recognized that it's important to this council and you are taking action towards that. Um, I'm struggling with, as well, my colleagues' consideration around if we don't support HRP, we shouldn't support RCMP. That just doesn't make sense. We have to look at First of all, I support, um, I, I hope you'll support positions with HRP as a board police chair and as a councillor. But to think that one should prevent the other is short-sighted. It's, it's about what is needed. Um, uh, if, and I get, well, again, I'll go back to if you need more data in relation to that rationale behind it, so be it. But we are hearing, we are, there are many councillors in here who are served by RCMP um, who have spoken loudly than their constituents, and thank you, Councillor Mason, for sharing your mother's position. Um, that mother-in-law, okay, even better. Good, good, good on you. <laughs> um, that, that, you know, it's real. And, and, and one of the things that I'm most proud of here in this council is that we really are, um, I think, have seen a very healthy acknowledgement of the experience, as Councillor Lovely says, the very lived experience in our rural areas versus our suburban and, and, and uh, urban. And so I just don't think that's the, uh, I mean, ultimately it's your decision Councillor Clary, of how you discern where you're going to su support, what you're going to support today, but uh, I don't. I think it's a short-sighted approach to think that just because we don't for one, we don't for the other, and we would be a pretty sad council if we took that approach to so many other budget um, allocations. So thanks, and I call for the oh, Councillor Stoddard's up. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, appreciate the discussion on this matter, but I must say uh, I wasn't going to buzz in because a lot of the things that have been said uh, not to not support this uh, motion of Councillor Cleary's has been said and said very well. I do want to make the comment that I do not think that the RCMP apology belongs in a budget meeting. That is something totally separate and it should not even be on the table as part of this discussion. I understand exactly where, um, sorry, <sighs> take a breath. I know exactly where you're coming from, Chief Christie. 
Um, I was actually at one of the first meetings when we were talking about how the delivery of the apology should happen. So, um, uh, Councillor Cleary, uh, you weren't at that meeting and you don't know the steps that we're taking to make sure that apology is done correctly. And again, I would reiterate, it doesn't belong here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Stoddard. Uh, there are no further speakers. The question has been called. And that motion fails. Thank you very much, everyone. I know it's 25 to 4, and the meeting is supposed to end at 4, but let's take a 10-minute break.
the chair is asking everyone to return to their seats. The chair is requesting that everyone please return to their seats. Good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the Budget Committee meeting for Wednesday, March 29th. Um, we're only a few minutes past that 10 minutes, which is great. <coughs> we are back on the main motion. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I was wondering if we could revisit the um, performance-based towing program again to see if we can pull that off of the budget adjustment list uh, just for less pressure on the budget. Wondering if that could perhaps be um, put out a couple of years. Uh, 21, a BN026, performance-based towing program, if we can remove that. So there Thank is you. the motion. Would you mind reading the motion? It uh, should be on your screen in a second. Sure. Uh, I move that the motion be amended to decrease the proposed 2023-24 operating budget as set out in recommendation one by removing item 21 by the full partial amount of $350,000. Thank you. You have uh, five minutes to speak to it. Go ahead. Yeah. Councillor Cleary did. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so th this this makes sense. Uh, I remember when we were uh, debating this uh, last month um, and decided to put this on the list. Um, I'm just wondering with all of the pressures, all of the um, different additions that are being added to the budget adjustment list if this perhaps can be just put on hold for a year or so, maybe even longer. We do have towing services available to the municipality. From what I understand, it's just a matter of capacity. So sometimes they're not available because they're being used by other, uh, or they just have other pressures. Um, so I, I just, I'm just wondering if, if this is not a big impact, perhaps, uh, and we could we could add back three hundred and fifty thousand dollars where it's needed. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Not to speak for staff, but I think the reason this was recommended was because we have trouble getting towing companies to come and tow things that we need towed. And as someone who has, you know, the, the largest uh, population increase during the day uh, when the universities, the hospital sites in downtown fills up, uh, it can be very debilitating. This is why, as we said during the last debate, that the Halifax Harbor Bridges went farther than getting a performance contract. They bought a tow truck and they have it parked there during rush hour on the McKay approaches on the Halifax side because they couldn't get anybody to come in a timely fashion and when they got to clear the bridge, they got to clear the bridge. You know, for us, I think this is an appropriate approach and, and it's, a, it's, it's responding to a problem that we know we have and if we don't fund this, then we are simply going to have more cars parked uh, or stopped where they shouldn't be uh, and uh, we're going to have no means to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question for staff on this one. Um, so when you look at the briefing note, and I remember the discussion, uh, we talked about you, you know various reasons why a vehicle may be towed and why a, a contracted uh, tow truck company might not be able to come. In the briefing, it also talks about the winter parking ban and obstructing uh, operations, uh, you know, for snow clearing. If we have this ability ourselves, can we get, are you guaranteeing me we'll get more cars off the road? Because that is a huge pain in the butt after major snowstorms. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Uh, 
while I won't guarantee, what I can say is that this will provide us a mechanism to uh, follow up with the contractor in the event they don't respond. So this, this all this does is, is provide penalties and mechanisms to follow up on. Right now, our relationship is really arbitrary. We call them, we hope they come. If they don't come, we ask them to please come next time. So this will give us some teeth. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, my question just is uh, quickly. So are there any sort of revenue uh, possibilities with, uh, with having this piece included? Like are the more vehicles that are towed, is that more revenue to HRM in fines or other types of penalties? Or this is just strictly for the service? Like, yeah, just wondering if there's any revenue possibilities with this, thank you. Sure, thank you, Councillor, for that question through the Chair. Uh, so n indirectly, perhaps, uh, when we have winter ban, for example, we still will have the same number of staff out issuing the tickets. So there is no uh, fine associated with the tow itself. The fine is the infraction. So whether it's obstructing a driveway, winter ban, that's the fine where the municipality would receive the revenue. Uh, all this is is that the tow companies will receive the benefit of, of the release fee and, and the holding fee Fee. So if the vehicle is stored there for a period of time, plus we will be paying them a retainer to respond within a certain period of time. So no actual revenue realized as a result of having this. We'll still have the same amount of staff issuing the same amount of tickets for the same fines. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, there are no further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? The question's been called. Ian? Thank you very much. That motion fails. Uh, we are back on the main motion. The list is empty. <laughs> Seriously? Um, I would like to uh, go ahead, Councillor. Go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Well, I, so my question. Well, well, actually, there. Uh, okay, so there's still a few more questions. So the. Uh, item, oh my dear, where is it? The transfer of victim services from Halifax Regional Police to Halifax Regional Municipality. That s seemed in the briefing note, there's four different possibilities or four different options. There's no budget, there's no budget that I, I just wondering what, so if this doesn't get pulled off for debate, this stays on, what, what's the implication for, for that? We don't know how much this will cost. We don't know what the... But if this gets voted for, where, where does that leave? Um, it it stays as an active item that we will be doing further consultation and analysis of, and it can come back to council later on in the year. There's no immediate oh. budget impact from it, so it's not a decision that needs to be taken right now. Okay, well that makes sense then. And okay. In the absence of that, it stays exactly the way it is. Right, okay. Okay, that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't need to speak to it. I'm going to leave that one. It was just an anticipation of anywhere we went, might have gone with that one. Thank you. Are we... Uh, is the list in front of us, Ian, is the list in front of us on the main motion? Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Chair, just as we sound, looks like we're all about to wind down on the uh, ballot list. Uh, Jerry, can you just clarify where we are from uh, a right point right now as it stands? Or, yep. Go ahead, Tyler. Through the chair to the councillor, you are at 5.8 percent of an average tax bill increase. 5.8 percent. Okay, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hensby. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if there should be any appetite to revisit the organic collection, weekly collection from three months. I was wondering if we can prop, s s slim that down to two months for the months of uh, August and September. Uh, from my personal experience, I find that the month of July is not so bad, not so hot as it used to be anymore, but August and September, the season is longer in September, plus the gardening comes into effect and a lot, a lot of people are getting garden waste and other things put in the green bin. So. I was wondering if we shaved it down from three months to two months, we'd probably save ourselves $100,000. Uh, so you're looking to make a motion about the organics uh, collection, which is different from item eight. Um, I don't see that on the list, so we've got a briefing note about that. Um, would you like to make a motion about that, Councillor Hensby? Yeah, I'm just trying to find the briefing note number for you. If somebody else wants to speak, I can go and come back to it later as soon as I find it for you. We would need someone to second that motion. Briefing note 19. Briefing note 19, I've been informed. I don't see a seconder yeah. for that motion. No seconder, I guess it dies, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, in an effort to try to add money back into uh, the budget, um, and in speaking with um, staff, in particular Brad, um, th there there's an operating budget of nine hundred thousand dollars that has not been tendered yet towards the urban forestry plan, and that would result. Um, in a planting of an additional thousand trees, uh, just over a thousand trees. We've already approved half of the, the original budget. We, we cut the original budget in half and saved $750,000. Um, and that is going to result in over 2,000 trees being planted. I, I would like to propose that we, um, uh, amend uh, this motion by uh, by the nine hundred thousand dollars that's still available in the operating budget that has not been tendered yet um, for this particular year. So we would still be planting over 2,000 trees. This would just, um, the operating budget would enable another 1,000 trees be planted for this year. But if we were to put that $900,000 into this, that's almost a million dollars to impact the tax rate for this year. Um, that, no, there's no briefing note to this one. Is Brad Anguish here? <laughs> Brad, you could probably explain this a lot better than me. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, in, no, 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 because it wouldn't impact what we've already passed. Hi, Brad. Hi. Can you, can you fix, bring forward can the you human fix briefing what I just note? Did? Yes. All right. No, 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 this has nothing to do with that. I'm still upset that my cul-de-sac won't get cut. All right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh, oh, oh. oh, dear. Y you could just pave it. You have the contacts. I hear there's a good deal on a homeowners association. All right. So. Yes, Councillor, you have it right. So, to recap, we had, um, we will call, we had a, a, a tough year last year for a number of reasons, including a hurricane, difficulties, and we didn't get all the work out the door, so we had a very large carry forward of uh, about 800,000 uh, into this year, and that was the capital budget. So, the hard part about this one is the budget is split over two areas. The 900,000 in our operating budget is what we would call historically the core budget for the urban forest master plan. 
Council in trying to accelerate their performance or the outcomes against the urban forest master plan and getting all the tree planting, you added a fair bit of money for a number of years for the balance of that plan till the end of 2023. And that was about a number of about 1.5 million in the capital budget to supplement that operating budget in order to get a lot of trees planted. So as Councillor has correctly stated, we have Council at the beginning of this process did take our briefing note and, and, and uh, cut the capital in half. Decided not to take it all, cut it in half. So we've taken last year's unplanted money, combine it with this year's capital. That tender is on the street now. It closes on April the 4th, if I remember correctly, and that will get you about 2,000 trees planted. Again, subject to the final bid. We still have 900,000 in our operating budget that is yet to be tendered. And, and so that is uh, an option for council to put forward. It's simply put, it's 1,000 less trees to be planted. The only thing I would add over and above the briefing notes that you've had before, the staff estimate on losses through um, Fiona, because this is, keeps coming up. Fiona is north of 1,000 trees based on our numbers. I think 1,000 thousand and change, uh, short of 1,100. I haven't got the number totally out of my hands. So I'm not trying to persuade anything on that. I just wanted to make you aware because people are asking. Is that it? It's, it, it certainly is an option. Okay, so I'm wondering if there is a motion available for Councillor Purdy. I'll, I'll second it because I have some questions. Councillor Kent seconds a motion if we can. So the motion would be to cut public works operating budget by $900,000 in respect of the tree planting program for this year. So that, that has been... That it, Brad, you're okay? Yes, John. I, I, the very important thing here to specify if it's one year only, because right. otherwise, right? That of this, course. Just yes. to make sure we don't... Just yeah. Yeah. for this Thank year. You. Yeah. So for, for 23, 24, yeah. Ian. Thank you very much, uh, Brad. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Outhead. Brad, if it were up to me, your street would get mowed. You know that. <laughs> I'm not plowed. Um, so I got to ask this. I do this every year to you, Brad. 900 trees times $1,000 is $900,000. So you're saying 900,000 would cut out 1,000 trees. That, mean we're, that means we're paying $900 to plant these little trees each along the side of the road. That makes me bang my head against the wall, um, to, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know if you have a comment on it or not. I'm, I, knowing you, you've probably looked at ways to trying to get that price down, in fairness. But I, I'm just a little, I, I, I remain shocked by that. Yes, so the costs have certainly gone up as with inflation, yeah. but we also changed our spec for planting in the right of way. Right. Um, the soil bulb specifications are much uh, uh, more robust, because as you know, the original program, uh, I think uh, Councillor Mancini used to come in, I think on a regular basis and point out all the dying trees in the right of way. So yeah. we weren't getting good quality, so we've increased the spec. Yeah. So the tree stock has improved, the tree planting techniques improved, so we're asking a lot more to make sure the tree survives. Because the warranty provisions that we had just weren't, weren't working, right. they weren't actually getting the, right. the plants to survive, right, yeah. so. And I agree with you that it's gotten better, it just, it does seem like a lot of money, but I'm sure you've looked into this, so. I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Outhead. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of things. Brad, I know a whole lot of uh, young scouts that could plant those trees pretty darn quick. Um, <laughs> just saying. The, well, what warranty they have. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm being silly. Uh, no. So, <laughs> um, so I, I, I seconded it because I'm okay with the debate, a little bit of debate on this. Um, I have to say, though, that I am absolutely okay, like we, I did understand the need for trees in our communities. I understand the urban forestry plan. Um, I'm actually kind of glad that uh, Councillor Purdy brought this forward in a way that is at least lets us put a little 
uh, energy into creative ways to to lessen the burden on our taxpayers. How um, and and when I think about the trees and people's responses responsiveness to the trees being planted, I never hear great to see those trees being planted. Never. Well, I'm glad to hear you guys do. And maybe it has to do with location. I mean, we get a lot of salt in the air. We're near the, the harbor, all of that. But I do get a lot of why are we planting those trees? We're planting them under the wires. In Halifax, you're cutting trees down because they're growing into the wires, is all those things. And, of course, it's – and I can explain it because it's a different style of tree and all of that. But uh, I don't think that this year 2,000 plus another 1,000 is going to make a big – impact on the significance of not like a a a, a lowering of what that 5.8 percent so i just want jerry to uh 0.5 percent to give me a sense of if this one were to be put into the pot that allows the percentage to come down what would that look like Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if this motion passes, uh, right now we're at 5.8. This will take it down to 5.6, but Tyler and Dave are nodding yet. So 5.6. Okay. I will say to Brad's, po to Brad's point, this will be one time yeah. for this year. Right. This will be a pressure we'll have to deal with next year. Yeah. And, so, and so the other part of my uh, points is in TPW, I can think of a lot of places to put that money that's not going to trees. And it's not that I hate trees, I love trees. But if we're going to shift something, do we want to shift it in that way? And that's, and that's, that's, that's a whole other debate. Um, uh, you know, we've asked, we have a bunch of things that, as well that we are, are you know, um, and I think of the contribution that it could make to the baseball park out in Council of Daigle Gammons area. After, you have lots of trees, and but that contribution of that safety aspect for lights and, and capacity for the, that particular recreation park, we, we uh, I could see that being beneficial there in a number of places. So I'm on the fence on this one. I don't quite know what I'm going to do, and I look forward to hearing other colleagues. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I had confusion about this one earlier, and so I'm just wondering, um, page four of the report in the built-in budget adjustments, we have a decrease to the Urban Force Master Plan of 755000 so when we say 900, are we looking at topping it, are we looking at changing it from 755 or? We looking at adding an additional reduction of 900. Right. That doesn't get touched. So we're looking at this. We're looking an additional 900,000 on top of the 700. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. So we've already we've already reduced it, and we're looking at another reduction. Um, you know, I have. I mean, I, I do get comments from people about trees. In fact, I even got like streets where people are requesting trees. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to completely um, do away with our tree planting strategy. So, okay, so now that I've got my head around it's an additional 900, what does that leave us with? We're going from 2,100 trees to 100, 100 trees, 1,100 trees. Is that right? How many trees do we have? Sorry, Brad, it's late. Oh, no, it's, 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 it's quite all right. It's a confusing one. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that. I, I explain as layers of an onion, but essentially we, have the, we, we started this year because of the carry forward <clears throat> from last year, we basically had a, a prospect of planting 3,000 plus trees. And so council looked at it and said, okay, we're going to roll it back. Okay, and that's where you cut the cut the capital budget in half, um, and so 
by doing that with the carry forward, essentially that meant we were gonna plant the same amount of additional trees out of capital as we were in any year. It just means we didn't do it last year, right? If that makes sense. Now the 900,000 is the core funding for the program that was in the operating budget. It just isn't tendered yet. So it creates that ability to off ramp another thousand trees and save yourself $900,000. Okay, so how many trees do we get? Uh, <laughs> net this year, you'll get uh, two. You'll get two thousand trees based on the carry forward plus what we have in the budget. All right. Okay. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, you made a lot of sense at this late hour of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tripping already, right? Uh, I'm nothing but not consistent on this one. Um, <laughs> so the, I, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, I'm disappointed we're back at this because I thought we settled this in our previous debate where we had a vote, we had a whole discussion, and we halved the budget on the carryover um, to, so that, because, because we didn't get everything planted last year. So if, if this were to happen, I'm wondering, what the net impact would would be like on last year's budget. If we then cut, you know, this year's budget, is the net result then of the fact that we didn't get things planted, we cut half of, uh, cut the 750, and then we cut nine, is that basically amount to a whole, to one year of being missed trees? Like I know we're, we planted some last year, and we planted some this year, but does the, when you put those two together, because yeah. we didn't do what we had planned, do we effectively, have we effectively lost a whole year of, of trees that we otherwise would have had? No, and, and because essentially you're, and it is getting late, <laughs> but essentially you had uh, one point, you had dialed up 1.5 million, sorry, I wasn't quite ready for, the history, but what you had a, dialed up about 1.5 million in capital plus 900,000 in operating for 2.4. If you go ahead with this, you've preserved half of, half of the capital. So $750,000, $750,000 out of the 23-24 allocation would still be in play. Okay. So if, if combined, I could... combined with the carry forward from last year gives you one, almost $1.5 million in capital that's on the street now. So 900 plus 750 yeah. is basically saying that extra capital that we provided because we recognized that we as uh, HRM had not yeah. followed up on the, um, right. on the urban forestry plan. Yeah. When you put those two together, it's basically, you know what, we actually are not following that. Correct. Okay, so, um, you know, <laughs> this is another one of these, like, you know, you can have a nice plan, but if you don't fund it, what have you got? You've got a pretty document that's on a shelf. And we already drew a modified victory condition on trees. We said, you know what? We can't make up for the fact that the first couple years of the urban forestry plan, it was not resourced, it was not funded. We can't make that up in the course of just a few years. And then COVID arrived and uh, made that even more challenging. And so we said, you know what? Let's, 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 let's get 75. Let's get 75%, you know. That's something you can at least put on the fridge and not be ashamed of your result. Um, <laughs> but instead, we are now continuing to slip further and further bit by bit. And so, uh, you know, we had a debate on this. We cut the budget in half. I mean, I didn't love cutting it in half, but there were certain practical realities about getting that work out the door. It doesn't sound like there's a problem getting the work out the door if we want to keep this. Like, you, could, you can spend that 900 on trees, bro. Yes, unless we run into problems like we yeah. did last year, but we've done a number of safeguards to make sure that doesn't happen again, okay. so it's a low probability this year. So, uh, colleagues, I would urge you to keep this in the budget, right? The urban forestry plan is a plan that, um, you know, was another one of these ones. We got a lot of accolades on it, but we did not, we really, we didn't live up to it um, in a lot of ways. And, you know, the tree, there's very few municipal assets you can spend money on that actually gets more valuable each and every year. It's a, it sucks up the stormwater, sucks up the pollution, sequesters carbon, makes the pavement last longer because it's shaded. 
urban heat island effect, uh, biodiversity, it list goes on and on and on. Um, we shouldn't be treating these as optional. It's, we should be thinking about this as core infrastructure in the same way that we think about curbs, sidewalk, and pavement. They're essential elements of our city and they're essential elements of our streets. And we, should, we, sh we, should, we shouldn't cut this. We've already dialed this back already this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was literally writing down all the benefits of trees and then Deputy Mayor Austin just enumerated them and I was like, okay, throw that one away. Um, but in terms of where we are, I agreed to cut the uh, capital we had in front of us in half because we had to carry forward. With a, <laughs> dropping the carry forward means that we have half of what we were going to do. And to the deputy mayor's point, you know, in terms of a grade, 75% is a B. It's a good solid B. We were dropping down to a C plus at 67. Now we're dropping even further. We're in C territory now, folks. Um, you know, we're, we're you know, if, uh, depending on the program you're in, you're getting into failure territory here. And so uh, we're, I, I can't support another cut. I supported the original cut to half capital because of this. To then take it away would mean we were, we're missing that target by even more thousands of trees. And so we gotta plant them. So they're good for the, it's funny, people keep saying we can put them into roads. By planting street trees, you're putting money into roads. It makes asphalt last longer. Uh, it shades it. The number one killer of asphalt is ultraviolet radiation. Uh, so anyway, uh, I can't support this one. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Chair. So building on a theme, uh, reading from the book of the Urban Forest Master Plan. Road benefits, page, uh, what page are we on here? Page five, road benefits, right at the top of the page. Trees can make our roads safer. So. Right, so we're talking about uh, pedestrian safety and all that stuff. There, it's a long accepted notion that, quote, trees have undoubtedly saved many lives and prevented accidents in tangible way ways. It cites Neil 1949. A tree-lined narrow street gives the illusion the street is narrower, uh, or a tree-lined street gives the illusion that a street is narrower and generally tra calms traffic. Wolf and Bratton, 2006. Uh, in the next paragraph, uh, to what Councilor Cleary just said, trees enhance the longevity of our streets. Roads with an expansive, expansive feature are an expansive feature of our urban landscape, and shading them adequately leads to savings on infrastructure renewal. A road surface that is 20% shaded has its pavement condition improved by 11%. After 30 years, this results in a cost savings of, want to guess, 60%. 60%. Think about how we're struggling to stay on top of maintaining our roads, and our number one defense to extend their life and lower the cost is uh, to uh, uh, have trees and keep them in shade. Uh, another big issue that we're facing after uh, uh, the hot summers we're starting to see, Environmental Protection Agency, this is from a, a different article, uh, says that uh, shaded areas in cities can be 20 to 45 degrees cooler in Fahrenheit, not Celsius, so you know, three, five, 10 degrees cooler, uh, which is becoming an important issue. That's why we're requiring in center plan uh, green roofs on uh, new builds. That's why in New York City, they've started to require that existing roofs just be painted white. Paint them white to try and throw off the heat. Trees are an important part of that. And then finally, to what Councillor uh, uh, Austin also mentioned, uh, there was a forest researcher for the, uh, what are we on here? Uh, USDA in the United States uh, said that, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but the summary is that urban trees collectively represent the largest net carbon sink in the United States, offsetting more than 11% of total greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. So, you know, think about, all of the things we're talking about as aspirational goals that we have these operational plans around and then think about how this $900,000 touches all those places and extends the life of the roads that we're worried about because we don't have enough money to maintain them properly right now and that'll be a big issue next year. Final point to what Councillor, uh, well maybe two points since I have two and a half minutes left, so what Councillor Austin said is uh, this is just a one-time thing. We uh, just got told by staff, first look at next year's budget, 9% maybe, maybe more. Everything we push off here comes back and gets added to that percentage next year and it becomes harder and harder to close that, close that gap. So I'm pretty happy with 5.8. I think I can live with that. I don't want to be debating a 10 next year. I think that's probably a really bad idea. Uh, and I guess I would ask uh, if staff, if Shannon's still here or somebody can come forward. I believe 
urban forestry is a part of the carbon path, the, the path to our goals for uh, Paris and for net, uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, can you speak to that? Like, like this is, if we cut this, if we keep not hitting our goals, I believe this has an impact on our ability to hit our carbon goals. Thank you. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, we actually don't uh, give ourselves credit for sequestration, for carbon sequestration oh, okay. in the climate plan, um, but that's kind of what we'll have to do for the offsetting, because we can't actually get to zero by 2050, it's net zero, so that is an important part, but as, as so, council- So it's not in there now, but we would have to consider things like that and all the other sequestration models to be able to get to zero? Absolutely, yeah, or we'll be paying more for it if we have to actually pay for those offsets. For we, want, we want our natural assets to offset for us, and then we also know that healthy urban trees and forested areas um, have a huge role in adaptation to climate impacts as well with stormwater management, et cetera. So. Thank you. I just think it's tremendously short-sighted to cut this at this time, and I was heartbroken that we couldn't fully fund it this year, and the only reason I supported cutting it is because Brad told us we couldn't physically do it. So, uh, you know, quite, quite the contrary of cutting this, I'll be pushing very hard next year to get it fully funded and in future years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll have to admit to Saying 5.8 go down to 5.6 looks good, right, when we're thinking about what that tax rate might be. Um, I, days and days and days and days and days of people calling, I think every home on Holland Road called me about the trees that were planted on Holland Road. Um, I think there was probably a contractor issue, but as well, they were under power lines. They did block street signs and school signs, and they had to come back out and change them. The same thing happened on the Fall River Road. Um, they, when the review was done, it looked like the wrong tree was planted because, so there was lots of issues. And I do understand the benefit of trees, and it's all like a really good thing, but I also would say that we have to get much better on what the communication strategy is around the value of trees, the planting of trees, how we choose the locations, how they're assessed, all of that kind of stuff. So is any part of that budget attributed to a communication strategy or is it just to the contract for planting the trees? Because literally that was a nightmare and people just didn't understand. And as as much as you know, you had the information as a counselor that was provided to me to make sure that people understood the value, it, it was a very, very challenging time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Go ahead, uh, Brad. Yeah. Uh, the quick answer on your question is, does any of this money go towards communications? Question is no, but staff should be handling that with corporate comms, and I presume they're aware of your situation. I apologize, I was not. And so I will double back and make sure that communications is a, is a key part of this. There were certainly a number of errors last year that, were, that didn't do the program any favors. Um, but I will say, you know, a lot of the remarks are on the power lines, and we'll definitely get better there, because certainly people look at the power lines today and see what's going on. However, we've changed Part of the cost is we've changed our species of trees and what we're planting under power lines. We're a lot more aligned with Nova Scotia Power than we ever have in our history. So, um, but I won't belabor that today. But uh, yeah, not your point taken, and we'll make sure that uh, do our best to make that happen. Thank you, Brad. Um, go ahead, Councillor Love. I lost how much time you have, so, okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Councillor Daigle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, staff were excellent, you know, at, at getting back to me and us trying to get, but I guess my point is more about we need to get very upfront the information. Instead of responding to the complaints, we need to be a little bit more in the forefront of it. And um, some of the answers and the responses were fairly light, right? So I think getting more in-depth in the communication strategy would help people understand it better. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ditto with what she said. Um, you know, when folks were uh, uh, responding to trees being planted on Hammonds Plains Road and the, on the former uh, provincial road, um, I got phone calls letting me know that we live in the country. We got lots of trees. What we'd love to see uh, is uh, our, our roads being maintained, right? So here we are pulling $8 million out of road paving and we're, we're bickering about trees. Um, you know, if we're really serious about the state of good repair of our roads, we wouldn't be taking paving out. That being said, um, you know, I, I do agree that there's a communications problem, absolutely 100%. Uh, and it's not so much a problem as that it's about community engagement. Why are we planting these trees? Right, we, again, we live in the country, but lots of trees. If you wanna do something uh, about, um, about stormwater and about uh, you know, needless uh, destruction of habitat, then we would be spending time and energy and conversation and discussions with our provincial government about stopping clear cutting. Like that would be amazing if we could stop that. So I am gonna support this, um, you know, recognizing that uh, overall, um, you know, we, we do have uh, an option here to reduce uh, that average tax bill, and I do support that. Uh, but I do think that the elephant in the room is the fact that this is just one time, this is one year, and we need to find that $8 million. There's probably going to be about 10, 12 million, considering we brought <laughs> 300 kilometers of provincial roads in to our budget, and now we're cutting the paving. So. Yeah, we're going we're to have some significant issues next year when it comes to co the, the state of good repair and the cost of good repair and maintenance for those roads. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thanks, Judith. Just a quick question. What's the uh, bill impact from 5.6 to 5.8 in uh, terms of dollars? Through, through the chair to the councillor, three dollars and one cent. Three dollars and one cent. So this is what we're arguing. Okay, junior chicken. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no prize. No prize for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, councillor Smith. Uh, go ahead, councillor Purdy. Did you want to speak? Oh, you want to you want to close? Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Cuddle. I'm sorry. That's all right. That's all right, there, Mr. Chair. It's been a long day for you too. You're hanging in there, though. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh my gosh. Sometimes I wish we could do everything. Um, and to the junior chicken comment here, we can't do everything because next thing you know, we'll be all be eating prime rib and not a junior chicken, right? If we just kept adding on and adding on and adding on. Um, you know. That being said. Y y y you know, to the point that we do have vast amounts of trees. One of the things that I would like to see more of is money going towards protecting the trees that we do have in parkland acquisition and enhancing wilderness areas. Um, you know, I, I think about how many trees we saved with the Shaw Wilderness Park uh, when you know we, we stopped that from becoming a massive um, moonscaped uh, subdivision. Um, you know, and so it's sometimes hard when we're sitting here at the table, kind of working in these pockets and these silos and, and these budget items to see the trees through the forest. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I know, I know, I had to do it, I had to do it. But I mean, it, it, it is true, and I'm, I'm I'm a big supporter of trees. I'd like to see more trees. Um, you know, I, I think with the suggestion, we're still getting 2,000 trees, which is still a lot, still a lot of, it's a lot of trees. Um, but you know, I think taking a step back and, and looking at this from the perspective of not just single trees, but habitats, um, ecosystems, watersheds, and and wilderness, you know, more parkland acquisition. We don't have a big parkland acquisition fund, and I'd love to find ways of putting money 
towards those things, um, those things as well. So um, anyway, that's a discussion for, for another day, but I just wanted to add that perspective to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've changed my mind. No, I just wanted to point out that, you know, I'm kind of, it's interesting what I'm hearing. I mean, what we're talking about here isn't, well, let's take this money and spend it somewhere else on paving or, you know, parkland acquisition. We're just talking about returning the junior chicken, whatever it is, back to the, the shop. Like, it's not a reallocation. This is just a proposed cut to this program. That's all. So, you know, if your standpoint is like, well, I think we really should be doing X, well, you should propose let's do X. You know, just hacking this just to return $3 is not a good program decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Mr. Chair, um, so Jerry, I was under the impression that a, a million dollars equated to about 0.5% on the tax rate, is that? Uh, no, that's that's not correct. Uh, a, a full point on the rate is around six million dollars. That's a full percentage on the rate. So okay. one million dollars would be like one six. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. This is still nine hundred thousand dollars, which is significant. And we're talking about everything that we're concerned about. But look, I'm concerned about the people. The, the residents who own their homes, who maybe just purchased their homes in the last couple of years, um, and are struggling to make their monthly bills. And 0.2%, uh, that's, if that's all that I can do from my seat here to, to help them, then, then so be it. And we just added how many staff positions to beef up um, a department that is an amazing department, but, uh, in a year where inflation is in double digits. So just trying to look at, okay, well, what, what else can we do? How, how else can we help this particular year? This is a one-year ask. Um, it does not touch the carry forward from last year. That, that is not impacted. That's already gone out to tender from what I know. It's been approved in the advanced capital budget. We are still planting 2,000 trees in HRM this year. That is still significant. And um, it, this, is, this is one thing that can help direct that tax rate down, in the downward uh, direction. So I hope that you would consider that for today. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on that last point, so uh, what was it three dollars and how much cents per year? Seventeen. Seventeen. Uh, so, because Councillor Purdy mentioned um, monthly budgets, so three seventeen divided by twelve is twenty six cents per month. So that's a that's a big big savings. So, thanks. Thank you for that, Councillor Cleary. There are no further speakers on the list. Is it time for the question? Super, thank you. Thank you very much. That motion fails. So we are back on the main motion. I'm just curious. Go ahead, Councillor Kent. Thank you. Uh, my vote was recorded wrong. Mine was a positive vote. Councillor Kent's vote was, uh, was recorded incorrectly. That would switch from 5 to 11 to six to 10, that motion still fails. Thank you. Um, so we are back on the main motion. Ian, am I seeing the list for the main motion on my screen? Okay. There we are. Okay, thank you very much. We have... <laughs> Wicked. Uh, 
So the the list is empty. Um, there are no further speakers on the list. Uh, the question has been called. Ian, it's over to you. As amended, yes. There is one more motion after this. And that motion passes. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, Jerry and Tyler, uh, you guys have the final tax bill change that we would see while Let's move ahead to the next motion, uh, and this is item 6.2, the Halifax Regional Police and RCMP budget, which was deferred from February 3rd, pending the discussion today. So can I have someone make that motion, please, Councillor? It's already been made. It's been deferred. I'm sorry. Yes. There would be no... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, the questions... Right. Yeah. The motion uh, that is deferred is that the is for the uh, for the Halifax Regional Police and RCMP budget. The question I think has been called. Ian. Oh, I didn't see Councillor Austin. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so this is the That's police budget. This, RCMP, HRP. This budget. is the RCP, HRP. Yeah. So does it include the psychologist's yeah. Yeah. position? Does yes. it include the extra RCP officers then, too, that we're on the budget list where we've already voted on that? Or is that part of this? That, that's so, but does that go from BAL into this? Yes. Yes. So right, right now, uh, if you approve the HRP budget as, as tabled with the... Uh, and the ballot items as as they were recommended by staff you're at 5.8 percent of a tax increase so i have one more question then it's not possible to vote on them separately hrp budget versus rcmp budget is it is it is, or is it one package that's how it was uh, sent up from the board of police i believe but i think because i have no the problem with said you can break it we can we can break the two Okay, could I request we break the two then? We used to do it separately though. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, uh, Councillor Austin. Is there anything further? Yeah. Or, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hensby. Just for further clarification, Mr. Chair, so it also includes the uh, switching over of the victim services, the crossing guards, as no. well as a lake, lake patrol. Is that no. part of the budget process, or that still be a, a labor a separation of labor discussion? Separate and further. Those, um, uh, the items were not moved over in the budget adjustment list discussion, uh, so they are going to remain with HRP. And the whole point of the HRP budget being deferred until after the budget adjustment list discussion was for those motions. Go ahead, CAO. No. Uh, a budget funding issue. If we decide we want to move those services mid-year when the analysis is complete, for instance, around victim services and crossing guards, and we bring you back a report, we can do it at that time. And any incremental funding impacts wouldn't be a this year in the wouldn't be a this year impact. So with this still being on the ballot list here we have in regards to those positions, still a discussion of separation of labor or separation of, of responsibilities that we'd take them out of the police department, put them into public or public safety uh, directive uh, director. If um, it comes back as uh, will it will that have to go through the police commission for ratification or just us because we're the funders? Just this council. So we, okay. I'll defer to the solicitor if he wants to add to it, but crossing guards and victim services are two, two discrete functions where there's some components that if we chose to move them over to the municipality, we could. It's just a transfer of bodies. <coughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the committee, uh, the CEO is correct. The complement of the of the HRP is at the discretion of council. The budget that then results is decided on by the board of police commissioners and referred here. So it would be within council's discretion to consider that in year when when the discussion comes forward. 
So the whole question of not defunding but retasking the police, this is a part of that retasking with the with the transfer of the victim services, Lake Patrol and the uh, crossing guards is part of that part of that process. It is intended to be part of that process and discussed in year as the CAO has indicated. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hensby. Thank you, John and CAO. Um, we have no further speakers. Uh, the motion is on your screen. Um, and so we are going to be voting on um, the second point says HRP dash RCMP. So the question has been called on the first part of the motion on the HRP budget. Okay, that passes, thank you. Uh, we now have the RCMP budget motion. And that's on the screen. And that, but that uh, motion passes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to all of staff for this as well. It has been uh, a good, long, and informative process. I appreciate that. We do have a little bit more. Uh, there are the Councillor Hensby. Second. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. I misheard that. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so we have the minutes all in favor. Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, that passes unanimously. Can we have a motion to adjourn, please? Thank you, Councillor Smith. We are adjourned, and you get your Friday back.